and complicated games, as we saw yet again yesterday. Not much has changed in the leading room group after yesterday's round. Vishyanand is on plus two and is leading the pack. He is followed closely by Vladimir Kramnik and Levon Aronian, who made, well, who shared a point yesterday in a very fascinating game. And Peter Svidler of Russia has joined them on plus one. We have no one on 50% anymore, but uh, Veselin Topalov, Sergei Karyakin and Shahriyar Mamedjarov are on minus one, uh, followed by Dmitry and Draken. Today we have a lot of games that are potentially interesting, but probably all the attention, at least in the beginning, will be uh, focused on uh, Veselin Topalov's game against Vladimir Kramnik, and that is not only for chess reasons. Those two players, both aged 38, have started well, their careers as rivals and as quite friendly colleagues. But that changed in 2006 when they played a famous or maybe infamous world championship match in Alista. Around, well, after round four, a scandal broke out and there were many accusations uh, there was risk of the match being even cancelled for a while. In the end, the match finished in Kramnik's win after a very tense tiebreak. But since then, the players basically, well, they are not friends anymore. <laughs> That's the <laughs> sort of the polite way to say it. And uh, um, the last time they played a classical game was in 2008. Since then, somehow, basically by a miracle or maybe by an unspoken rule, they have avoided playing the same tournaments. So today we see uh, a very, well, a game that will be very fascinating both from chess but mainly from a psychological perspective. Don't you think so, Peter? Well, I agree that this is, uh, well, this is really a fascinating game that we're gonna gonna see, see here today. Also because of, well, I mean, it's almost bringing back some kind of, let's say, Cold War uh, mm -hmm. tension in that sense. I mean, their match in 2006 was uh, fascinating. Well, partly due to excellent chess content, but also, well, the scandals involved. And for instance, well, I mean, Kramnik even forfeited a, a, yes. a, a game in the match. I think the, f the fifth game was simply not played. Uh, yeah, I forgot right. who had the white pieces, but, uh, well, it was... Um, Either no move by Kramnik or one move by Topalov, and then Kramnik uh, forfeited the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was the first time uh, the game was forfeited since the famous Fischer yeah, Spassky Fischer match. Spassky. So, so it was really, well, uh, some kind of return to, to, to the Cold so War. There seems to be statistical evidence that if you, if you forfeit a game in a World Championship match, you, you win. win, you win. <laughs> so, That's, that seems yeah, to be true. I hope true. Magnus is not paying attention. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah. Well, also, when they played in 2008, I think they ended up shaking hands before the game, mm -hmm. but there was a lot of tension be about that before the game, mm -hmm. especially as a few rounds earlier in the B tournament in Weigensee, Ivan Ceparinov uh, did not shake the hand of um, Nigel Short, and that created uh, both some kind of precedence, but also um, a debate uh, about the uh, interpretation of the mm -hmm. rules. And I think first Ceparinov was forfeited, then it was decided by the appealed committee, actually including Kramnik, that the game had to re be replayed on the free day, and um, well, actually, Nigel Short won the game twice. <laughs> twice, <laughs> so <laughs> in that sense. But well, later in the tournament, Kramnik and uh, Topalov played their game, and um, I actually forgotten if there was a handshake or not. But uh, what I remember is that T Topalov sacrificed a knight in the opening and won yes. a, a beautiful game. Yes, it was. Game. It was a very. Uh, it was a very beautiful game with mm -hmm. with a spectacular um, spectacular novelty in the opening. Very, very much so. And uh, well, that uh, that was the last um, the, l l the last classical but game. But mm -hmm. also six years has passed, and uh, well, they are not the two strongest players in in the world anymore. So maybe actually today. I think for Kramnik there's a lot of stake, but that's basically due to the tournament situation. Mm -hmm. Maybe for Topalov this is a huge prestigious game, but I think for Kramnik this is not as much playing Topalov as actually trying to get um, points sort of... Um, In an important tournament situation. Very much so. Yes. But of course, should Topalov win this game, he's catching up with Kramnik. But so uh, it's too early to write yeah, him off. I, I also think that, well, the pressure on the players who are on minus one is probably even be bigger than on, on the ones who are leading. Because, let's say, both Topalov and Karyakin, they are very, very ambitious players. Things haven't gone their way so far, but 
should they win one game each? I mean, this is, no, well, course. this really changes the situation in the tournament. So for them, if they want to keep any kind of, uh, well, you know, ambitions in this in this tournament, they have to start winning uh, today or tomorrow. Well, well very, I very mean, soon. I think yes. Kayakin will be reasonably happy if he gets a draw with the Black Peters against um, uh, the leader Anand, for instance. But yes, but today, I think yes. Mm -hmm. Well, it's clear. Well, Topalov is always uh, ambitious. Mm -hmm. And I think, well, I mean, he couldn't see a better way to stage a comeback than sort of um, beating Kramnik today. Now but you can see how many journalists <laughs> are ready for this handshake. <laughs> Very much so. Well, and uh, uh, I feel pretty sure that six years have passed and we're going to see a, a rather friendly handshake. Well, friendly maybe is too strong, but well, yeah. yeah. No, we haven't seen a handshake. Really? We haven't seen a handshake, okay. that's my impression. Okay, that, that could be. Well, I think also the rules are that you have to shake the opponent's hand uh, if he sort of offers it. Uh, you're not allowed to refuse it, but I think if none of them, well, yeah. puts out their hand, no well, problem. Well, it's, it's true. I mean, the, uh, well, but what is there to do about this? <laughs> but actually, let's let's focus on the chess content. Yes. We had yes. Some, some moves here. D4, knight f6, c4, e6, and Tupalov has played three, knight f3. Mm -hmm. D5, I would really expect four, knight c3. Mm -hmm. And somehow today, I don't think Kramnik's going to play the ultra sharp taking on c4. I would really say four bishop e7, extremely solid and or cautious. Or four bishop b4. Yeah, well, both are possible, but. Uh, well, as 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 we mentioned before, last year he played c5 in this position quite that a is, lot. That is true. But uh, that w yeah, yeah. bishop bishop e7. You're right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think simply against Topalov, Kramnik is very happy with uh, a cautious approach, simply feeling assured that um, Topalov is going to create something interesting and, uh, well, try and bounce back on that. And I mm -hmm. think, well, if should Kramnik get a draw, it's, it's, a, it's a decent result. For sure. Let's see here. Well, this position, I think in Weigand C, 2007, most likely. I think they had exactly this position in, in the opening. But there Kramnik played the move 6C5, but now he's played 6 knight BD7. And C5 here? Yeah. After knight bd7, yes, that is that is the main main sort of solid line, right? Isn't well, here it? there is two moves, both c6 and knight h5 is supposed to be very solid. I think mm -hmm. knight h5 is what Kramnik has uh, has played earlier, and, and at least he's played it now. Yes. <laughs> so let's see, bishop e5, very interesting move by Topalov. Bishop e5, yeah, <laughs> that this is, is uh, well, uh, probably not a novelty yet, but... Uh, probably not. Too but many, ga but, but too many games have been oh, played this is, in this uh, line, of course. This is a very, very interesting thing that has happened. I mean, normally after knight h5, well, they would allow white, black to take on f4, but Topalov has played the move bishop e5. And I would assume that his point is, let's say knight takes e5, maybe even d takes e5. And should you take on c5, there is the threat of g4. So probably black would have to play f5 or g6 in this position. Would he really play something like this, Topalov? Or you think he will, in this position, maybe he will just take back with the knight? I wouldn't be surprised even if he takes on e5 with a pawn. But no. of course it has to concretely work out. Uh, because c5 pawn is, is, well is a bit weak in that Topalov case. Topalov is living up to expectations. He's playing mm -hmm. something interesting. Very okay. much so. And well, we saw yesterday also his mm. preparation is okay. generally... well. It's and known I think as Kramnik is also living up to expectation. He's playing something very solid in response. So Ah, oh, he just played C six. Okay, let's, that's let's quite see. interesting. C six is played. Mm hmm Okay. Well, actually Bishop E five is not a novelty. For instance, it was played in a in a game uh, in uh, in a game between two American uh, female players, Serena Krush and Anna Zatonsky in two thousand eleven. So Bishop E5 and Anna, who's my teammate in, in the German league, she played uh, C6, just like Kramnik did just okay, now. So, oh so they are actually following yes. the American female chess scene <laughs> closely. <laughs> well, I think it will be interesting to ask during press conference if... Well if, if I mean, when we talk about it, uh, rivalry, I mean, well, of course, Topalov and Kramnik is rivals, but also uh, Krush and uh, Satonsky, they yes, had some hu well. huge as battle well. for the American yes. title. Yes. I think their rivalry is maybe a, a tad more friendly. No, I <laughs> think, I, I, I would really think so, yes. Yeah, but yes. Well, this is, but this is actually interesting. Topalov played eight bishop e5 quickly, uh -huh. and Kramnik replied with c6 very quickly, and now Topalov has started thinking already. 
can it really be that Topalov uh, well, hasn't thought a lot about the No, C6. I don't believe that. I really think, well, we saw yesterday his preparation and the level yeah. of it. I think it's well, just, you think you know, he's considering to play time. the ultra sharp move G4 here? <laughs> well, I think if he's prepared, he will play it. <laughs> if that's what he has prepared. Mm -hmm. but well, knight f6 is the only move here. And, uh, well, maybe I'm just. It would be very nice to play g4, knight f6, and rook g1, for instance. That's really, yeah. uh, that's the spirit. I think the computer is even making the move bishop f4, just giving away the pawn as a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. But, well, you say rook g1, but probably after taking here, somehow the white dev initiative no, is... Uh, it actually looks uh, very, very bad, yeah, <laughs> I'm I, afraid. I'm, a, I'm afraid so too. So Topalov has played bishop d3 instead. Mm -hmm. just, uh, and calmly. that could be a new move. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, so far they have played bishop e2 in this position, and well, just uh, some uh, normal um, developing. My hunch developing is that moves. Topalov's concept is, let's say, knight e5, knight e5, uh, sorry, knight e5, I think he will take the knight, and well, let's say the knight goes back to f6, I would assume something like f4, and um, mm -hmm. well, Black, of course, have the pair of bishops, but the bishop on c8 is very weak, and the knight on e5 is keeping pressure on the c6 pawn, which means black's sort of normal ways of playing b6, b4, a5 is difficult. I mean, mm -hmm. I do have some sympathy for, for the way Topalov are, are doing things, and, well, I know that we will always say Topalov is playing sort of I mean, fantastic preparation and extremely aggressive. And this might look a bit slow, but it's actually no. positionally very well-founded and interesting. But so we should, uh, well, we should remember that this line generally, this um, sort of this variation for black, it is known to be extra solid. And there are so many uh, games where white simply failed to, failed to get any kind of um, a purposeful play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it's I just mean, a killing line uh, with black. Very, very much so. I think, for instance, game. If I remember correct, game four of the World Championship match between uh, Vichy Anand and Vladimir Kramnik. Kramnik played also this line with six knight bt seven, and uh, well, he got a very easy draw. If anything, he was even slightly better at some mm -hmm. point. And also I think this, this line was very uh, much disputed in Kazan uh, 2011. Yes. In the candidates. Right. It basically, well, this, this was the line that, that made, um, well, that made so many draws happen. Very much so. Back and I think, then. Uh, for instance, in the, uh, in the match between uh, Grishuk and Kramnik, where actually Kramnik got him il eliminated in the end. Mm -hmm. Grishuk basically gave up on finding an opening advantage because I think he tried a couple of times and both times Kramnik had some nice equalizing novelties and mm -hmm. Grishuk simply decided he would just make quick draws with white and he would try and uh, win with black. And uh, mm -hmm. Well, it was a, it at least it was a successful mm -hmm. strategy. If it was a genius strategy, well, everybody will have their own opinion on but uh, that, sure. that worked uh, very nicely in some sense. Mm -hmm. so this and well, you can see that actually I like the white's approach here because it's one of the, well, it's not easy to get a playable position here even. And uh, well, as, as you just pointed out, if he takes on e5 and uh, mm. after knight e5, he gets f4. But okay, uh, that's, that's but interesting. But let's say knight e5, knight e5, for instance, well, something like g6. Well, not at knight f6, and I actually want to play f6 and but e5. But I will play queen c2 here, maybe, or something like that, even. And you're trying to say that you well, are... Well, I'm trying to say that I could even play g4 you're quickly and... Oh, you're aiming and aim at g6, yeah. not at h6, sorry. Exactly. Yeah. No, this no. is... Uh, this could be... But maybe there is still most like f6, maybe... No, bishop takes g6, I think. Yeah. That I think you cannot uh, afford um, to do. It's a knight. It actually goes back <laughs> to g7. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> Okay, uh, well... I, I don't know, yeah, exactly. At least uh, this is something to but, I mean, consider. Well, I feel pretty certain that black should be okay here, but he's forcing Kramnik to think. Okay, well, he just not played that G6. Well, he played the move G6. Well, it, okay, let's see if... if uh -huh, this is... Uh, this is nice. H4. And H4 wow, immediately. that's nice. That's really nice. Well, I think we <laughs> sort of... Uh, <laughs> We've got action <laughs> already. Already. Wow, yeah, and you see, the point is that, uh, well... I actually have played really a lot of games um, in, well, not in exactly the same position, of course, but in similar positions with Long Castle in the Queen's Gambit uh, declined. 
And uh, the point is that if you manage to provoke black to play g6, it doesn't really matter how well how exactly your your pieces are placed, but next you play queen c2, g4, and h5. I mean, this is yeah. very well. You yeah. make it sound like the queen's <laughs> gambit. Uh, it's not that solid. <laughs> but, uh, no, no, of course. I, I mean, uh, there I are objective problems with I that. I would like to add that I still think black has uh, decent resources in this position. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, he must. <laughs> <laughs> but let's see. But this is, uh, wow, this is. This is well, interesting. This is just and every bit as what we expected from this game. Yeah, well, this is Topalov when he is the best. Um, but, well, well, let's sort of remind ourselves of the trend in this tournament. If you get in some good preparation, you're most likely going to lose, right? <laughs> well. <laughs> so, let, let's see. Yeah, I mean, but, well, this is another kind of preparation, actually. Here, yeah. Topalov also must think from the very beginning. And this, what happened, uh, you, you mean know... You Kramnik, right? Uh, no, I think no. Topalov as uh -huh. well. Not only Kramnik. I think, of course, Topalov has looked at this position. But at every move, he will have to work out what to do next. For sure. No, this is... Uh, uh, the, there is uh, too much, simply. There are too many options here. But yeah. I, I really like what White is doing right it now. It is... I, well, no, I agree. This is... Well, I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. and uh, Of well course, he should, well, I think Kramnik should think about something like B6 quickly. At least that would be a, yeah, a very, that would be very logical natural and, um, thing to do. I don't know how he should respond. Um, well, why does a bit overextended right now? Uh, well, I mean, he's, he's playing on the queen's side, so. he's playing on the king's side. But, well, of course, you can take on B6, but I would rather play B4. But then, of course, after a5, um, some kind of crisis situation arises. But mm -hmm. he well, should play may maybe b6 probably something mm -hmm. like like this. And well, this is very similar to sort of um, well how these lines are normally developing. But of course, without bishop e5 and, and h4 having been played, and uh, well, I'm sure Tobolov has thought about uh, mm -hmm. these kind of implications. And uh, no, this is. Um, it's unpleasant for, for Kramnik, and maybe it could also be that, um, for instance, something like knight e5, and, um, well, something like knight e5, f6, and when the knight goes back, maybe e5 will smash open the center. But I wouldn't be too surprised if Tupalov has prepared something like this, and after bishop c5, h4, knight g7, h5, and he's saying that. Well, I'm mm -hmm. actually going to have a huge attack on the H uh, line. And this is um, possible, but even if he takes on E5 with the knight, just uh, go back a mm -hmm. little bit. Uh, I think, well, I will try the tactic again. <laughs> 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 Last time it didn't no. work, but if he plays bishop takes G6 now. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, well, my point would be that after H takes, G knight takes G6. I think this is uh, you could be right, but promising for You could also it. be that... I would interpolate this move, and you could actually be in trouble. <laughs> That's true. Well, it doesn't work for me today. <laughs> you <will> got <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, well, no, but keep these tactics coming. I think that, well, you're on the right track, uh, or, uh, sort of. At least, maybe not objectively speaking, but mm -hmm. in what Topalov is trying to do. So Definitely. No, Topalov is impressive, uh, opening-wise. He managed to keep a lot of pressure, but obviously on himself as well. Um, but, um, well, despite the action here, I think, Kramnik is going to think for a while, so maybe mm -hmm. we should sort of have a look at the other games. I mean, we're going to return to these games so mm, very plenty of times, yes. for sure. We should probably look at uh, Vishy Karyakin well, to, 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 to the, check the how the leader yes. is doing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, Vishy is back to his usual move, 1e4. He mm -hmm. played 1e4 to beat... Um, to beat Aronian in the first round, and then... In the fourth round, he tried one d4 against Kramnik, which was a, a sort of sharp and interesting draw. But now he's back to e4. e5, knight f3, knight f6, bishop b5, knight f6. Well, Kayakin is continuing uh, to play the Berlin in this tournament. Castles knight e4, d4. Well, in this position, after knight f6 against Carlsen, he castled in the first game, and then I think twice he tried the move d3, and I think also he played d3 later against um, Nakamura in, uh, in Zurich, but quite unsuccessfully. But here he's back to, to forecasting, allowing the, 
the Berlin mm-hmm. ending. So, well, we get the Berlin okay, ending. Okay, so it's the first time in the tournament we are getting the uh, the ending. The ending, <laughs> yes. Somehow this ending um, has went out of fashion, basically. But for Wh- White. White has <laughs> not been able to create any kind of problems here, uh, generally. And now, well, he plays the move 9h3. I think, for instance, in the match Kasparov Kramnik, they would always play the move 9 knight c3, and this looks indeed very logical. But, um, well, I think at some point they started refining uh, the, the move orders, and, well, recently 9h3 has been very popular, and uh, sort of right away I can't uh, explain exactly why, but this seems to very much be the trend. I think maybe it's designed against uh, 9 bishop d7 to a certain extent. Well, Kayakin played king e8, and after knight c3, h5. We have a, a very standard position in, in the Berlin. This, I think this got, this move water got very, very popular after the Olympiad in, exactly here in Hantimansinsk, which mm-hmm. was played in 2010. Ten. I think the Russian team basically had prepared um, this setup. And, um, well, if I remember correctly, we saw some games with, I have forgotten how it was exactly the move water. Um, maybe bishop e7, rook d1, bishop e6, knight f4. And now, for instance, Kramnik just went back to c8 with the bishop, and he's sort of intending to play g5 next. And I think knight e2, they go back to e6. Well, pardon me if this was not exactly th- the correct position, but this was basically how they were doing it. Uh, and, well, since then, this plan of king e8 and h5 has been seen as extremely solid. Um, actually, in last year's candidates tournament, Kramnik against Grishuk didn't play this, but he played the bishop to d7 instead, and he even managed to win a very important game uh, with black. But, well, this, this line has been well seen as extremely solid. So it's interesting what Anand has uh, in mind here. Bishop f4, bishop e7, rook a d1, bishop e6, knight g5, and rook a8, 6. I think even this, um, it's my impression, that this has also been played a, a number of times. Mm-hmm. I think even, it's my feeling, maybe Anand has played it himself with black against Grishuk in an uh, important game, um, in maybe a rapid game in Monaco, for instance. Well, rook f e1, bishop b4. Um, okay, I have a bit lost, um, I don't remember the details exactly, so let's just go over it quickly here. Rook fe f e1, bishop b4, g4, takes, takes, knight e7, knight e6, rook e6, king g2, and now they have also bishop c3 and b takes c3. And, well, we have an interesting position here. And I wouldn't be surprised if, um, well, for a start, both players has looked at this in their preparations. But it could even have been played in, in some mm-hmm. games let me prior let to me this here. Well, mm-hmm. I think a lot of speculation um, about Anand's preparations against Carlsen was why didn't he have sort of better ideas against uh, the Berlin? But... Well, I think this could be one of them to a certain extent. I think actually after the move h3, um, Karls did not play king e8, but I think he played the move bishop d7. And I think after rook d1, he did not go king c8, which was the main move, but he played the move bishop to e7. Again, I'm a bit afraid that I'm I'm misremembering things, (laughs) but that's sort of the gist of it. So maybe this position is actually something Kramnik has been preparing. Well, Sorry, uh, Anand has been preparing. Actually, uh, <laughs> I will surprise you a bit, but uh, Karyakin has played it with white last ah, year. Well, then <laughs> it's pretty clear this is not going to be a huge surprise to, no, to, to no. Karyakin. And, and this is this How is does the funny. game continue? This was Karyakin Grishuk from Aeroflot Open Rapid wow. final, actually. And um, here Karyakin, yeah, here Grishuk played rook d8. Mm-hmm. So uh, exactly at this moment where Sergei is now thinking, and after rook b1, b5. Well, now there is this nice square for the knight. Yes, um, yeah, that's true. But maybe Anand is thinking that somehow he do have some initiative here. Well, that Vichy has thought about it. Well, that is <laughs> that, that is, is for just sure. a given. This um, is his exact specific preparation against this line. Well, it sounds likely at least. Mm-hmm. So. But, uh, well, after rook d8, let's say maybe rook b1 is not a very even... Not you think there could be a better move yeah, in this position? Yeah, that's, that's what I would like to say, yes, I think. Um, yeah, well, if we look at it sort of... Well, White's perspective at times in the Berlin is that he has a pawn side majority on the king's side. 
And well, I would guess putting the bishop back to g3 and playing f4 would be logical in that sense. Well, one can argue that these two pawns are, are quite weakened, but I think the counter argument would be that, well, on the queen side anyway, uh, well, black has an extra pawn, mm -hmm. and white sort of prospects there are not aggressive, they are defensive. And, uh, well, of course, if they would play b5 and knight d5 and attack these pawns, they could be a liability. But if you think more positively and, and aggressively, you will say that these three pawns are going to defend against black's four pawns. And the double pawns there is not a huge problem. What really matters is that bishop g3 and f4, f5 will create some yeah. uh, attack. And I would even think that, well, white, for instance, could have a move rook d3 at times. Uh, rook uh, d3 is certainly interesting. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Well, let's see. How, mm -hmm. how is he? What was your impression of the game between Kayakin and Grishuk? Did the Kayakin put pressure or...? Uh, well, actually, I didn't look at it that closely, but okay. m m my feeling would be that... Okay. Well, actually, even it seems that Kayakin has had the position with Black as well as against well, Caruana. But, uh, but one year prior to that, uh -huh. in 2012. So Kayakin has already played it for both sides. And, and against Caruana... <laughs> Well, he played he the move played knight, knight d5, d5 at once. Mm -hmm. So, okay, and then so this is... What uh, happened, bishop d2? Yeah, bishop d2, b5 once again. Mm -hmm. Okay, and... f4, mm -hmm. king d7, f5, and... Um, rook e8, e8, I would e8, assume. rook e4, and... Uh, well, uh -huh, so and it you looks, play, like, play yeah, it C4. looks like White was, was putting some pressure well, in this game. But it sounds very likely that there was a game, Caruana Kayakin, where Caruana put uh, pressure uh, on Kayakin, and then later, well, Kayakin thought, this is a nice idea, I'm going to mm -hmm. try, it m try it myself against Grishuk. Yeah. So, well, no, this is, uh, this is interesting. Of course, well, there will always be people who are thinks that the Berlin, not a lot is happening, and it's just going to be a draw, and it's true. Well, we have seen a lot of exchanges here already, but well, I think from a theoretical po perspective, it's quite interesting, and it's also well, it is interesting. Can Vichy actually put uh, serious pressure here? I mean, mm -hmm. he hasn't no, been I successful against the Berlin for, for no, quite a while. No, but I think here, well, we can see that both sides have uh, their own trumps clearly, mm -hmm. and uh, well, this um, this prospect of um, moving the bishop from a, from a four and playing f4, f5 quickly, is uh, definitely something, uh, well, something that black should look, uh, you know, should be careful about. Mm -hmm, very much so. so. Actually, now in the background, we saw Kramnik making a move. Should we quickly update the, the viewers well, on that? And we then, can and then do go to that. the two other games afterwards. Let, let, yes. Let's, let's yes. do that. Well, we are, we are quite curious about that game. As, uh, yeah, well, we, are, we are sorry. We, we are hoping <laughs> that you are as well. <laughs> <laughs> we are sorry if you are... I hope you have patience. We're going to get to the two other games very yes, soon. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Let's well, at least we thought Kramnik made a move. Um, there was uh, some, some kind of yeah, uh, I think physical movement. Th there was uh, physical movement yes. and Kramnik left uh, the, the board. So I think that uh, I think our board will just have to, to update here. But mm -hmm. uh, it's true that right now we, we don't have it. Well, I think he has taken on an E5 and I was no, wrong. I think he, was play uh, he played B6. No, he's, well, I think well, you are wrong as well. I think I he played the move F5. F5, yeah. wow, that's quite a move. <laughs> no, we, uh, well, just, just a few minutes ago, uh, we were discussing this position and that, uh, well, B6 would be a very principled uh, reaction in this position, oh, trying well, to... Well, knight takes E5 as well, to as a well, certain yes, extent. Yes, yes, but, but F5 is, uh, well, well, he fights in a very direct way against G4. And, uh, yeah, but to make a sort of quick evaluation... I would say I don't really like it, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, now, I think for me at least it's quite clear that Topalov has been successful in the opening phase here. I mean, well, he's managed to attack Kramnik, and Kramnik did not bounce back with, let's say, taking on e5 and playing aggressively. Now, well, for instance, I think Topalov maybe can play bishop to h2 now, or he can even prepare something with g4. I think Topalov is, is simply happy. This reminds me of, uh, you know, that Kramnik in his youth, he was an extremely good player of a stone wall, wasn't he? That is and true. That's a, and uh, this is a very, uh, well, this is a stone wall uh, position in a way. Of course, <laughs> White doesn't normally get to play h4, but 
but this but reminds me a lot of Stonewall. I understand, but in the Stonewall, it is quite a dream that you get the bishop on f4 and you get to attack on the king's side. Um, but c5 is a liability there sometimes. To a certain extent, I think you you are right there. But uh, so I wouldn't. So uh, I think maybe also maybe Kramnik is uh, trying to get a kind of position that is well. You know, sometimes you you <laughs> you go back to your uh, well the <laughs> things that you liked uh, in your youth and uh, especially in a. But in I, a my hunch is that he stopped playing it because he started disliking it actually <laughs> but uh, that's true i mean right now i don't know what is kramnik's next move maybe it is i really b6. like b6 yes so well uh, i mean i would be really afraid of uh, g4 h5 quickly so f5 yeah. in that sense it kills off that but of course uh, well one move for instance Black would be something flexible. like putting the rook on 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 g1 um another move would be well even B4 queen, queen C2, and, B4 and of course also B4, B4 would make sense. Just to well, just to preempt. Well, you will play B6, so why don't I do, play yeah. B4 at once? Uh, that could also be the extremely ambitious move, Queen A4, stopping B6. But somehow, mm -hmm. that it has a very scary look to it. But this is well, yeah, this is very interesting, very, very early. And um, but okay, we promised our viewers we had two more games, so let, yes, let's, let's let's go let's to let's go to one that. of them. Yes. Should we start with? Um, uh, who, well, who Swidler we is walking around, so let's, so let's, let's have, have a look at Swidler, yes. exactly. Mm -hmm. Mamad Yarav against uh, Swidler. Mm -hmm. I have also another reason that I want to look at yes. this game, because this is uh, Leningrad Dutch, which has been my pet line for, uh, Very much for so the last I 20 think years. Maybe, well, you will just take us through these moves. Yep. Mm -hmm. I can do that, yes. D4, F5. Well, just... Why would Swidler play F5? This well, is it's very easy for me to understand. I think, well, we can see that Swidler is... Uh, well, we could say more ambitious than usual in this tournament. And, and that we saw from his game against Aronian when he, uh, well, when he refused to just make a draw against one of the pre-tournament favorites. ambitious to play a, a sort of <laughs> semi-dubious opening. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe he doesn't think it's semi-dubious. Ah, okay. <laughs> no, actually, well, um, yeah, we are joking about that, but uh, Leningrad Dutch um, hasn't, uh, well, its yeah. reputation has improved a lot recently. Actually, mainly thanks to the efforts of Nakamura, who's oh. uh, played it very, very successfully on the highest level recently. And, uh, well, not only him, I think. Very many players have um, have taken it as, as their sort of, well, n not as the main, mm, let's say, opening, but as something they do now and then. But actually now, well, you mentioned Kramnik's youth before. Well, you mm -hmm. said he played Stonewall. But actually he also played the Lenin, right? I that think mm -hmm. I played him in, in Singapore, I think in 1990, in the world under 18. And the, well, I managed to make a draw with the white pieces uh, against mm -hmm. Kramnik. Well, with the white pieces, maybe you can say you should try and manage more. But for me, at least, it was managing a draw against uh, uh -huh. Kramnik. I think, I think Kramnik was maybe second in the tournament. The winner was uh, Sagay Tivyakov. But, uh, well, Kramnik has also played this, uh, but that's really a long time ago. A long but, for instance, I remember when, um, well, Anand had this three-point lead against Kramnik in the, in the World Championship match. We were starting to think, how is Kramnik going to play for a win with Black? And one mm -hmm. of the thoughts we had definitely is he's going to go back to his youth. He will play the Leningrad Dutch. But, well, he didn't. But maybe he thought that simply was too predictable in that mm -hmm. sense. And it's true that, well, no, Kramnik playing the Leningrad would be a surprise, but Switter playing it, I think it's a huge surprise. Yes, uh, and I think it also shows that, well, I am quite sure that uh, Swidler is very confident in his, in his Grunfeld preparation, but playing Grunfeld game after game and uh, just, uh, well, knowing that all the players are specifically aiming at that and just getting, well, whatever they have prepared just before the game. Well, it's I also tough. And I think also that uh, Mamad Yarav is known for playing the same Rook B1 line as uh, uh, Aronian just played mm -hmm. against Switzerland. Yes. Maybe he thought, okay, well, maybe he was a bit upset with what happened last time, but I think mainly he thinks he has shown his hand. And uh, instead of coming up with a, a new surprise, he thought, mm -hmm. well, this is actually going to be much more fun. Or maybe he just needs a couple more days to, well, to yeah. come up with a surprise. Uh, well, I'm sure he sure. has people working but, but right but now on these things. So let's, let's but just... But return uh, to the chess yes. position, actually. Mm -hmm. Knight c3, queen e8. Well, in this position, I think also the move c6 is very popular. Right? Well, c6 is the move, uh, yeah, that... Um, I, 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 I like <laughs> most. And, well, actually, that Nakamura has played really a lot yeah, as well. Yeah, I think well. also there was a... Recent games uh, between um, 
I think Gelf and, and uh, Caruana in Zurich, mm-hmm. and I think there also he played c6 and Gelf and followed up with b4. But uh, here it's knight c3, queen e8, and now b4. I think b4 is not the main move, right? No, it's not. The, I don't think it's uh, the most. Well, b4 is, of course, a very ambitious line for white, but normally I think uh, white tries to do it. Yeah, actually. Uh, a little bit before, uh, well, even earlier, basically. I was trying to remember mm-hmm. the theory here, but I think the point is I'm confusing things. I wondered, I think bishop a3 is the move. Well, that's exactly what he has played, so that's a bit undermining my point. But b3, I think Capo was playing this mm-hmm. uh, a lot. Yes. I was about to yes. say in his youth, which is not correct, but quite mm-hmm. a while, while ago. Yeah. And then after e5, I think the lines went something like this. And I've forgotten if you go bishop a3 first or you go e4 and the bishop goes to a3. Mm-hmm. But uh, Mamadiyaf has played b4, e5, takes, takes, bishop to a3. And, well, I think we just have a very interesting uh, position. Well, I think both sides have their trumps. Well, also, sure. you call it the Leningrad Dutch, b- mm-hmm. but I think Sweden would really want you to call it the St. Peter Dutch, well. right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's also, it'll, it has a special meaning for him, probably, in that yeah, sense. Somehow as well. he has to, has yes. to play it at, at some point, yeah, right? That, well, that that is, for uh, him, it makes more sense than some Moscow variation. For that, sure. that, is, <laughs> that, that is true, yeah. Well, maybe we shouldn't get into internal no, no, but uh, Russian politics, but that there is a bit of friendly rivalry between these two cities, it's I think. It's quite normal, yes. Yeah. Even, well, maybe he should play the anti-Moscow, that actually anti-Moscow, exists. Anti-Moscow, yes. Yeah. yes, for but, sure. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, we have an interesting position here, uh, but well, it could also, it could, I think this will be a very fun game to watch. Yeah, but definitely. Uh, they're going to take their time over the, uh, their moves now, or, or is Whitler going to make one? No. So let's have a look at the last game, Aronian against Andreykin. Mm-hmm. Actually, this game is oh, also sorry. very important from the point of view of, of uh, the standings. As uh, Well, right now Aronian is uh, shared second. And he's playing the... Well, uh, Andreykin right now is uh, has, uh, has uh, one and a half points yeah, a- yeah, out of five. No, I think this is... It's a key game for Aronian. Yes. That, uh, well, if he wins this, he will, let's say, Anand makes a draw. He's going to catch up with, with Anand. And despite having lost the individual encounter, mm-hmm. at least it's huge progress tournament-wise. And he's white. He's so white. He so, he well, let's have a look. Yeah. He played the move 1c4, and Andreykin played c6. Well, that's an invitation to the Slav. But, uh, well, Aronian doesn't want that. He plays knight f3, d5, g3. And this is actually already some kind of uh, of a pawn sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, Andrekin took it. Bishop g2, knight d7, castles, knight g2, f6, queen c2, knight b6, knight a3, bishop e6, knight e5, queen d4. And, well, he's sort of, he keeps protecting the pawn here. Mm-hmm. And in this position, well, Aronian took on c6. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong, but I have the feeling that Timan has played this in Wigan C uh, a year or two back, okay, actually. Just give me a second, um, I'll check that. I think I was there seconding Anand at the time. That would be my hunch that they actually have played this. Yeah, that has been played uh, actually quite some So quite we are not times. at all in a sort of um, unknown tier. No, territory. no, it has been played was for I instance. Wrong yes, no, Timan? you're right. Timan, okay. Timan has played it against uh, Jan Smits from uh-huh. Netherlands as well. In Vikingsen, two thousand thirteen, and it co- continued something like King D eight. King D eight. Mm-hmm. I would guess Bishop A eight. No, Knight B five first. Knight B five. Uh huh. And only after Queen C five, he has taken on A eight. Okay. Yeah. Well. And and then he took on B five. <laughs> believe it or not, <laughs> not the best. Ah, he didn't take. He took here on B five. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well. So, well, Aronian is very like much a, in his a, preparation. It looks like a compl- complicated position that mm-hmm. uh, very likely Aronian has prepared. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Well, I think maybe Black's position could very easily be fine, but it's a huge problem for Andreykin that uh, he's not in his preparation and Aronian is. I mm-hmm. mean, well, this could easily be that you are the, on the receiving end of some uh, complicated preparation. And uh, despite I was joking with that, it seems that if you get out prepared in this tournament, you're going to win. Well, I think yes, a- aiming specifically <laughs> for it is probably not too great. That's probably um, too much. Yes. Yeah. And you can see Aronian is walking happily around. While well, you can see that Andreykin has just used uh, basically the first half an hour while Andreykin is, uh, oh sorry, Aronian is still mm-hmm. on his first five minutes. Okay, okay. 
yeah, this is, well, I, I really think it's think an unpleasant that? situation to be in yeah. for, for Androiken. I mean, well, it's a known position, a reasonably known position, mm -hmm. and at least there's been some games, and it's obvious that, uh, well, Aron has been preparing this, and, uh, well, you just sit there and you have to fight the, the opponent's, well, teams of computer ana analysis. Mm -hmm. this is, uh, Although it's not a very computer-like position. Well, let's say it's, it's, it's ge generally a position with the, um, no, unbalanced I material. I think you're right and that um, it will be sort of, you know. uh, well, human-aided computer analysis. Yes. I mean, but, but of course, having the computer there during the preparation is, is even though that the computer will not give... I mean, maybe spectacular winning moves, but it's still going to be very helpful uh, in sure. some sense. So this is well, uh, this is going to be very, very complicated. I think it's going to be a yeah. This should be an exciting game for sure. Actually, well, I think we we have an we, ex we exciting haven't seen non-exciting <laughs> games yet. <laughs> no, not not really. Well, you can argue that maybe Anand sort of uh, Berlin with Kayakin, but there has been a, a bit of action uh, mm -hmm. in in the Anand let's Kayakin have games. Have let's let's have a look at that. I think we left you off in in this position after well there was this exchange on c3 and uh, well in the first game Kayakin played knight d5 if I'm correct against yes. uh, Caruana and mm -hmm. then later Grishuk uh, improved with the move rook d8 against um, Kayakin himself and I know Vish improved think, yes I mm -hmm. think Kayakin played rook b1 in this position against Grishuk but Vish has taken on d8 and played the move rook h1 yeah, and that's, uh, that's his preparation. Well, that's his preparation. And I mean, he spent seven minutes till this point. Well, my guess is really this is his preparation for the World Championship match against uh, Carlsen. Well, that would be yeah, very logical. That's true. I think that would be, mm -hmm. would be very logical. That's, that's true. That could very well be. Mm -hmm. So, well, first explain me. Why hasn't he blundered a pawn? Knight g6. It seems to mm -hmm. that's attack. What I, that's attack, what attack. I was just thinking about. Uh huh. Yeah, maybe bishop g5 check. Okay, that's of course. And you think something like I. Well, if you play king d7, I'm going to mate you. That much that I can see. That is true. <laughs> that is actually a nice line. The rook yeah. d1 check. Rook d1 check, and yeah, that's gonna gonna hurt. So, mm -hmm. okay, you you helped me there. King to e8, and now you think f4. Well, Why even not? here I could play rook d1. Uh -huh. <laughs> Although it looks Rook a bit D1 strange, here. but um, I would think that a move like f6 is yeah. not uh, at all the end of the world. For no, no, for I, I, I'm not sure how to how to evaluate that in case of f6. Let's say f6 takes, takes takes and bishop e3, right? E3, maybe it's pleasant for white. I mean, something like that, but mm -hmm. it's not anything maybe too substantial. But maybe it's not so simple still. Well, Maybe uh, just, just the fact that it was most likely yeah. uh, Vicious preparation for the King, World Championship. King I would still think that F4 here could be an interesting move. At least it's keeping putting a, a lot mm -hmm. of pressure. So maybe what about F6? F6 uh, runs into F5, well, probably, right? It could. Yeah. Well, then you have to calculate this You will take first mm -hmm. and you will play yes. F5. That's and right. Of course, now the rook can move somewhere and to keep f6 protected no but uh, rook d6 you cannot play because of f takes g6 oh and then and rook h8 check, check and mm -hmm. uh -huh. so well i think we sort of come around to that maybe knight g6 is not uh, the best move here no no it's it is tempting but it seems that uh well strangely enough there well, are another very logical move would i mean again trying to win a pawn would be knight d5 I'm eyeing the bishop here on g3 and also the pawn on c3. Mm -hmm. Well, of course you can give a check now, but that's at least, it seems a bit less aggressive. But I would play rook h8 maybe, s first of all. Okay. Well, Unless you have rook e8 I check. I could easily have rook e8 in this position. Okay, that... Uh, I would actually think... Let me be right well, about just it. Mm -hmm. Well, we're commentators, so we can lightly give away pawns. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, so yeah, that's Something true. like <laughs> bishop g3. And, well, if you take on c3, well, maybe rook h7 or maybe f4. Maybe it's not at all very bright, but... Um, this, uh, no, this is something that, uh, well, yeah. Karakin should check and recheck because, uh, well... Well, he will have to, and I he think... He will have to. He would it's, it's very dangerous. much have to 
prefer to check this um, before the game. Uh, sure. So, I mean, it's hard to imagine that this position is uh, very bad for, for, for Black. No, but, uh, not at all. It but seems likely that Anand has prepared this for, for the World Championship match and he thought that this is actually not easy to, to defend. And right now we can see the, yeah. the, difference, uh, the difference on the clocks, which really points in the direction that Karyakin got surprised. Well, he didn't really get surprised because he's played this with both colors. For sure. But he got surprised in terms of, uh, for some reason, he didn't expect Vichy to go for it. No. Well, no, I think this was the, the trick that uh, Anish Giri pointed out on, uh, 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 in a tweet. That, uh, well, if you think so, who has tricked the other one in the opening, look at the clocks. Yeah. And that's, that's basically, yeah. well, it, it's obvious that Anand is not going to make 21 moves I in seven minutes um, unless he's uh, quite well prepared. Yes, right? and um, well, a lot of people before this tournament have been wondering, you know, well, about Vichy's chances and uh, preparation. And it's clear that, well, he has quite some preparation left from yeah. a very recent World Championship match and uh, it's very likely we are seeing part of it today. No, and I think this is one of the, the very nice things um, of playing a World Championship match. Well, I mean, not at all the, the key element, but no. actually you will often have quite a number of uh, ideas left because, well, in a World Championship match it's very much going to be a, a clash of two uh, sort of players and their teams who have prepared for a lot of time. So they have generated a lot of ideas, ideally, and a lot of not, I mean, you will only see the top of the iceberg I in such matches. And that normally means that the players in the seconds after a match has quite some ideas to play. Well, mm -hmm. I think, well, for instance, I remember when Anand was playing uh, Kramnik in 2008, straight after that, well, Anand went for a break and celebrated his uh, win in the match. But all of a second, we went to play the, um, the Olympiad in, in Dresden. And, uh, and it was a race. <laughs> yeah, it was more or less a race between the seconds to get into to play some of the ideas. Yeah, but, uh, well, even very recently in the New in Chess magazine, I think this was the first, uh, the first magazine of 2014, um, they were uh, well mentioning that both uh, Radek Vytasek and uh, Jon Ludwig Hammer, that they did very well. Um, just after the match, because yeah. well, it's not even obvious that it's just because of of some opening ideas, but it's no, but it, it is very well, much because of work with uh, so with on that level. For sure, it's very you, helpful you get for to your work own with chess the, with the best players in the world. But mm -hmm. well, I think also we, there you mentioned Radek Vytasek and Jon Ludwig Hammer. Well, they are ba both very young players. I think, for instance, well, the older generation of second. Let's take me and. Uh, Rustam Kasimdjanov, we would normally complain that, well, we also need to rest after such a match, <laughs> while the young players are just uh, running out That's and thinking true. we have great ideas we want to play. And such. But, well, actually, when we mentioned Rustam Kasimdjanov, well, he was a second for Anand in three successful World Championship matches mm -hmm. against uh, Kramnik, Topalov and um, uh, Gelfand. But right now he's uh, actually working for Saga Kayakin here, so he's... Uh, well, this I will probably be the first time he's actually seconding uh, an opponent of, of, of Vichy. So this, well, this has some, some implications, but I think, well, nothing, nothing major in the sense. I mean, Vichy has played a World Championship match uh, recently against Carlsen, where uh, Kasim was not part of his team. So a lot of new knowledge has been added that uh, Kasim was not part of. So I think they're probably on rather equal uh, terms there, mm -hmm. no, nothing, uh, no, no harm mm -hmm. done. There. By the way, we should, you, we should remind you that for your comments and questions, please use hashtag candidates2014 and well, tweet whatever ideas or questions you have. <laughs> we'll oh, be happy to answer them. Very much so. Um, should, should we have we? a look at mm -hmm. maybe Topal of Kram? Mm, yes, definitely. Yeah, they have made a couple of moves since... Have they? Yeah, <laughs> I think well, so. I think they have. Uh, well, actually, on nothing. How we count moves and no, no, Nothing too um, surprising there. No. Well, Kramnik played the move f5, and well, that apparently made Topala think that the threat of knight takes e5 was then real. So he put the bishop back to h2, mm -hmm. and Kramnik has played b6. And sorry, yeah, Kramnik played b6, and Topalov wants to keep his structure intact, so he played b4. Yeah, it's an amazingly, well, it is an unusual position. <laughs> Very much so. Um, I don't think Kramnik can do anything aggressive on the king side. Well, one could make the argument that h4 has uh, weakened um, the white position. 
And I think, well, this is not going to happen. But even so, I don't know. Can you actually just take a pawn? <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly what I've been thinking about right now. But um, well, I'm sure that this is not going to happen because it's very, very dangerous. <laughs> Why, actually? No, I, I understand. But uh, bishop takes h4. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Maybe, actually, White is just going to play it as a position with pawn sacrifice, sim simply saying that well, you remove my h pawn, but mm -hmm. you also open my uh, h file. That's actually going to be. Great. I, I don't see a, a move sort of like bishop d6. There is bishop e7. and There is no concrete uh, sort of... Um, but maybe simply it's just going to be a huge compensation. Mm -hmm. I really think Kramnik is going to look for more clarity. Uh, what I think would happen here normally was that well, Kramnik will basically continue as it's a normal game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think now <laughs> I will <laughs> stop talking because <laughs> for a while, <laughs> I was about yes. to say something that's uh, not exactly true. So Probably you were about to say something that's the opposite of what he yes, just yes. did. Yes, yes. Okay, well, I thought a5, a3, bishop a6 would happen and white would be slightly better, but uh -huh. Kramnik has played something interesting. Something aggressive too. Mm -hmm. Well, actually what I thought here was that f4 should be bad and white would react with e4. But have a look at this bishop here and yeah. the knight. It's actually, it's very dominated and um, mm -hmm. that is, that is no, quite interesting. No, it's true. Uh, f4 is, is, is very much aimed against the bishop on h2. Yeah. This, uh, is, uh, this is quite interesting. f4. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's say if he just takes with a pawn. Uh, what is Kramnik's idea here? I would assume he has to take back. Well, um, why? Maybe he just wants to block it somehow. Just to block the bishop in. But Maybe he wants to play knight f6, let's say. And well, just... Yeah. just but of course, I, I was about to say that I think <laughs> next g3 is a threat keeping the extra pawn. <laughs> and you think that now the bishop is buried here. But well, it is a pawn. But you yes. maybe you're right that the bishop on h2 is actually no, however, very ridiculous. The problem is that um, but knight e5 is coming. So, so I can't I mean, also... As soon as I get time to castle and play rook e1, things are not going to be great for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, well, I'm being too optimistic here. On well, also, of let's black, just... Yes. Uh, if Topalov is just castling, are you then going to take on h4? Maybe this is the point. But I think this position is uh, well, very much out of control. And, uh, yeah. I mean... Well, here the players... I mean, this is the kind of position... Well, they physically, they cannot calculate until there's some sort of no. clarification. They are mainly following their intuition mm -hmm. that tells them that, well, this position should be playable or this position you know this bishop on h2 will be stuck and that will give me compensation but they cannot know for sure so what no. we see here is okay um, there we have a computer evaluation saying zero plus 43 mm -hmm. uh, and well i think yesterday it was asked which engines are, are we using well this is the sort of well the one in the camera well it is the organizer's computer but that would be houdini 4 i think uh, that's running there and well, it seems to think White has, has actually a considerable edge in this position. Mm -hmm. So this is interesting how Topalov will handle it. Also, if you look at the clocks, well, they are probably still both out, out of the preparation by now. But I it, think so, yes. But Topalov has still only used, well, sh a bit short of 17 minutes. And there has been some rather independent moves here. So this is, uh, this is quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, it's still, when you look at this position, well, right now actually both seem to be a bit overextended, but this, well, White has played c5, b4, h4. Yeah. <laughs> Everything is, you know, it's just going forward. But Black has uh, sort of reciprocated with <laughs> with the, with playing f4 and well, f5, f4. He does have a serious threat of taking on e3 and taking on h4 with check, right? Yeah, uh, that that is impossible. And to, I think to his to concept would be mm -hmm. that if you do something like queen e2, well, then I would really assume that a5 is undermining everything. Mm -hmm. But maybe he can just play castle in this position and somehow... Yeah, well, that would be a... <laughs> well, I'm starting to think that e4 move. is going to be a, quite a threat. So, let's say it takes here, takes here. Is this... Is Kronik's idea to take this pawn? But somehow... Well, this it is not too bad. It somehow looks dangerous for me, uh, for from I mean, for Black to to play like this, mm. and I'm basing that on the fact that, well, first of all, 
black squares uh, black squares are just uh, well very very weak here and uh, well, you're e even if i just play knight x h4 okay you're saying something like takes takes but still yeah no it's a, it's it's a no way clear i agree with you no. but uh, but it's it's interesting mm -hmm. actually we have a tweet from Check Rabu. Uh, hi, how long does preparation last for a top player? Is it possible that Anand Okranik can use some prep from 2008? What do you think? Uh, well, I'm sure you will have some ideas left uh, and such, but well, still World Championship prep match preparation is actually very specifically aimed at, at one uh, opponent and, uh, and such, but um, well, there is, of course, ideas here and there, and you will try and update them uh, and such. I think also, well, maybe last year in, in Tal Memorial, well, uh, Andraikin played a, a rather a sideline against uh, Anand in, in some semi-slav, and I think, well, there Anand played an idea, I remember we prepared like uh, eight years ago, and, uh, well, I'm mentioning it because it, it turned out to be a, a pretty bad idea, and sort of, well, <laughs> I, I felt a bit <laughs> sorry for Vishya that I, <laughs> I mean, it was... You were responsible. It, it, I was kind of responsible and told him that was a good idea, but well, he <laughs> saved the game, but, uh, mm -hmm. well, I mean, we, at that point we were not working with each other anymore, but we, we exchanged a couple of friendly remarks, and I said, well, you know, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> At least I did it in good faith, but <laughs> and such. But well, um, no, it's also a lot of this World Championship match preparation is based on surprise. You, uh, I mean, for instance, you saw Gelfand. He prepared the Grunfeld for Anand as a huge surprise, and that he actually used for quite a while. But of course, the the sort of shock effect I is gone in some sense. Well, maybe the best example is um, the line in the Meran that Anand will use twice against Kramnik in 2008, and uh, well, this was. A key factor, maybe well, the single most important factor in this match was uh, well the two two Anand black wins there. But this line, well, he never played after that because, well, to say that it was dubious is maybe a bit strong. But it had uh, a huge surprise effect at that time, and uh, a and lot it, of this But it hasn't really been played since. No, That's what I mean this is actually yes. as an interesting factor. This match that was so dominating the match, simply no one seemed to fancy to 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 sort <laughs> of to repeat. Uh, <laughs> to repeat. So that. That was a bit strange, actually. Mm -hmm. But, um, well, no, of course, there will be parts of it that's, that is uh, very relevant and such. And uh, so, uh, well, I think it's going to be a pretty open answer to, to the question because it's, well, I think a simple yes or a simple no would not really be very accurate in that sense. Okay, we have another one. Yes, and Malte Bricht, he's writing, do top players still think about general rules, example, good bishop, bad bishop, or is it all intuition, concrete analysis? Well, it's. Uh, I'm pretty sure that they have it somewhere in the back of their minds. Uh, let's say good bishop versus bad bishop. But as um, well, uh, there were a lot of books written about this particular concept. That when you are just learning to play chess as a kid, of course the coaches will tell you that you know if 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 uh, you have a bishop and a lot of pawns on the same color, that's just bad and you should avoid it. And when you grow up and uh, well maybe you know, get some more experience and uh, and uh, realize that things are really so straightforward and simple in chess. And sometimes, well, especially in, well, this position that we have here, the bishop on c8 is terrible. <laughs> well, look at the one on h2 then. <laughs> yes, but but um, if we swap all the all the light, uh, sort of all the light pieces except those uh, bishops, there could easily be a situation when this bishop c8 uh, let's say, stands on d7 and protects every pawn. And the bishop on d3, this really, really good bishop, simply has nothing to do. Well, it depends, but let's say this concept is, is, is a bit mischievous, as, as it could be uh, it could be turned around. And this we well, there are a lot of simple rules that we learn, and as we get stronger, we have to unlearn again. Yeah, well, I think at some point Larsen was saying, maybe even of sort of the over middle games book that the problem was that you had to sort of unlearn a lot of the things but well what i think is that to some extent well it is very much part of our intuition and we know these rules but we also know that there is exceptions to the rules but mm -hmm. um, of course well i mean look at the bishop on h2 for instance is that a bad bishop or is it a very strong bishop undermining the pawn on f4 well that really depends i think topalov is not going to play e4 partly because that's going to make the bishop on h2 very bad. But, well, there will be situations where, where you live with such. And I think, 
Well, the concrete thing is always overruling. But, mm -hmm. but of course, well, we do all understand this concept of a bad bishop and, uh, well, sort of these things. So this is, I think it's a part of our sort of, uh, well, well, positional baggage culture, or our, yes. our intuition or, or call mm. it whatever you want. But, um, well, I think during a game, well, at least I would think in, in very practical terms and sort of concrete lines. And it's not like I think, well, now I want to give him a bad bishop. I mean, normally if you get down to such basics that you actually can afford yourself to think, well, I want to give him a bad bishop. Not a lot is going on. I mean, mm -hmm. a position like this, well, immediate tactics, of course, plays a, a huge role, uh, I think. And uh, But, well, I think, again, it became a, a very long... Uh, Philosophical <laughs> discussion. A, a sort of answer to a maybe ra sort of uh, simple uh, question. But I think there is uh, nothing obvious there yeah. to say. Well, uh, while uh, Topalov seems to be taking his time to think, we will go for a short break now. And um, we'll be back with you shortly. Only one game was decided in round 5 of FIDE candidates tournament in Hantimansisk. Peter Svidler won against Veselin Topalov. At the same time, Vishwanathan Anand preserved the lead after splitting the point with Dmitry Andreykin. Kramnik Aronian and Karyakin Mamidyarov also ended in draws. In the game that finished first, Shahriar Mamidyarov attempted to play the Knight of Sicilian, which is not very common in his practice. But Sergei Karyakin decided not to go for the main lines. The calm position that happened on the board was assessed by Karyakin as a small edge for white, but Mamidyarov found a precise way for equalization. Despite the unpleasant experience with Berlin defense in the World Championship match in Chennai, Vishwanathan Anand himself adopted the opening with black in the game against Dmitry Andreykin. The main battle was on the queen side, where white was attempting to break to the seventh rank. Anand, however, played quickly and confidently, while Andreykin was burning his clock. Black constantly had a small pool, but White held the position together and the draw was signed on move 43. Veselin Topalov revived a rare line in the Royal Opus and surprised Peter Svidler spent lots of time to accurately navigate the resulting sharp position. After move 14 he actually thought that he was losing, but he treated it well and even emerged with slight advantage. A couple of imprecise moves by Black were enough to get him in trouble. The combined force of rook and two bishops harassed the stranded black king until white was able to trade down to the winning endgame with the past age pawn. A full point went to Svidla. The last game to finish after six hours of play was a thriller between Vladimir Kramnik and Levon Aronian. The start of it was quiet as it can get, but it didn't take long before white started pulling his pieces towards the black king. The position soon looked as winning for white, but very complicated and difficult to play in a time travel. After exchanging mistakes, Black succeeded in simplifying the position down to an equal rook and game. Kramnik pressed on but to no avail as Aronian played precisely to hold a draw. After five rounds, Anand remains on top with three and a half points. Kramnik, Aronian and Svidla share the second place with three points each. Vladimir Kramnik was born in Tuapse 
into a family of painters. His father taught him to play chess. Vladimir quickly made the grade and then became a candidate master, his city's champion among adults. When Kramnik was 11, he came under the influence of Botvinnik, who praised the young talent and invited him to his chess school. Kramnik progressed rapidly, won under-16 and under-18 world junior crowns, and in 1991 became an international grandmaster. His first major success came at the Olympiad in Manila in 1992, when the young grandmaster scored eight and a half points out of nine. Since then, Kramnik has been a permanent member of Russia's national team. He played his part in the team's victories at the 1992, 1994 and 1996 Olympiads. And by 1993, Vladimir was already a candidate for the chess crown. In 1995, Garry Kasparov invited Kramnik to help him in his world championship match against Vichy Anand. This was a great experience for Kramnik, and he profited from it when he beat Kasparov in 2000 in London and became the 14th world chess champion. Vladimir Kramnik held the title from 2000 until 2007. He played world championship matches with Peter Lecco in Brissago in 2004, the score 7-7. Seven to seven. In 2006, in Elista, he beat Veselin Topolov with a scoreline of 8.5 to 7.5. In 2007, Kramnik shared second place at the Mexico tournament, where Anand became champion. In 2008, they played a match, which Vladimir lost 4.5 to 6.5. In 2013, Kramnik shared honours at the candidates tournament with Carlsen, but the tiebreak left him in the second place. During his outstanding career, Vladimir Kramnik has won more than 50 tournaments and he holds a special and distinguished record. He has won the Dortmund Super Tournament 11 times. In 2013 in Tromso, Kramnik climbed his last unexplored peak. He won the World Cup and proved his strength in a knockout competition. Like most of the outstanding grandmasters, Kramnik has a universal game style. Experts point to his stunning opening game, unique gift for positional play, and exceptional professionalism. The leading Bulgarian grandmaster was born on the 15th of March 1975 in Rus. Veselin learned to play chess at the age of eight and very quickly proved to be one of the most promising players of his generation. In 1989 he became under-14 world champion and runner-up in the 1990 Under-16 World Championships. In 1992, Topolov gained his Grandmaster title and entered the chess world's elite. From the mid-90s, this ultra-talented Bulgarian won tournament after tournament and soon became a candidate for the champion's title. In 2005, Topolov proved his strength and superiority by winning the FIDE World Championship in San Luis. In 2006, in Elista, Topolov lost a controversial rematch with Kramnik on a tiebreak and so lost the crown. After a small loss of form following the match, Topolov had regained the number one spot in the ratings by the end of 2008. In 2009, he won a candidates match against Kamsky and earned the right to face world champion Anand. The match for the title was held in 2010 in Sofia. Although Topolov lost to Anand, it was very close and it went down to the last game to decide the outcome. In the candidates match of 2012, Topolov was defeated by Kamsky, but he did not give up on his championship ambitions. Having won tournaments in London and Zug, the Bulgarian was the overall winner of the total winner of the <laughs>
if he just took on yeah took the sort we of left offered you in the position after row gates one but well we don't have uh, our analysis board right now just yet. but we can see that Kriakin's last move was g5 he mm -hmm. stopped the wide aggression with f4 at least uh, momentarily to some extent well rook h1 was the novelty mm -hmm. well actually taking on d8 was the novelty but well there's only one move after that so yes. king, king d8 and rook h1 and uh, Kayakin played knight d5 and Vichy played uh, bishop g3 sort of gambiting the pawn on, on, on c3 but well Kayakin thought for a while and didn't take the pawn and uh, well it's not completely obvious that you can't take the pawn well, most likely the most uh, sort of uh, straightforward way for white to play would be to play rook h7 here. Well, mm -hmm. just to activate uh, to sort of well, to a maximum. A, almost winning a pawn, and I think that will be a quite a serious pawn to lose in some sense. Well, maybe a move like rook, rook g6. Rook g6, and now he's hitting the g4 pawn. But can you play this sort of, can you play this extremely aggressively giving away the pawn, and if you take here... Okay, then Something King like F3, you're King in F3. trouble. Mm -hmm. um, this could actually be, well, very dangerous for, for, for black, especially as it seems very likely that at least till this point it was all preparation by Vichy. Mm -hmm. But now Kayakin has played the move G5 and Vichy is starting to, to think, well, maybe he's just trying to remember his preparation, but it could also be that G5 was a good practical move by... Um, well, it's also a very natural move, so I can't believe that Vichy hasn't looked at it if it was some sort of, uh, you know, special preparation for the World Championship match now. Yeah. Well, it's a very, uh, sort of, it's a very understandable move from the positional it, point it, of view. It is quite logical in some mm -hmm. sense. On the other hand, well, the computer is not really giving it as one of its uh, sort of top three or top four options. So it could also have been, I mean, I could easily see myself overlooking a move like this. Mm -hmm. um, so that is... Well, it's well, a bit hard to say. Rook h5 is very straightforward, But, but I right? think, again, I'm going sort of by the logic of uh, Anis Giri. That, uh, well, look at the clocks. <laughs> that, will, that will give you a, a, a clue at times. But, well, you're saying rook h5. Well, I would think so, yes. And I would really assume his idea should be then to play rook to g6. Yes, and protect it. Okay, well, now the problem is that... But somehow... Mm -hmm. It seems to me like the inclusion of rook h5, rook g6 makes black's position a bit safer in a way. Somehow. What about taking on g5? Uh, no, sorry, that will not work yeah, because well, of f6. <laughs> Just yeah, we should show it. Sorry, uh, but yeah, no, no, the point fine. is here that <laughs> f6 I think you have possible. to move f6, mm -hmm. and after e takes f6, well, you can take on g4 with a check, mm -hmm. and that, that, that should be sufficient. Mm -hmm. Well, else the f pawn will actually queen, but uh, no. So that mm -hmm. that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, I think that here Vichy is looking for something a bit better than rook h5 would be my hunch. Something like rook h7 or more, even more c4. likely c4 mm -hmm. straight away. I mean, if you want to develop the initiative, it should be like this, but of course... But that includes, uh, well, sacrificing at least one of the pawns of the sure. flank, on the queen's flank. You're um, saying that knight b4 is actually attacking both pawns, well, right? Well, black is playing with fire here as well because he's taking his knight very, very far away from, uh, well, from his kingside pawns. But let's say here I would consider rook b1. Uh -huh. I think the knight b4 is not a good move. Really? Well, just... you can't afford to drop... Uh, I can. Well, I you think. can afford, of <laughs> course. <laughs> Something like this. I mean, well, you also... Now, if you poke me with a3 or c3, I'm going to take the I'm going to take a couple of pawns. And That's what right. I don't like from Rice's perspective is the bishop here. Yeah. it's actually shooting into this pawn, and there is mm -hmm. no. Yeah, we've I just mean, been speaking yeah. about good and bad bishops. Yes, yes, <laughs> and and that's a bad true. bishop at we, the moment. <laughs> we don't think about that generally, but uh, well, no. it took me a couple of minutes to get back to that. Well, but I want to do something aggressive. So mm -hmm. f4, isn't that the, the 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 sort of obvious move in a way? And well, if you take it, I'm going to give you a check and let's say something like, I mean, I would guess king to c8 and now bishop f6. I'm already threatening mate in, in a couple of moves. Mm -hmm. And well, if you play something like b6, I guess I can go rook eight seven and start attacking your pawns. Yeah, that's a nice line. I agree I with mean, you. This, is it uh, could, this could become very yeah. dangerous very quickly. Maybe he would actually play the move knight e7. 
in this position. Mm -hmm. But then, oh, you can give a check and you can go to, to F8. Well, what about C4, Knight F4, check? How is this? Is this a Yeah, but that cannot be so attractive for black, I think. What about... Yeah, he's playing C4. Mm -hmm. Okay, we will see. But Let's well, see how quickly Karyakin makes his move. And rook, rook H5. H5. Yes. Is this just a very bad position for black? Well, F4 is uh, going to fall some point soon. Yeah, maybe your only chance is to play C5 and... Uh, well, go for a raise, but well, it seems to me that it's a, white has a kind of a head start in that race. It yeah. could still be a draw, but it's it's very unpleasant. So actually, I think uh, we have a very interesting situation here. I agree and with you. And well, uh, this game could still mm -hmm. easily end in a draw, but sort of to evaluate Vicious preparation, one well, we spoke about um, well, he didn't seem to be very good, well prepared against Carlson's Berlin, but well, we are seeing some well, this is actually. I say quite impressive. If mm -hmm. you manage to put Kayakin under pressure in, yes, the Berlin, in the Berlin, well, yeah. that is already very great. Are, are you suggesting Kayakin is better prepared than Carlsen? <laughs> no, I think Carlsen got, uh, well, I mean, in the Berlin, Carlsen showed excellent preparation in the World Championship. Well, I think I would prefer not to comment on, well, I'm sort of employed for helping Carlsen true. with his preparation, so I should. Uh, we yeah. have a new tweet here by Mike Johnson. Uh, who has showed themselves best prepared in the candidates and why? Well, I think so far a couple of players have, uh, well, generally they are all well prepared, but a few players have impressed. And I think, well, uh, Kramnik comes to mind in his, uh, well, generally, to, to, to an extent actually, in his well, wide I, games, but I, think I would say. Kramnik has been quite well prepared, but we are simply used to his so high standards that mm -hmm. just the fact that he actually got a worse position against Switler, for me, is almost shocking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, maybe we have some uh, sort of unrealistic expectations. Maybe we do. <laughs> and, uh, well, also Topalov has, uh, has shown himself uh, very well, well prepared, but it especially hasn't... Especially yesterday. Yeah, but he hasn't uh, sort of, he hasn't converted it well in any way. Uh, he's on minus but one, he hasn't managed to win a single game yet. And uh, today he has a promising position. So today it could uh, change. The, the guy in the picture there. I and mean, Vichy, Vichiana, of course. Well, he, he beat Aronian with Wyatt. I mean, if that was preparation, I think it's too strong to say. But mm -hmm. he's actually got a good position against Aronian with Wyatt. And I think a promising one with Wyatt against um, um, Kayakin. And, uh, well, with Black, he does, didn't have any kind of troubles as well. No, but I, even I would say... even was better to yeah, yesterday. But, but sort of, uh, if we comment on, on what Vichy has done so far here, what comes to my mind is that he has played very well. Sure. This is not... Uh, well, I wouldn't say that this is because of um, preparation. This is because of... Well, he's, he's, he's made some very good decisions in a further stage. I, I understand, but still, there is a connection. I mean, Vichy has always been an extremely strong player but well in some of the recent years he simply didn't get the slightest edge against the berlin and he didn't get interesting positions with black mm -hmm. and i think one should not underestimate that well clever decisions in preparation actually has an effect I I in of that course. sense uh, uh, as well but no, uh, okay. well obviously Vichy is leading mm -hmm. this tournament mm -hmm. and uh, well this is also due to his excellent preparation I as well. I, I would say so, and I think that somehow his, his work against Carlsen is actually helping him, well, more in the candidates than it probably helped him in the match, in, in a way. Mm -hmm. But, well, I would say that so far, no one has really stood out as, you know, being very much ahead of preparation. I think they have all done it, it quite well, and there's actually a sort of bigger sort of fluctuations in the in the standings than there is sort of in the, well, you say, preparation tournament. I think there, no mm -hmm. one really has uh, disappointed or sort of no. stunned spectacularly in some no. sense. No, well, Svidla was very well prepared in Grunfeld, but that's very much to be expected. Uh, it would be a surprise if it was uh, otherwise, well, well, basically. Svidla has done very well preparation-wise, but yesterday, well, he was, well, he said he was basically lost with Wyatt. That's a bit strong, but I mean, it's clear that yesterday that was... Well, that was he, he was a bit funny during press yes. conference, <laughs> well, he was bad himself. Yeah, well. that's, uh, well... <laughs> Yeah, it's probably better to badmouth yourself than your opponent. Yes. Although yes. he did actually say that Topalov played an awful game, but I think, well, yeah, Topalov agreed, so mm -hmm. it was, it was, no, no. there was no ill intent no, at no, all. No, no, of course not. Um, no, no, it was, uh, it was all correct, I think. Yes. So, 
Well, Kramnik is having a serious thought there. So maybe should we go back to that a bit? Um, it's uh, well, I, I think Kramnik is in an, a bit unfortunate spot. Yeah, Topalov has played short castling, mm -hmm. and um, I think that. Well, I like White's position here. I have to say, and I think Topalov has gotten Kramnik far out of his um, comfort zone. Yeah. This is not how Kramnik wants to to be sort of uh, positioned. Oh, at in all. general, to play chess, no, it's no, not exactly. I mean well, it's true. If if what we are expecting Black to do is take on a three and take on h four, <laughs> that's already not uh, well. But how how do you get your position back in order here? I mean, if you start playing your sort of normal positional way, I I wouldn't be surprised if b five suddenly was quite strong and even. A3. Well, the move F4, of course, is tempting in the sense that it's it's blocking the bishop here, but it's also really breaking the solidity of black's position. I mean, white has the EF4 and uh, rook E1, or he can even play E4 himself. Somehow, I, I think this is a dream position to get against Topalov in the open move. I mean, against Kramnik, you think? Yeah, yes. for sure. Mm -hmm. I think Topalov has done this this excellently. Also, look mm -hmm. at the clock times. I mean. There is a ton of pressure on Kramnik right mm -hmm. now. I agree, and, uh, I agree. But also, we shouldn't forget that yesterday uh, Kramnik had a very, very uh, sort of exciting and a very tiring game. He finished uh, about, well, around six hours. Uh, well, it lasted about six hours the, and plus there was... The, the game lasted five and a half hours and <laughs> Kramnik and Aronian chatted to each other for like 20 minutes before having a press conference. Yes, that's true. So, so no, I mean, uh, he, well... I wouldn't be surprised if he's uh, well not uh, not at his most fresh today sort of not uh, quite he had uh, he had some well tough decisions to make yesterday and even he well he said during press conference that he doesn't feel disappointed and I don't think he does yesterday was a I very good game I think he, he yeah he played, played he played quite well, well and, and that's I mean, probably what counts but, but well you know, winning always gives uh, you some this extra energy and yeah, some and kind also, of. Uh, well, of course, you should be happy with your play. But well, if there is a tournament where points really counts, it is this one. I mean, Kramnik mm -hmm. is thirty-eight; he will be forty in the next candidates tournament. But uh, look at Vishy. <laughs> that is that is true. I mean, I'm not saying it, it's over, but yes. I'm saying that well, okay. I mean, time is putting some kind of pressure on you when you get to this age, and yeah. well. Kramnik, well, he would really like to to get this uh, this match with Kr uh, Carlsen, I'm sure. Mm. Uh, well, yes. like the seven other players <laughs> in, uh, in the tournament. Obviously, but well, he has uh, also mentioned in some interviews that this could very well be his last uh, sort of try. But uh, on the other hand, he has been saying it for for quite a while. Well, I, think. I think before uh, Anand was playing the World Championship in 2008, someone thought this was his his last chance, and yes. well, he won four world championships in a row so I mean yeah, well, yeah. one shouldn't not always believe what commentators are saying uh, uh, yeah maybe. or even the players themselves they also <laughs> change their minds less, I think. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> but but uh, well the fact is that this position is not very pleasant for black no and Kramnik seems to well, be aware of that I think also one interesting uh, mm, thing in this position is that normally you would consider playing a5 with black Mm -hmm. Well, just to, just to get rid of those pawns. But b5 is always to be considered. And here particularly, b5 is very, very strong. What, what happens after bishop b7 then? Well, is e6 going to be extremely weak suddenly? Yeah, I think simply what happens here is that, well, yeah, black gets way too many weaknesses. Mm -hmm. I think even simple b6, bishop c6... And uh, you're just gonna take a couple take, of take times. Take, take, and then maybe yeah. even take on f4 and uh, put my uh, yeah. rook on e1, queen sure. on e2. You're saying something like this, and then and next it's gonna be, well, the e6 pawn is gonna be yeah. awfully weak. Yeah, it's it's extremely straightforward. Mm -hmm. Well, th this structure here, on the queen side, this actually I think I had this with White against uh, well Rustam Kazimjanov in maybe. 10, 12 years back in a tournament in, in Skanabo in Denmark. Uh, and mm -hmm. Well, the game was a, was a quick draw, um, but, well, I think Drev was trying to put moderate pressure 
by White by playing this structure at the time, but he was generally seemed to be completely fine. But mm -hmm. of course, there the pawn would be back on f7 and the pawn would be on h2. But now I think this inclusion, well, the pawn on f4 actually very much ruins uh, the Well, black it should position. be on f7. Yes, yes uh, the, the or at least on f5. But f4, yeah. I mean, well, it's called the stone wall, but somehow, well, you're making a, no, a gaping in, hole in, in, the in the stone wall. You don't do f4 unless you're well, just winning. Unless it's, it's very, very yes. good, yeah. I mean, yes. so. No, this is. Uh, no, this F4 was maybe a bit. It's full of regrets, mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, well. He's not going to play A5. This was just an illustration of the dangers maybe. of the positions. Can he just develop with Bishop B7? You have to do something. Well, I think Bishop B7, again, it uh, potentially weakens E6. So I would first of all consider, well, either Queen E2 or just taking on e f F4, uh, mm -hmm. just uh, very direct. Queen E2 looks. I mean, even better to me. How, how do you defend the pawn on, on d7 at all, actually? On, on sorry, on, uh, on e6. Hmm. Yeah, well, that's, that's a very good question. Well, I was thinking you can't take here. And if queen takes, then play knight g7. Mm -hmm. and it's, but, but here it's, you're yeah. going into passive but defense. You can also put a pawn on knight on e5. At least the h4 pawn is... Uh, Weak, but yeah, that's true. H4. Well, here you can play h5, for instance, maybe. Yeah, h5 this is, this is promising. Is not, not great. Yes, Kramnik really has some tough choices to make, and this will be well, this would be a, a serious blow for him. I mean, he will um, actually drop down to 50% suddenly. Yes, but I mean, we are still far away from that. What about something like e5? Is he if he sort of continues to play in the same vein, you could say? Just getting rid of his uh, yeah. weaknesses and, uh, well, making c5 vulnerable as well. Yeah, this is uh, um, well. slightly <laughs> above my tactical level. Um, I Probably it's <laughs> not good, but uh, but it's interesting. It looks uh, at least very... Would, I would play b5. That was mainly, mainly <laughs> to, be, to be funny. No, I think, um, well, d takes e5, we should see. It could end up with a white winning some sort of, uh, well... Uh, a piece for a couple of pawns, something like that. What would be your next move then? E6? But then I could even consider taking on B4. Mm -hmm. Maybe Kramnik is seriously considering something mm -hmm. like this, at least to, to fight back in a very practical well, sense. Well, E5 is a very... Uh, but maybe there is B5 here and you don't get, I mean, you don't get uh, things. Mm -hmm. We have a tweet from Timothy Werby. He is asking, how do a player's wins and losses in previous mm -hmm. rounds affect their play this round? more aggressive and uncertain positions. Well, in this round, uh, you could say that, for instance, Svidlo went for, well, for a slightly dubious opening. And I think, well, it's actually, it's hard to say maybe he would have done exactly the same uh, had he I even lost yesterday. I don't think that Svidlo playing the Dutch today is heavily based on yesterday's result. No. He has prepared the Dutch for this tournament, I think, simply I think as so, an yes. interesting surprise weapon. Mm -hmm. Um, but, well, no, of course it's going to affect the, the, the mood uh, yeah. and such. But uh, I think, for instance, in this game that we are looking at right yeah. now, uh, I think that Topalov's uh, loss has much uh, less relevance than, well, his principal, uh, sort of principled rivalry uh, with Kramnik. I think so. Uh, well, very, very much so mm -hmm. in that sense. And, well, Aronian, well, things are looking well for him, but... With White against uh, Andrekin, he would play for win Any, anyway. anyway. I mean, mm -hmm. so I think actually, well, you saw also Andrekin yesterday. I, well, he was minus two and he was playing the leader. But I don't think he was specifically trying to make a draw. No, he was just no. playing chess. So no. I would say so far in this tournament, I can't really come up with a good example of the players being very tactical. Well, no, but I think we can come up with one example. Maybe when Svidler refused this draw. This was maybe your, this yeah. was psychological because had he beaten Kramnik uh, in the previous round when Kramnik, well, it looked like Kramnik was about to lose, but he managed to find this very beautiful defense with f5, rook f6. Svidla would have just made a draw and have been I th I think, very happy. I, th I think you're right. That mm -hmm. that actually had a, a huge effect in, in that sense. I think um. so, and uh, well, generally players are very different. Let's say Gary Kasparov, he always said, I think, that after a loss, well, losses didn't happen so often <laughs> to him, but he would play with doubled energy and he mm -hmm. would be really sort of angry, but in this mm -hmm. sports sense, and then he would play 
even better than usual. And of course, there will be some players who will who will start risking too much or, you know, who, well, uh, some players, they just um, you know, just go for a quiet draw after yeah, a loss I or something like that. It's, it's well, I think there is some sort of kind of chess wisdom that say that after a loss, you should sort of, s well, slow down with a draw, for yeah. instance. But well, for instance, I was, well, the second of uh, Vichyana in three World Championship matches, and I think twice Vichy lost a game and fell behind in the match, but both times he immediately one. Bounce back, yes. Well, that is two games, and that's a very, very short uh, sort of uh, statistical sample mm -hmm. in, in a way. So I don't think we can learn a lot from that. But, but um, it is generally, I think, the wisdom of the old um, Soviet chess school that, well, if you lose, you know, you should sort of calm down, make a quiet yeah. draw. And I think it, it, ha it had more relevance in the times when the tournaments used to have mm -hmm. 17 or 15 rounds. Yeah. Then, then it was uh, more sort of uh, practical. But I recall that in the Women's Grand Prix last year, um, I, I, I had some, some uh, tough uh, tournaments where I lost two or three rounds in a row. And uh, Adrian Michal who who is a very famous chess coach and a player himself, he just, well, he said, Victoria, come on, what, what is it that you are doing? If you lose one game, you, you, should just, you should just make a quiet draw and then, you know, and then play again. So it's very much uh, sort of a chess wisdom that you should uh, quiet, well, calm, calm yourself down and, and um, yeah. I think there is a very recent example. There was the tournament in Zurich, uh, well, I think in, in, in January. Well, actually the, the highest rated tournament ever. Well, Carlsen was completely lost against Nakamura in, I think, round three. And, uh, well, Carlsen not only saved the game, he actually won it. And the next round, Nakamura, well, lost, uh, well, he didn't, I think, there's no point to hide it. He himself thought it was not, not a very good game. And I think, well, I read that Nakamura was saying that in other sports, well, the nice thing is that when you lose, you actually get to go home. It's, it's over in some sense. Mm -hmm. While in chess, things are just continuing like uh, uh, normally. And I think, well, for instance, for Nakamura, it seemed that, uh, well, his reaction to a loss was basically, well, I mean, he was so close to beating Carlsen for the first time and uh, taking the lead in, in this extremely strong tournament that it sort of seemed to, well, m almost tilt him um, not to win the game. And there, I think it has a huge influence. But, yeah. well, I think as a chess player, you'd unless you play a knockout tournament, which is not so often, you don't get to go home. So actually no. this is, well, you have to be stable enough to, to sort of shake these things uh, off you. And uh, mm -hmm. well, some players will shake them off having a draw. Someone will shake them off by being uh, aggressive. Ideally, you should be able to do both uh, depending on circumstances. Mm -hmm. Crumbling is thinking a lot here. And uh, um. well, rightly so. We. We don't really have a good uh, suggestion for him in this position. No, well, he could very well be uh, considering e5, as we just mentioned. Objectively speaking, it could not. It could be uh, actually not such a good move, but it would be understandable from a point of view of, well, you know, changing uh, the the sort of the course of the game a little bit because, well, what seems to be scary right now from the blacks perspective, if just is just allowing white to exchange on f4 and you know, double on E line and put enormous pressure on E6. Mm -hmm. It's maybe about to make a move. I thought so as well, but he seems to have second thought. Well, he's also spent more than an hour. Okay, A5. He did play A5. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And this is just the move that we were considering and saying that B5 is very strong here. We hmm. thought that B5 looked like a, a very good reaction to that. Um. So, of course, again, purely a sort of a tactical uh, reaction, but... This is something that uh, Topalov will think about. Well, for sure. I mean, B5 looks... Well, somehow A3, it's not that it looks bad, but... Um, it's a bit tame here. Yes. Well, A3 would be a very, very normal reaction, but you really want to exploit that uh, the kingside structure is so different. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he's going to think for a while, but I would really expect him to play B5 here. Yeah. How bad, it, how bad is it? B5? Well, if you take on B5, C6 is just going to be... Actually, well, I thought C6 is going to be strong because after knight B8, normally you can play C7. <laughs> no, but, but there's actually a pawn on F4 this time. So this bishop, bishop takes B5. Let's bishop see. takes B5. Mm -hmm. And if queen C7, you just have rook C1 mm -hmm. and you're not going to win this pawn. You're actually going to... No, no, this is, this, a, this this is, is a, terrible. This is a, a terrible thing. So after B5, 
It has to be bishop b7 from Kramnik. Yes, and, and then uh, probably there's nothing better than, than exchanging on c6 and b6 and just going for this actually very positional um, yeah. positional sort something, of concept of rook Something one. like this. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. Okay. Would you say that uh, it's slightly better for white or is it uh, almost awful for, for black? It's hard for me to say, but it looks mm -hmm. like um, black has simply... Well, it's not like he has one weakness on well, e6. Have a look at the Indians. Yeah, 0. that I can see. Uh, okay. but, uh, but, well, the point yeah, is that he has... Closing in on awful, I think. Yes, uh, he has a weakness on e6. He has a very... Well, this g6 is also not making his position more beautiful. <laughs> Let's put it like Defending this. Defending the knight, at least. Yes but, yes, but potentially it could also be a problem after something yeah. like queen c2. Um, yeah, no, this is this is not the kind of position that Kramnik normally no, ends up not at all. Well, in uh, after the look open. at his clock time. Also, he spent more than yeah. an hour on uh, on thirteen moves, mm -hmm. and he has a bad position. This well, is, uh, I think if 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 Topalov finds b five now, then we can safely say that this has been a success for him well, opening wise. I think that, that's decided uh, even oh, after a three. Yeah. I think he has gotten more than what you would normally get. But actually, after a three, he well. Uh, Kramnik has some chances to swap down a bit and let's You're say even just taking on b4 I think just sort of uh, well I think it's important that uh, yeah that's but c6 even, even this is, is not nice um, no. there is a bishop on c8 that's kind of uh, no weak. but uh, wait a second I think what you're missing is that if we take on c5 now take uh -huh. on c5 and just play e5 he could just get Shop. Well, he could be just in time, on time to get rid of his weaknesses. If this is working, I it's a different story, I, mm -hmm. I, I agree. Um, and that I cannot sort of evaluate um, very easily. Let's say easily. d takes e5, knight takes c5. I would also consider most like queen a2, just to mm -hmm. get you to do something. And even... After e4, I could give up a piece at times. But, well, you're right. This could actually have gotten a bit out of hand here. But, well, well, I think we agree. b5 is the very, very likely move in, in, in this position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, this is the ambitious uh, move. And, uh, yeah. But, okay, I think Topala will think a bit here. But we see that Kayakin is thinking hard and the, the leader, Anand, is standing up. So, should we switch to, to mm -hmm. that game to, uh, a bit? Yeah, to Vicious game, definitely. And yeah, c4 happened, and Kayakin neither went to b4 or f4, but he went to c3. Mm -hmm. And um, Anand has just taken his king up the board. That mm -hmm. is maybe a bit surprising. Well, we thought that after knight b4, the idea was f4 takes bishop a4 check with a huge attack. Mm -hmm. But why wouldn't that be the case here as well? Because uh, you cannot plant the bishop on f6 because knight e4 will come back, I think. You could be right, but... Uh, well, uh, knight on c3 is simply closer to the center, I think. Uh, and uh, Sure, Sh show me. So here yeah, I bishop h4 check. check. And well, King C8? are you saying that I'm not on time? Well, well if you go knight e4 now, I'm going to make No, you. but I'll but play b6 and then maybe even follow... B4. Why not B5, B5 actually, is even so better, yeah. something like this. And, uh, mm -hmm. But I actually really like King F3, uh, yeah. because, well, if we go back to that position, if you take on A2, well, for a start, taking on A2 is not really very good, because of Rook A1, most likely, even. Yeah, I would rather win the F7 pawn. But, but also King E4 is very interesting. Yeah. King E4 and King, e uh, King F5. That but looks I'm still sort of thinking that a position where the king is on e7. Ah, but actually your idea is not to take it with the king. Maybe you want to go f4 here and to, yeah, to break free. But I really like the activity of uh, mm -hmm. white's pieces. Yeah. Here the knight is somehow going astray and um, and um, but the maybe king you should can play a, a quiet move here with black. Um, well, well, something like b5. Yeah, <laughs> I was about to say b5. It's not that quiet no, actually. No, no. But uh, b5 or move King e7, you think? But yeah, it's maybe. not exactly clear. Well, what about if I play a3 now, simply? Mm -hmm. 
I don't have to it's sacrifice this. It's not like the knight is, is trapped, right? He can still go to a5 and uh, a4 and c5. Mm -hmm. um, but, and rook h5? Well, instead of a3. Probably. Yeah, or maybe, mm -hmm. well, after knight a4, for instance, rook h5, you still have something like rook d6. And here already I can take on g5. <laughs> This Finally, one, this I one got, you got right. I got yeah, it I think. working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. No, it is. I still would expect black to be quite okay. And actually, well, the computer the is saying that black is zero point. Yeah, well, uh, but a hundredth of a pawn up. But uh, I wouldn't. Uh, <coughs> I wouldn't be surprised if uh, if the computer's evaluation will not uh, no. be sort and of uh, this could confirmed. Actually be the sort of brilliancy of Anand's prep. I mean. Well, we can all find good moves that are indicated by the computer, and mm -hmm. uh, well, that's well how some of us have been making a living for a <laughs> while. But actually, finding good moves that are not suggested by the computer, this is uh, yes. in a completely different league, and that's what's really valuable nowadays: finding moves that are very strong and underestimated by the computer. And maybe mm -hmm. this is the whole concept of this. And uh, I mean, this is—it's quite interesting. I think maybe C5 he's considering here also to. Yeah. Well, to open up the rook a little bit. It does take that square away, away from the knight, but maybe that doesn't matter so much. But c5, you could be right. Mm -hmm. Well, I kind of like this move. Yeah. Well, you can s give a check, but if something like this, we're just going to go for repetition. Yeah. I don't think and that's a vicious plan. If something like rook g8, that could even be rook g6. Mm -hmm. so well, yeah, we should remember not, that temporarily the bishop on g3 is, is shut shut yes. out of the game. Yeah. So king three. Oh, this is an interesting position. And, well, Kayakan has been surprised in the opening, but, well, a lot of the moves were played before and he still does have like almost an hour left for for to make 17 mm -hmm. moves so time is not really a huge no, factor. No, I'm beginning to here. think that c5 could be interesting yeah. for him. Maybe maybe that is even what computer is thinking about it, 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 when, when he shows, well, it, when, when it, it shows saying, that. Saying, saying yes. that, yeah. Mm -hmm. That cannot be ruled out. Do you think Vichy is still in his preparation? I would somehow doubt it. Uh, well, I think no, actually, I will take that back. Um, <laughs> well, he's sort of in the outskirts of it. I mean, they have evaluated this ending and they think that this is uh, playable for white and not just a dead draw. Mm -hmm. I think this is actually, well, this must be his preparation for game um, game four in the World Championship match with, with, with Carlsen. Mm -hmm. We have a new tweet from Lucas. Can the players really be close friends, example Kramnik, Aronin, after all they compete mm -hmm. against each other for quite some money? Well, I think yes. I <laughs> think so, yes, abs absolutely. I think also, well, uh, you, you meet the same people uh, for years and, um, well, it's true you compete uh, with them and sometimes for quite some money. But you also will have lunches with them, and and sure. uh, and you will like quite some of them because they are simply well interesting people, and you share well being a chess player is also a rather unusual occupation, so it matters that well. No, of course. I mean, there will be times when things cools down. I think, for instance, well, Kramnik and Leko were very good friends, but at some point they had to play a world championship match t together, and one could even see that sort of. Well, chess journalists will get quotes where they were sort of critical of each other, but that's, well, that's, I mean, if you take boxing, well, that will be quite well, considerably be. <laughs> more. So, I think they're still reasonably polite to each other, but, yes. uh, well, I think Anand and Kramnik, for instance, they actually played each other in 2008, but, well, they, are, they seem to be, be great friends, and, uh, mm -hmm. well, they're not even hiding it, and I think that, well, Anand was saying that he even asked Kramnik's advice, should he play here or not, and... I think generally players are quite friendly. Mm -hmm. um, I know that, uh, for instance, well, Carlsen and Anand, well, they, I mean, Carlsen was even visiting some of Anand's uh, training sessions uh, at some point, but, but later, of course, they became rivals and played mm -hmm. uh, a World Championship match together. But, well, it's also a useful exchange in the sense that, 
Well, there's not that many players in the world who understand chess at their level. So yeah. I think they are colleagues, but also genuinely friends. And but it's possible to... I also think there's one more point that very often, well, yeah, you will be colleagues and you will sort of, well, I think it is only on a lower level that you get angry with your opponent for beating you. I think those people that we see in, in this tournament, for instance, they're mainly competing with themselves and they want to improve what they do. Because yeah. somehow this feeling, you know, well, sometimes very often in the kids' championships, you will see that rivalries are just insane. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, well, especially against with parents. Yes, as, especially with parents. But the better you get, the more, well, philosophical you, you get about it. And I well, think that extent. there are m much fewer sort of rivalries between uh, persons on the high level, but you try to improve what you are doing. Uh, well, maybe the day when Topalov is playing Kramnik is yes. not, not the day to <laughs> say exactly that. No, no, there, there are exceptions, but I don't think it's a rule no. to be very uh, sort of angry with, with no, the, no, the guy no, you're I playing. Think, well, I think everybody is hoping that their personal life goes uh, well yeah. and such, but of course there is a chess rivalry. Um, but I think, for instance, Ben Larsen, uh, well, the famous Danish players were saying that well, if people sit down to play me, well, they have to understand there is a risk they're going to lose. Mm -hmm. and that, that's how it is. And that's, but, that's but also to is. be quite specific about the, the tweet. Well, the tweeter was saying, yeah, they compete for, for money. But it's not completely a sort of, let's say, zero-sum game in the sense that, well, maybe of course with the prices it is that if one player wins, the other one doesn't. But we'll take, for instance, uh, Carlsen's popularity. In that actually could generate quite some sponsorship and more tournaments that will benefit everybody, mm -hmm. not only Carlsen, of course, mainly Carlsen, but actually the whole chess community in general. And, well, the player in, in the picture here, Vichy Arnand, I mean, he's popularized chess uh, in India, and I think there is like a million kids playing uh, school chess tournaments. Maybe millions. Yeah, even. <laughs> I think. And that's, uh, well, that's great for everybody in the chess environment, mm -hmm. basically. So... It is, of course, there is direct rivalry and, that, well, it's clear that there is just going to be one winner in this tournament who will get um, to, to challenge Carlsen, but still. Um, okay. And wow, we have something very interesting happening in uh, Tupal of Kramnik. Mm -hmm. So let's... Well, we have abandoned the other games a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah, um, we're sorry yeah. for that. And let's get back to them just Quickly. after this, but mm -hmm. let's just show Tupal of Kramnik... Um, under. Mm -hmm, because, well, just now we were uh, discussing that b5 is the move uh, for white. Topalov has played b5 quite he quickly. He did it quickly, even. yes. And Kramnik, he's exploring the fact that there is um, no, the bishop on h2 is blocked. So he took on c5, b c5, 6, and knight b8. Mm -hmm. And now bishop b5. Yeah. Actually, well... White is considerably better. Here. I understand there will be a sign up there soon saying <laughs> that uh, the computer thinks white has a huge edge, and that's yeah. probably true. Having said that, there is something I like about Kr Kramnik's concept that he will get his bishop to d6, and that will guard the pawn here, and maybe he can play c4 and the knight around to c7. I understand that um, easily this can end up uh, horrible, but there is some kind of concept to it. Mm -hmm. I, I do feel some kind of sympathy for it, but uh, maybe it's going to collapse horribly, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so you think C4 is what, what no, he's planning? No, I, I don't know what he's planning here, to be honest. Um, and I think also... Well, he could also play knight a6, knight c7, just to yeah. block this pawn. But maybe he do have a, a horrible position, simply. Maybe yeah, you're right that he will do knight a6 uh, straight away and put it on c7. Yeah. Well, this is not great, or it's actually maybe less than, than great. Um, yeah. But, well, you have to do something, and you have to... Well, I think Kramnik is going to really hang on to a concept that's trying to say the bishop on h2 is out of play. And mm -hmm. if we look at the computer, the computer is overestimating White's position because it's calculating a lot of positional factors and undervaluing how bad the bishop is on h2. Mm -hmm. I don't actually believe in Kramnik's concept, but I think this is got what he's gonna gonna aim for. Yes. Well, I think also that Black's problem is that he has not one weakness, not two weaknesses, but as soon as well, uh, White is ready just to take on f4, and uh, well, you know, he he has just a 
to find a way to maybe yeah. open up the E line, put oh, put yeah. the rocks there. It's like a I stone mean, wall that's not <laughs> compact, but it's a bit of a wall here, yes, a bit of a wall there. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a very yeah, this is a broken wall uh, Quite, yeah. pretty much. And um no, hmm. this is no, no. This is uh, a tough moment and well if we go back some rounds we thought that Aronian of the favorites was doing pretty badly but uh, Kramnik was actually seemed in excellent shape but yeah. this has completely been reversed yeah but maybe it's a special game for him I think so maybe and it's I think uh, well what we are seeing here on the board also reflects a little bit mm. that well the feelings of the board uh, towards yeah, the, the the opponent I think that some well Topalov is a, a nice player to have here, but it's not uh, to Kramnik's ad advantage. No. I think, well, exchange him for, for instance, well, anybody in, in Topalov's league, and that would be great for Kramnik because there will not be these sort of personal feelings. Yeah, and, yeah. well, I think Kramnik, well, if one read the interviews after the Lista match, I mean, I think he was affected by it, and I think also, I think Kramnik is much more affected by out of board things than Topalov is. I think in anything Topalov will gain energy from it while mm -hmm. Kramnik will, will lose energy. So in that sense you That's can say that unlikely, it's uh, yes. well it's a brilliant concept by, by Topalov to, to create this tension, although I think that uh, that is not the, the, the motivation behind it. But mm -hmm. well there will be players you dislike playing and um, well I think partly for chess reasons well, but maybe also that players <laughs> that well you would really like to beat every time. And that's uh, yeah. yeah that's but sometimes that creates unnecessary tension. But I would actually think that, well, of course, Kramnik would really love to beat Topalov, but I think actually he would be very happy simply not playing him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, uh, that's absolutely true. I, I agree. think that he's... Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's, yeah. so that's what one would assume. Um, so, but actually we promised yeah. to look at the other games. Mm -hmm. so, so let's do that. I think, for instance, Aronian, who could, uh, well, be in the lead after this uh, round, we have sort of abandoned for a while. Mm -hmm. So maybe let's have a look at uh, how he's doing. Definitely. I think we left you in, in the position we have on the lower board here. Bishop takes c6. And king d8, knight b5 was played. And then queen c5, bishop a8, queen b5. Mm -hmm. We are still following the game you Tim mentioned. Tim and Smith. Tim mm -hmm. and Smith. Yes, that's right. Bishop g2, bishop d7, b3, e5 is the position on mm -hmm. the board. That I would have to check if we are still following yeah. or not. It looks very logical. We could still be following a game. There I were would quite think. some quite some uh, games uh, in mm -hmm. that area, uh, even recently in the recent years. Yeah. So it is. Um, it's actually a very unbalanced position, and not. It's not obvious that it is to one's player advantage, apart from the fact that if we look at the clocks. Uh, yeah. No, no. I can. I think the the geary trick of looking at the clocks gives yeah. some indication here. But, mm -hmm. but I think you, you're right. If uh, one forgets about the clock and even about the engine, one can see some potential in black position. I would even Absolutely. think that he played. We saw he played bishop d7. I was about to say that's to play bishop c6. Well, obviously it was to play e5. Mm -hmm. But but also bishop c6 looks like a decent move. And uh, well, how do you think he will handle the black king? You think he will just keep it there or? Well, I think the sort of the, the most natural way to do it would be, well, let's say putting the bishop on d6 and maybe king e7 and then, well, bringing the rook over to, well, mm -hmm. c8 or d8 or wherever he needs it most. Another, let's say, more aggressive argument would be that, well, I'm actually quite well positioned with, with black. Why not play h5, for instance, try, try doing something aggressive and attack? Well, I would be a bit worried about the king on d8, potentially. I think, some, well, let's say something like um, bishop b2, followed by rook d1 and d3. Yeah, well, at that point, maybe I will have to take <laughs> on b3, for instance. Yes, maybe. Um, well, it's true that it could be difficult for white just to open up the d-line. Mm -hmm. Black would be against, against that. And the bishop on d7, at least, is sort of... a. Uh, well, slowing things down a bit there, I would say. But if we have to summarize it in, in a two words, it's actually not easy to say something definite about this position at all. Um, it's, um, well, well, it's just complicated. It's complicated, and I think it's unbalanced, and it's going to be a lot of fun. But it is one hour and, well, 29 minutes against 42 mm -hmm. minutes. And well, it's uh, fun for 20, us. 26 moves left. There is definitely some practical advances to uh, Andreikin's position. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But objectively speaking, I do and have some sympathy for Black here. Th I'm not saying he's better, but I think he has a completely 
find an interesting position. Yeah, this is already a new position, the one that we okay. have, on, well, that they have on the board. Um, so. Okay, rook b1. Rook Maybe B1. I'm about to change my mind <laughs> and say that white actually is doing very well here. This is an interesting move. Well, he's not allowing um, and Raikin to relax at mm -hmm. all. No, no, but but also, well, uh, Aronian can't afford to just uh, make some, you know, simple moves uh, and and uh, well wait until uh, and Raikin puts all of his pieces the way he wants. By the way, in the game that we were mentioning, Tim and Smiths, actually instead of Bishop D seven, he just played H five. He simply Tim yeah. and played the move H five. Not no, Tim and Smith played H five. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and uh, after h4 he played bishop f5, which looks more well energetic. Um, and I guess e4. E4 and then bishop d7. So he okay. um, he provoked uh, e4. Yeah. Well. But well, let's remind you that well, this game ended in Timon's win. So. Mm -hmm. Sure. No, uh, it's a very interesting position. I wouldn't. Well, it l really looks like Andrekin is actually being creative already. He's thinking for quite, himself. Quite. Ch well, he, he might I mean, be. The clock time <laughs> is, is heavily. Looks, yes. mm -hmm. But let's debate the actual position after rook b1. Mm -hmm. Well, I think taking on c4 I is quite a serious threat. At first, I thought bishop d6 is just defending against that threat, but maybe it's not. Let's say bc4, queen c4, queen c4, knight c4. Rook b7. Yeah. Is this sort of a serious intrusion into the. the well, the it black is at position? least. An, well, let's see what about bishop c5. Are uh, you going well, to play rook b8 check? At some point. But I have bishop c8 and king c7. So I guess I should go d3 first. Mm -hmm. And, okay, you will put the knight on d6, and maybe you're disturbing me in time, but I wouldn't really think so. I'll give a check. And when you're gonna go away, I would think bishop b2, and I have rook c1 next. And if you hit my rook with king c7, I'm just gonna hide it here. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, rook b1. It's not comfortable, no. Not at all. No, rook b1 is a well, is a nice concrete move, of course. Yeah. I. Yeah. So I think let's so say. Mm -hmm. I think he's putting quite some pressure in this position. And the concept is probably that if you take on b3 now, then uh, yeah, really white is not afraid of losing the e2 pawn. Ah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. No, but no. Maybe he wants to hide the queen on a4 and somehow say that this is, well, this is a good way of keeping white from being active. And now he has an easy plan of bishop d6. He just took on b3. He took on mm -hmm. b3. And... Oh, but that's yeah. a scary decision. S oh, I was about honestly. to say, I think that's, it looks like a, no, a strong decision. No, I, I disagree with you. Okay. <laughs> I really think that he should have tried to develop uh, his bishop first and try to go yeah. well into this end game, basically. Uh, yeah, I strongly disagree with you, actually. Mm -hmm. I think this is a, a, a good decision. And mm -hmm. rook b3, he's going to put his queen on a4 and create some kind of stability there. But, uh, well, we, we will see. And it's, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. it's a very interesting position. But I think from a purely chess point of view, things are not too bad for, for Andrekin. What I about taking on e2? Yeah, that why is that bad? It is scary. <laughs> I agree with you, yes. Well, that's why we can look at it as <laughs> much as we want. But uh, yeah. it's well, not advisable for the players. Bishop b2 just... Mm -hmm. But maybe you're right, bishop d6. It's uh, Yeah. Uh, am I not just having everything... Uh, well, bishop d6, yes, rook d3, <laughs> and you're losing immediately. Oh. That is that is yeah. quite, a, quite a move. Uh, I, well, I, I would be surprised, mm. but maybe you're right, queen e2. What would happen after queen a4? Maybe we're missing a, maybe a, strong, concrete. a strong move for, for, for white. Well, I just think that queen a4 doesn't really... Stop anything. Let's say rook d1. You can play with the idea of playing d4. Yeah, maybe actually you should just give away the pawn directly. Yeah. And, uh, well I, think I think if you take with the queen, the d line is gonna no, it's break. Going to break. The problem is here, bishop f4, you're entering this, this square. Mm -hmm. Actually, maybe my fascination of queen a4 <laughs> is just uh, no, I think nonsense. But, but then. Well, well, he wants to take on e2 or what? 
attacking on e2. It's so, so scary. But, but I really like it. It would really be a courageous decision. <laughs> yes. <But> if he <laughs> does it... <laughs> well, you have to respect it, but if you take on e2, you have uh, almost an hour less and uh, a lot of moves to make. This is... This is really playing with fire. Mm -hmm. This is really playing with fire. Yeah, he's, do, he's doing something. Let's see. Yeah. He's yes. taking on E2, yes. <laughs> oh. Okay, that's... Well, okay. you have yeah. to respect that. Yeah, and I have to respect that you were right. <laughs> I still think it's not a great position for Black. No, but, but uh, it was already difficult, I think. Well, uh, practically mm -hmm. speaking, it was not an easy uh, position. But at least the argument I made that the Queen on A4 would disturb. You could actually say the same thing about the Queen on E2. It's actually creating some kind of uh, annoyance. Um, in the black, in the well, white position. The black's position is, of course, very loose here. But the bishop, king is on D. Bishop D two, and, and you said that if bishop D six and rook D three was surprisingly strong. Well, it's just winning immediately okay. because bishop F three oh. catches the queen, and, and, and at the D6 moment, six. yes, and D6 uh, bishop is F five, rook D six is, mm -hmm. is pretty bad. So but after bishop B two, he has to come up with another move. Yes. Well. <coughs> <laughs> it's not as easy. Well, for a start, he has to think about. Uh, well, Bishop A4 is an interesting um, is okay. an interesting option. Looks greedy to put it mild. <laughs> but uh, you remember, well, knights are generally the best defenders of the king. And uh, if you give me a check on D3, I'll just put one of my probably the F knight on D7. And this looks solid to you. So <laughs> well, as solid as it can get. Uh, I mean, okay. I have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, pieces uh, actually. Yeah. I have two knights and two bishops, and they are controlling really a lot of squares. It's yeah, it, it is yeah. an unusual position. <laughs> you could be right. Uh, <laughs> it's it's very interesting, and something like this could could happen. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, eleven is a bit uh, about to make a move. Yeah. Well, well bishop B2 actually, is a lot could be said also for bishop a3, I think. Uh, because um, generally exchanging a pair of bishops is for whites, uh, to white's advantage, I think. But it also, I would say, that helps black in the sense that well, he speeds up a bit in, in development. Yeah, but, but he has he simply, uh, well, too you many, well, his king becomes weaker. You're saying it's kind of uh, sort of Swiss cheese to a certain extent. Yes, but there is, uh, yes I simply think that it's more difficult to, to protect uh, mm. everything. And Maybe he has to try to j just very quickly go into some kind of endgame. Yeah, I he was just thinking... He just played bishop a3, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's interesting. No, I think, uh, well... Yeah, well, we could actually see Aronian back into, I mean, well, a shared lead soon. And uh, yes, well, he started out losing, and uh, mm -hmm. no, this is yeah, well, this that's is unpleasant for Andreiken, of course. <laughs> yeah, maybe he should try and seek refuge in in some kind of ending. How bad is uh, move Queen C four? Queen C four could be uh, quite bad if you just take on C four, Knight takes and play Rook B eight check. Okay, bishop c8 is only move. And maybe something like bishop h3. Actually, I don't see anything concrete here. No, uh, oh. uh, excuse me, rook c1 was possible, I think. Okay. <coughs> that could be more scary. Yeah, this could be... Yeah, that could, could be just could bad. Be, could mm -hmm. be quite decisive to a certain mm -hmm. extent. I think maybe he first has to swap the bishops and then play queen c4. Okay, that that you you could be right about that. But so of course there... You're saying something like takes, takes, and now queen c4. c4. And you're thinking that this kind of exchange here... Well, in king e7, I guess. And at least you got some coordination. But you have, all, well, these two knights are generally not the best two pieces to have for a rook. Not in they this are quite kind of awkward. ending, and yes. uh, well, somehow I would be a bit afraid of, of this rather simplistic plan. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's the best but that Andreiken be can Andrekin do. It could be that has passed the point of uh, sort of, well... Uh, Having a lot of good choices. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. He has to actually find something that's reasonable, defendable, not uh, not very strong. Mm 
So yeah. this uh, could be his but I think something. And Reichen is, well, to put it very simple, he's in trouble. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. And Reichen uh, is in a bit of trouble, and uh, well, well his time I'm also reflects that. And maybe um, yeah. I think more than a bit, actually. If I had to bet on one result right now, it would actually be Aronian's win. I think that's m even quite more likely than uh, Andreikin mm -hmm. making it. I think this is simply a, a very tough position mm -hmm. for, for Andreikin. Uh, maybe it's time to have a look at how the Swidler's Leningrad is doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Against Mamed Yarov. Yeah. yeah. Well, things has definitely happened here. I think the last move we saw was um, 10 bishop a3. Mm -hmm. And Swidler replied with a... Well. Well, some aggression. Well, maybe you should take us through here. You are the Leningrad expert, after <laughs> well, all. <laughs> so e4. With pleasure. <laughs> knight d4, rook f7. Quite this typical, I guess. This is very typical, mm -hmm. I think, yes. And generally, well, at least in my experience, it's already a good sign if uh, with black you manage to play e4 uh, in these positions. Mm-hmm. Without uh, well, without the pawns being uh, I don't know blocked in some unpleasant way or or without any kind of concrete problems, and that rook goes to f7 is just uh, extremely typical. But it's not completely for free. White has gotten quite some some moves on the queen side, right? That's true. But okay, queen b3 happened, and now Spitler played knight c6. I quite like that. That sort of. Uh, well, you're exchanging off a, a, a nice knight on, on d4 for your own on, on b8. And it's true, White is getting a couple of tempo in what happens uh, next here. Let's see. So takes, takes b5, the queen back, and f3. Okay, he's really trying to sort of shoot down the, the, the center straight away here, right? Mm -hmm. So I would actually most... I, I almost think that he could have considered taking on c6 with a pawn. Uh huh. Like this. Yeah, it's a, it's a strange move, and but uh, there is some. Well, your point is that it's actually, despite making weak points, it also creates a lot of stability on the queen side, so. right? And and also I think space mm -hmm. and squares. Yeah, he's he's quite comfortable already mm -hmm. on, on well in the center, let's yeah. say, and queen c six. Well, it gives white uh, some time. But. Hmm. But it, there is well nothing wrong with it. Well, actually, the final position no. is, is very exciting. So let's yes. let's, let's, let's jump to that. that. Mm -hmm. Queen c6, b5, queen e8. f3 happened. Mm -hmm. And Spitler played bishop e6. Yeah. I assume if he takes on e4, well, for a start, you can probably take back with the knight simply. I think so, mm -hmm. yes. So, so rook a d1 happened. And uh, a6. Mm -hmm. Well, I think first... They seem to completely ignore that the other one is uh, gaining a lot of space. And now they're both heavily undermining the, the opponent's yeah, position. But I really think that Swiddler is fine here. So BA6, Rook A6, FE4. Mm -hmm. Here. Okay. Actually, but it could fizzle out very quickly also. You think that they will just start taking... Well, if you exchange everything, well, let's say now knight takes E4 would be maybe the okay. most natural well, move. I think knight E4 is going to be the case. Takes it back. Yeah. And, um, well, probably you have to take on f7, or maybe... Well, you have to consider either you take on e4 or on f7. So let's well, see. After here, I guess you can take back with the bishop and defend well, the pawn Well, you have here. to, yes. Mm -hmm. And the pawn is defended, and, uh, well, oh, it's, it's actually a drawish position. It looks very drawish. Maybe yes. I was about to play bishop b2, but then rook b6 would be uh -huh. rather embarrassing. Okay, we have a tweet about uh, Swidler's openings <laughs> from William Penny. Looking at Swidler's uh, loss Grunfeld and Topalov's loss yesterday, can players become too dependent on their preparation? Well, that's what we debated a bit, that in this tournament, so far, good preparation has actually been rewarded by a loss, uh, strangely. But, well, there is some truth to it, of course, that then when you are well prepared, and then suddenly... There will actually come a, a playing phase at, uh, at, at a point and there is a lot of games where you see one player being better for, for one move and then things goes downhill from there. Actually, well, the first time I played with Vichy was the, was the World Championship in 2001 and I managed to out-prepare him in the opening and I think after 21 moves I was better, but after 22 moves I was lost. <laughs> and that sort of, well, that's maybe started our cooperation, but also very much defined uh, our <laughs> roles, I would say. Yes. Um, but there is something about that that, um, well, if you rely overly on preparation, you might even be uh, afraid to start playing chess. Mm -hmm. And um, but 
still, good preparation is great. And I think, for instance, today we are seeing Kramnik suffering because he's outprepared by Topalov. Mm -hmm. But, well, of course, he could win the game, but I, I sincerely doubt that to a certain extent. So yeah, today it's, uh, let's see, doesn't seem to be very likely at the moment. But I think, uh, well, still, most of the chess games are clearly decided at the latter stage. And uh, good preparation is extremely important. Mm -hmm. But what is more important is, uh, well, what you do next. Yeah, no, I think uh, once in Denmark we had a tra training session with the very sort of famous and good coach, uh, Mark Doretsky. And, well, he was letting us play out some, well, complicated but not impossible positions. And, well, it was amazing how many mistakes we made. And I think, well, part of his point was that, well, we tend to overvalue the opening phase while actually a lot of things are decided later. We have this idea that we actually might play perfect chess after the opening phase, which is not the truth at all no. uh, to some no. extent. And you can see, for instance, Magnus Carlsen, well, he's the best player in the world at the moment, the highest rated ever, and I think the best player ever, most likely. And he's not at all dominating in the opening phase. So it's actually a lot about uh, playing chess. Yeah, we have a tweet uh, about, yeah, is Svilla playing, uh, playing a tribe? tribute to his birthplace by his opening choice. Yeah, we've been mentioning that, yeah, <laughs> but it's also, I think it's a very uh, good opening. Well, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think he's me. partly paying tribute to that, but um, well, I think I will guarantee you this question is going to come up on the press conference, and uh, yes. I will guarantee you also that the answer is not going to be extremely short. No. <laughs> so I think we should should we save that for, for Switler for later. Yes, he, he will definitely uh, explain, but he's I think... Yeah, now he's he, doing he well. Took, but he actually mm -hmm. took back on e4 with the pawn. I think uh, it shows that he wants to, well, he wants to play on a bit here. That's my yeah. evaluation. And why not? Why not? Yes, actually, I, I really like his position. If anything, well, if you should sort of say someone has been the most aggressive player in the tournament, I think actually it's Wittler. He's really tried in all his mm -hmm. games. I mean, he tried very hard to beat Kramnik with white. Then with black against Aronian, he refused a draw. Yes. I, I mean, he said he regretted it, and I, I can fully understand why. But he actually has shown a lot of courage, and I think the same here. Mm -hmm. He's placed the Dutch, and here maybe he had a chance to sort of make things well, more simple. Well, 94 would have swapped things down exactly. in a more I mean, easy way. He actually seems to, that he really wants to give it a serious shot to mm -hmm. win this tournament. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, that's great. That's great, yes. Well, I think uh, also very often the problem in uh, Leningrad Dutch, or well, especially in, Len in Leningrad Dutch, that if white plays it very calmly and positionally, uh, black is simply left with uh, with quite some holes in his position, mm -hmm. and uh, just a slightly worse, uh, you know, middle game. Mm -hmm. But maybe actually it was just a nice speech by the two of us. That <laughs> <You> <laughs> he, so? he doesn't want to exchange on e4. So he could actually be the exactly the same position. But. Uh, uh, Yes and no, yes, yes, you're right, maybe it is. Yeah, I think, well, it's not... It is. Yeah, so, well, but, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well. <laughs> well, I think you can never go wrong praising Swiddler. No, that, that's, maybe that's a good concept to have. Mm -hmm. It's It still has a, quite a drawish look, so let's see, 94. I assume that he really has to he take this knight, right? He has to take on e4. And yes. now we assume bishop e4, yes. And then in this position... Could anyone be moderately better here? I don't really... Uh, well, right now, actually, white is a pawn up even, right? But, oh, you're right. But he has some... Well, white has a lot of pawn uh, sort of weaknesses. Let's say, if we take on f1, you take, of course, with the rook. I would really assume so, yes. yes. And here, uh, black has a very interesting um, b5 move. B5, I'm wondering wow. if... if, if Okay, Swidler must see it. B5. Must be his point. Well, it's just uh, just taking advantage that bishop on a3 is... Well, the queen is a little bit overextended here. Is something like, I would say, bishop d5 legal? Well, what about hmm, here? Maybe taking on d5 and taking on e2? As simple as that. Oh, you mean that d6, d6 is possible? doesn't bother you the slightest. No, sorry, I okay. will, I will, I will take that back. I'll just play. Bishop takes takes. What about bishop takes takes and bishop d4 check first? How's well, your king king there? I think it's in trouble. 
Maybe this is. Uh, maybe I'm yeah getting into some kind of trouble. Yeah. Well, maybe not massively, but at least. Okay, what is he doing? He's taking. Taking on e4. Yeah. And after bishop. Okay, now the question is. Uh, will. Can he take on f7 first? No, he can't. You can just take with the bishop yeah. and, and protect yeah, the knight right. on e4. Sorry? So I think bishop mm -hmm. e4 is completely forced yeah, in this that position. That he will do. And now, now the question is. Okay, rook f1, we are assuming this seedless point. But it's interesting if he's planning b5 or not. That I would almost think so. That's a bit interesting, I think. Uh, yeah. Well, again, I mean, in this position, b7, well, white is really hitting b7, so you have to do something not about that pawn anyway. Yeah, well, you're saying that it gets rid of a weakness, and why not use it for something productive, Active, actually? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think it's you're right. too much to say that black is better, but I think he's, he's just doing fine. Mm -hmm. And I think that the draw is probably the most likely result. Quite so. But, well, but Mamadiarov, things can always heat up uh, in a way. Yeah, and that's definitely... Well, it's not a dry position in, in, no. in any way. I, I think black, uh, white should be actually completely fine here, I would, I would think, mm -hmm. even, even after that. But let's see. But he's actually... It's interesting he's giving it a serious thought here. And There's I really only yeah. see one move not <laughs> yeah. dropping. Well, he's probably okay, just okay. rechecking what happens next. Yes, yeah, so he has plenty of time, so mm -hmm. there's no, no problem whatsoever there. <laughs> yeah. Should we give Switler a minute to see if he takes and plays b5? Or mm -hmm. should we switch to, well, Kayaken is in the picture behind us. Maybe we should switch to, to, to that uh, briefly, and then after that maybe have a short yeah. break. So mm -hmm. let's just see how Kayakin and uh, um, Anand is doing. Yeah, I think that uh, didn't uh, Vichy... He played king f3 and Kayakin chose putting the rook on g6 uh -huh. and now Vichy has just played the, the quiet move mm -hmm. a3. Yeah. I think actually that's exactly what you suggested, right? Well, not in this exact position, but something but similar, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do we still think Vichy has some an unpleasant advantage here or is it just extremely dry? Maybe not a lot is going on here. Well, it still looks to me that the knight on c3 is a bit, a sort bit, of <laughs> a, bit a bit misplaced. Yes, yeah. you could say. Well, king e7. I don't know exactly what the the point of that move is. Oh, let's say c yeah. c5, but that's a bit sort of on the knight circuit. So something like king e7. You just gotta put the rook on h8 and say that actually you are putting a bit more pressure. Maybe it is moderately pleasant for white, and when the knight starts going away, we will play king e3 and f4, and actually yeah. the black king is a bit in trouble. Yeah. Maybe white is still slightly better here. I think from mm -hmm. a practical perspective, it looks easier to be okay. white to me, but uh, oh, let's see. We okay, have a move. here comes knight a4. Mm -hmm. Knight a4. Okay, he, well, uh, you can see that Karyakin, he also didn't like having the knight on c3. I'm a bit surprised in the sense that this allows the king to go to e4 straight yeah, away. Yeah, that's, well, that's, it's very tempting. I mean, that's I, basically I why he played to f3. And then after knight c5, check, I would go to f5. And yes. of course I would be scared of being mated, but, yeah, but you I really don't have see which, which, no. which piece is going to do it. No. And I would think that something like f4 takes and then a bishop shuffle mm -hmm. becomes interesting. Uh, yeah, somehow knight e4... Maybe let's use this as a cliffhanger and then go go go, <laughs> go for a break. <laughs> oh, oh, there is a tweet. No, we though. have a tweet. Yes, uh, it's a question f to you, Peter. Would the players change their tactics, being aggressive for a draw midway, according to the games on other boards? Uh -huh. mm, not in round six, I think. No. But if you remember back to round fourteen of the candidates tournament, I'm sure that Kramnik was having a look at uh, Carlson's game and vice versa because they were actually playing. Well, of course, they were playing directly an, a different opponent, but Kramnik needed half a point more than uh, Carlsen. So yes. it very much depends. But I think in round six, not really. I, I mean, maybe Aronian will see that Kramnik is in, in trouble. But, but he's that gonna, will he's, only he's uh, play for double a, his a, a energy, yeah, basically. Yeah, I think, uh, no. I, I think uh, not, not so early on in the tournament. They, mm -hmm. Well, they might be interested in the opponent's games, but uh, I think... Well, less than half a tournament has been played. Mm. Eight rounds left out of this one. They're just going to try to make as many points as possible. That's, that sounds right.
Okay, well, we will leave you briefly and we'll be back uh, soon. See you then. land of chess, but until Vishwanath and Anand came along, the country couldn't brag about having any extraordinary players. According to Indian tradition, his name can be translated to Anand, the son of Vishwanathan. Confusion with the name started when he first came to Europe. Many thought that Vishwanathan was his first name and that Anand was his surname. Later Vishwanathan was shortened to Vishi. He learned to play chess when he was six, and by the time he was 14, Vishi was already champion of India. At 15, he was an international master and at 17, a world junior champion. From a young age, Anand played with great strength and speed. Incredible intuition is the strongest part of his universal talent. At the beginning of the 90s, Vishi was among the best players in the world and in 1995, he earned the right to play a world championship match with Garry Kasparov. Anand lost the match but in 2000 was victorious at the FIDE World Championship held by a knockout system. It was his first championship title. In 2007, Vichy's dream finally came true. Anand won a two-lap round-robin tournament in Mexico and became the new world champion. He defended his title in 2008 with a confident win over Vladimir Kramnik. Vichy Anand is the only chess player in the world who has won world championships in three different formats. Veselin Topolov's attempt to wrest the title from the Indian Grandmaster in 2010 was unsuccessful. And two years later, the champion retained his crown in a hard struggle against Boris Gelfand. Anand held the title for six years until November 2013, when, in his native Chennai, he finally succumbed to the leader of modern chess, Magnus Carlsen. A player with universal skills and a stunning defender, Vishi Anand remains a serious threat to any opponent, in any competition, in any format. Dmitry Andrekin was born in 1990, a vintage year for chess talent. His contemporaries were very strong. Magnus Carlsen, Sergei Karyakin, Ian Napomniche, Ilda Karulin, Ivan Popov. Nevertheless, Dmitry excelled in this company of stars, more than that, he became one of the leaders of his generation. His junior career peaked when he became world under-20 champion in 2010. In 2012, Dmitry was virtually unbeatable. He was victorious in the higher league of the Russian championship and later in the superfinal, where on a tiebreak he was ahead of Sergei Karyakin and Peter Svidler. In the same year, he won the match of the champions against Ian Nepomniche and took several first places in rapid events. Throughout the summer of 2013, Andrekin tested himself in super tournaments. He progressed through the Tal Memorial with flying colors, was the best among the Russians, and shared third place. However, in Dortmund, he could not avoid zeros. Nevertheless, Andrekin was gearing up for the most significant success of his career, qualification for the World Cup final. In Tromso, in Norway, Dmitri knocked out Drev, Karyakin, Svidler, and Tomaszewski, although Kramnik got the upper hand on him in the ultimate match. Quick, precise calculation of complicated plays, sober evaluation, competent tournament strategy, and psychological stability are qualities that will help Andrekin aspire to the highest achievements. Shahriya Mamedyarov was born on the 12th of April 1985 in Samgayit. He was taught to play chess by his father in 1993. In the same year, he started to attend lessons in a chess school. The young player enjoyed repeated successes in youth tournaments and became the only player in the world to become under-20 world champion twice. This is not the only record that distinguishes the Mama Diaro family. Shahriya's elder sister, Zainab, and his younger sister, Turkan, 
also hold Grandmaster titles. During the last few years, Shahriya has seriously worked on his chess style and become a more universal and skillful player. Attack is still his strong point, but he has improved his opening play and become more technical. Shahriya managed to scale a whole new level of play, and 2013 was an especially successful year for him. In June, he won the Rapid World Championship and shortly after consolidated his success by winning the prestigious Rapid event in Geneva. Being one of the winners of the tournament in London and victorious at the stage in Beijing, Mamad Yarov took overall second place in the FIDE Grand Prix 2012 to 2013. Shahriya has definitely proved to his opponents and fans that he is ready to conquer the highest peaks in the game. Levin Oronian started to play chess when he was nine, and already by the age of 12, he was a world junior champion. He achieved numerous victories in junior tournaments, and the most significant was success at the Goa 2002 tournament, when Levon became world under-20 champion. By this time, his family had moved from Armenia to Germany, and to this day, Aronian shares his time between these two countries. The title of chess prince gave the grandmaster confidence in his career and convinced him in the choice of his profession. By the mid-2000s, Aronian had begun harvesting his first big successes in the international arena. The first phase of this part of his career culminated with a win at the World Cup in Kanti Mansisk in 2005. The Armenian Grandmaster then earned the opportunity to take part in the candidate cycle. He was soon among the chess elite. His track record boasts first places in the strongest tournaments of our time, Week Anze, Linares, the Tal Memorial and Bilbao. In 2009, Levin presaged his greatness by winning the FIDE Grand Prix series. He is a great team player. For many years, he has led the Armenian national team and has presided over three team victories at chess Olympiads and once at the World Team Championships. Aronian is a past master of the rapid game and has scored repeated victories in Monaco and Mainz. As of the 1st of March 2014, Aronian's rating climbed to a personal record of 2,830. For many years, this grandmaster has held the number two spot in the world rankings and world champion Magnus Carlsen names Levin his biggest threat. Hi, we are back after a short break and well, it seems that our games are heating up. Uh, what do you think about Kramnik, uh, Kramnik's position against Topalov? Well, Kramnik was in huge trouble the last time we left him, and his position has definitely not improved. But he is still hanging in there to a, s a bit of an extent. But let's see. Okay, we'll get our analysis board very soon. Kramnik has to... Well, this is the position we have at the board right now. Mm -hmm. um, I think Kramnik has played king h8, and then queen takes c6, and now Kramnik is thinking pretty hard in this position. I think he's, is he even two pawns down right now? At the moment, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Kramnik had a rather bad, almost awful position, one can say. And it's not like things has gotten better for him at all. But maybe he still has some kind of practical tran chances. Well, if you look at the board, um, uh, the bottom board, Kramnik played queen c8, take on c5, knight takes c6, and now Topalov played the tactical, well, small combination, knight takes d5. And takes, takes, king h8, queen takes c6, queen takes c6, bishop takes c6 is the position. And now Kramnik has played rook a to c8. Well, he's going to get a pawn back. I think the best move would, well, he's also fighting to take on f1. So bishop b5 will happen. And takes, takes, bishop takes c5. Of course, this is, uh, well, uh, far from ideal mm -hmm. position for Kramnik to have. But there is actually at least some moderate hope, I would say. Well, still, the bishop on h2 is out of the play. And, well, he's trying to swap down on, let's say, both flanks. And, well, if he's a bit lucky, he can get a, an ending with three against two on the king side. With some yeah, but that would be fantastic, of course, for him. <laughs> Could still be very bad. And uh, 
I don't know, in this position, should you take on f4, should you take on a5, and maybe even a move like rook f to b1 uh, is a move. It's clear that Kramnik is in huge trouble on the board. He has only, well, almost 28 minutes for mm -hmm. 16 moves. And he's quite nervous. But still, well, for sure. Mm -hmm. and well, he's, well, he has every reason to. I mean, just a look at the board should be enough. Even <laughs> so, there is definite practical chances here. This game is in no way decided, but of course... It's a great position for, for Topalov. Yeah. yeah. Actually, our cameraman switched now to Aronian Andraikin. And uh, Andraikin did find the resource taking on a3 and queen c4. He's down to 23 minutes. And he has a, I think, well, slightly worse, but kind of defensible position. But it's a position. cool defense by Andraikin, yes, I think. Yes. So he's, he's really in a tough spot. He's playing uh, Aronian, who is, well, <laughs> very, very dangerous, of course. And... Uh, well, he's just he just takes a pawn on e2, which we were well, you were really afraid to take it, even yeah. in the analysis basically. But he I just was also uh, afraid did not to take it to some extent. Yeah. But um, no, I, I think I'm quite impressed by the way he's doing it. Um, he I doesn't seem to be afraid of anyone at still least. Still, despite that, we sort of praise how Kramnik is trying to defend and how Andrekin is trying to defend. The most likely scenario is that Topalov is going to win. Aronin is going to win, and uh, Kramnik is going to be a point behind the, the leader suddenly, mm -hmm. which is quite dramatic uh, that in, be, in a way. Well, yeah. that would be, of course, uh, quite, a, quite a change. Uh, but let's see here once again. Well, he uh, could actually now, it could be one and a half point uh, behind, because Anand has a, a pleasant position right now, I would say. Mm -hmm. But you, you had some point in, in this position, uh, or not really, no. No, I'm just wondering if uh, if the only um, possibility for White is to play Bishop B5, well, or if he could maybe also Bishop D7 here. something like that. It's of course it 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 looks uh, less um, well, less logical, you could say. Yeah, you could even mm. consider. It's probably not what he's going to do. Just playing something like this, and well, you can take back on on C8, and there's even the strange move. Bishop takes G2 in this position. Mm -hmm. Again, with bishop d7, I still think white is keeping a pleasant edge. I mean, yeah. Topalov definitely has very good options here. I think he's looking for, well, which one is the best of them. Mm -hmm. And for Kramnik sure. understands, of course, there is no way this game is going to be a draw in, in a couple of moves. He has to defend for a long time. He just played bishop b5. He played bishop b5. And, well, that's very, very logical. And I think mm -hmm. now, well, Kramnik is going to take on b5 and he's going to take on c5. I do like the way Kramnik is doing it. At least he's keeping it to something that there is some... It's getting simpler to play, at least, for him. Yeah, that's right. So what you are saying, if, let's say, well, if I play it very straightforward, just take on a four with the bishop, mm -hmm. let's say. Or, well, well it doesn't take matter. Mm -hmm. Take once again mm -hmm. and uh, take on a5. Yeah. You're saying that this you will defend? No, I'm saying I'll, I'm going to try. <laughs> <laughs> and we're not talking <coughs> about what I would defend. No, but no. But still something like, I would say, rook b4. I'm trying to eye this pawn. And I also want to put my rook here and eye this pawn. There is technical difficulties, at least. And, I mean, I think it's somewhere in between lost or clearly worse, but drawable. And that's simply as good as it gets for Kramnik right now. Well, he's gone for exactly this. I think Kramnik thinks that, well, this is a, a terrible position, but... At least it's reasonably easy to play for me. And um, I mean, I can see things ending up with me just drawing this. While the other thing, I had a bad position mm -hmm. with hardly any practical chances. At least here it's very straightforward and material is quite limited. But of course, um, Topalov is sort of one or two pawns up, depending a bit on what happens, and uh, has a, well, a fantastic result out of the opening. But it's not over yet. No, no, I agree with you that, uh, well, this. And the game is a new phase of the game, and uh, n not an easy one for, for the stronger side either. Um, no, not I think at all. also the dynamic has changed in the sort of earlier Topala would be happy of just putting some pressure. Now he wants to have a, a clearly winning position. Of course, right? yeah, yeah. And also, especially after yesterday, when he also... Well, he was better after the opening, yeah. not as much better as here. He's not going to lose this one. That, that is, that no, is no, that... Well, it would be certain. a tragedy, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's not, not going to happen. Uh, well, actually what I like here for him, and I think it's a very reasonable way to play, is just taking on f4 with a pawn. Well, in order, yeah, and now just taking on a5. 
If you move the knight, then my bishop will become alive. <coughs> and let's say I play this tactical resource, knight h3 check. Yeah, and I would take on h3, of course, and after rook takes. Well, I understand that my pawns on the, on the king's flank are spoiled, but I still have a yeah, you have strong the past pawn. pawn. It a bit depends if I will end up winning that or, or not. Well, if you do, then, <laughs> then things have gone wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. Mm -hmm. Again, I think it, it's close, and yeah, no, there is de a definite struggle going on. But of mm -hmm. course, it's balancing between being dead lost for Kramnik or just hanging in there. So, well, Tobolov should really take his time here. He has, uh, well, he has an hour left for thirteen moves, and he has a fantastic position. Yeah, it's hard to or oh, sixteen moves, but uh, but even so, should we switch to Vishyan and see? How, yeah. how, he, how yeah. he's doing. Let's do that, yeah. Because he's actually, well, he's our leader and he had a, a rather pro promising position. Mm -hmm. Well, after after Karyakin played knight a4, well, it seems that um, <coughs> actually this losing control of e4 square could become a problem for black as, as now he allows the king to come forward. So Vichy took his king mm -hmm. forward. King e4, knight c5. King f5, knight e6, he gave a check, and king d7 has happened. Yeah, that's true. <coughs> well, he couldn't have hoped for more in terms of um, activating his king. There is not that much <laughs> further to go to. So, in that sense, uh, this part of the, but what's of the next, plan is... Actually? Now, well, there is a threat of knight d4 check repeating, right? Well, he can... I mean, this threat he can get rid of by even playing C3, uh, C3 for saying. instance, mm -hmm. yes, I think well, how so. How is Vichy going to proceed in this position? Yeah. It, uh, it looks very close to Kayakin actually having basically, basically a fortress. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's say C3. Mm -hmm. That looks very logical. Well, you're saying that knight G7 checking E4, knight E6, you can just play. Well, I didn't see that, actually. Um, so you're saying I prevented one check, but not the other. <laughs> that, yes. That's the point. Let's see if knight g7 check, king e4, and knight e6. Mm -hmm. What is, is there something constructive that white can Maybe do? there's absolutely nothing <coughs> white can do in this uh, situation. Yeah, that The rook on g6 is uh, placed a bit, bit badly. Maybe you should play f3 and at least consider if you can start sort of putting the bishop to e3 and then, then start considering mm -hmm. your options. I like that, yes. Uh, it would be nice. Well, actually, it doesn't really make a difference if the queen is, uh, if the king is on e4 or on f5. It's still very no, active. No, no, it has the potential of going yeah. there, which could be threatening enough. That's true. f3 is a nice move. It's true. Well, the, the, the worst piece on, on white's board is the bishop on g3. He should do something about it if he wants to put more pressure. I mean, the rook on h8 is just, well, it is as active as it yeah. will ever be, basically. And so is the king. No, I think you can argue that the king on d7 and knight on e6 is ideally placed. Mm -hmm. And you can say the rook on h8 and the king on f5 is ideally placed. Mm -hmm. So it's the rook on g6 that is, well, maybe it's a very good defensive piece. And you can say the bishop on g3 also had... I think the bishop on g3, it's very hard to say anything positive on. <laughs> Putting true. it on e3 would just be a better square. Well, actually, you can say that with the bishop on e3, rook h5 is about to be a threat, except that it blunders to knight g7 check, actually. Yeah. Well, we really expect c3 should mm. be played here. What else, I would almost say? Well, what sort of what bothers me from the white's perspective is, let's say, after c3 here, if... Um, well, if Karyakin simply plays b6 followed with a5 and c5. So let's say b6, f3. Uh -huh. And well, c5. Bishop f2. And a5. Okay. I'm definitely not a Berlin player, so I'm just uh, thinking aloud. Mm -hmm. But well, and now knight g7 check. Okay. And uh, knight and e6. You go back. Mm -hmm. And your point is there's absolutely nothing I can do here. Well, I am really not sure if there's anything you can do here, yes? No. Your idea could be just, well, to play f4 at some point. But f4 is but f4 not, loses doing g4, any, yes. not doing any good. Maybe it's just a complete draw, actually. 
And uh, yeah, if you can just sort of, well, it's, a, it's some sort of an impassable wall that, mm-hmm. that you are building mm-hmm. here as black. Maybe and the computer, uh, it might like it, but yeah, it but the actually computer, doesn't matter at all. If there's one opening where computer evaluations are not extremely important, that's going to be the Berlin, I think. I, I, mm-hmm. I really think that the, well, the diagram we have below us, but maybe also the actual game positions, I think you are right. There is extremely little positive uh, to be done for, for, for white. And let's say something like C3B6. He can't do something like f4 because you will just take it. And if bishop f4, it's actually bad because of knight g7 check and you're going to lose the g4 pawn. So no, probably probably Vicious position is running out of steam, actually. I agree. No, it's, it's still quite impressive he manages to put pressure against Berlin, but it's, it's a very good opening. Yeah, we can debate how much pressure it was after all to a certain extent. Um, but no, I quite like the way he did it, but maybe it was not it's a nice defense by kayaking but maybe it wasn't so difficult after all but i think you are right it's extremely hard to do anything uh, aggressive in this position yeah well I, I would it would be Michi nice to 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 be on time let's say to play a4 and a5 a5 for instance but that never is going that's never going to happen i guess I'm not even sure that's going to be so decisive. No, no, but I mean, well, at least you can, of course, consider Rook A8 now to create some kind of uh, weakness. Let's see. He played C3. Okay, C3. Mm-hmm. I and actually don't think Kayakin's next move will will be very sort of important. But yeah, let, it seems see. that he can do things in uh, well in different ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I think basically. Yeah, well, he will give it some time, but uh, yeah, yeah. Also, there is. It really seems that he's managing to build. There is some zero sort of risk, but I think there is also extremely little upside in this position. Mm-hmm. Maybe he could be thinking that in this position it's actually a bit difficult for Kayakin to make a move. Could that? No, but there's always knight g7 back to e6. So, exactly. So that is not really, really the case. No, I. Th- I think this is just going to be too little for for mm-hmm. for white. And uh, once again, the Berlin would have stood the test. But actually, in the two first Berlin we had, with, they played four d three. And if anyone was better, it was black in both games. Actually, so yeah. at least it's progress. I mean, white has been completely safe and he's putting some pressure. So mm-hmm. that is by far the best result against the Berlin. But it probably also answers the question from I think the tweet we had a couple of days yes. earlier. Why not? Why, why, why d four? Why one d four? And I think. Uh-huh. Well, it's the Berlin. Yeah, definitely, yes. Now we should probably switch to Aronian's game, as, um, as quite some things have happened there. We left you in this mm-hmm. position after bishop a3, I think. Well, remember, it was b3, taken b3, rook b3, and, and Reikin took this... Well, it, to me it looked a bit poisoned, but you thought it was just... A, well, it's a pawn. Yeah. And he took it, <laughs> and it seems quite nice. Aronian played bishop a3, there was an exchange, and queen to c4. And we were debating, is queen c4, knight c4, rook, I'm oh, sorry. Defensive Something like this, not. is that mm-hmm. better for white? I think we still think white is slightly better there. Mm-hmm. But Aronian, he's playing it very practical, so he, he seems to want more than that. He played the move queen b1, and then followed king to e7. Rook takes a7, and queen to d4. But actually say whatever you want, but I really like the way Andreikin is playing this game. I think that, well, he is already low on time. Well, I will surprise you and say that I agree. (laughs) That is indeed a surprise. (laughs) Yeah. Um, No, I like it the same. The queen on d4 is strong, and, Mm -hmm. well... White has a rook and a pawn for, for two knights. The black king is maybe a bit in trouble, but it's not so bad. No, no, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the best thing for white is still to exchange queens. And then, well, that means that black is not in so much trouble. Not overly. Uh, what about a move like rook b7, maybe? But 
You will just put the knight to, to d5, I guess. Hmm. Knight d5 is one option. Knight d4 is another option. Hmm. I mean, But just something like this also? and yeah. the rook coming to c8. Of course, there is a white ape pawn, but mm -hmm. okay, is that really going to be, be so strong? Oh, by the way, you can see that Vichy is looking quite attentively at the Ronin's game right now. I don't think it yeah. will make any difference in the way he plays his game. But I think also... But, but it's interesting, of course, to have a look at. Yeah, but I think it's actually mainly curiosity. Mm -hmm. It's not like he thinks that, well, it's more or less the same if I win or Ronin loses, for instance, something like this. I think that... I think Vichy, he knows that things will go up and down in this tournament. And, uh, well, Vichy has a lot of time and maybe a rather simplistic position. Yeah. I think, uh, well, despite having been in the chess world for so long, I still think he thinks chess is a fa fascinating game. And he's just, he's just very curious, basically. Um, yes. That's my impression that's, of Vichy. That's the good thing. So, well, we can see the computer evaluation. It's down to one digit. It's a, it's a flat zero, as we call it. Mm -hmm. Quite often that could indicate perpetual check, but in this position, definitely not. It's just indicating no. that it thinks it's it's completely equal. No. Well, uh, Andrekin has done it quite impressively, putting his queen on d4, where it is standing in the very center, but also <laughs> there's nothing that can hit it, which is a no. bit strange. It, it takes care of very many things. The knight on b6, sort of e5 pawn, and he only needs one more move to bring his rook over. But you are starting to sound like you actually think black is almost better here. No, I don't think so. I think I I don't think so. But I a, a few moves back, I thought that black is in trouble. Okay. <laughs> and yeah. I think that this uh, there is less of that at the moment. Mm -hmm. But then maybe I should take that point of view. I think that things are very much going in Drake's direction. I don't think he's s better actually, but I think he has a, a quite a comfortable position. I really. I know you suggested knight a4, but I do like knight bd5 mm -hmm. actually more. It's just just being sensual and um, yeah, that's uh, well. Also, that looks well, like uh, the most should, natural. Why move. should you be worse here? I would think that you have to go maybe rook e1 and queen b2 and starting to sort of play it safe and liquidating into a draw. But it's true, Aron, and he doesn't seem to. I mean, if you look at the picture, he doesn't seem to slide <laughs> slide no, this ball. No, right? I don't think that. He, well, I don't think he's even thinking about that. He could be worse here. No, I, I don't think so. But maybe I don't think he believes he's, he's uh, better either. But yeah. I think he's just playing chess and sort of thinks this is round. Uh, well, see, there is somebody who believes me. The computer up there thinks <laughs> black is slightly better. <laughs> so That's true. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's nice to. That's know. quite surprising. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somebody agrees with me, but let's see. Well, okay, clock times and everything. I don't think Andraiken is exactly the favorite right now. No, 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 no. I think he's defended very well. I like the way Andraiken is doing it in this tournament. Maybe not from a sort of optimization point of view, that, but he is, uh, he's just playing chess. He's not mm -hmm. trying to, to make draws or to sort of... Well, yesterday with... White with Vichy, it's true he played something solid, but I think he played something he thought was a playable position. And uh, he's not trying to just exchange. And Well, of course, he's had a couple of losses, but he seems to continue as uh, nothing sort of yeah. overly bad has happened. Yeah, and, yeah but uh, that's also what he mentioned in his press conference, that, no, it's, well, things are pretty much going the way he expected them to go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's so a bit sad, of course. But, uh, no, but I don't think yeah. so. I mean, he, well, I'm sure that he will do everything uh, he can to also win some games here if, if he's sure. given a chance and no one should think that he is um, mm -hmm. you know that uh, that he's given up on the tournament in any way mm -hmm. but he just played knight a4 okay not yeah. knight bd5 okay yeah. knight a4 <laughs> maybe it feels more natural in the way that it stops uh, the a pawn actually so so in that it's sense i understand yeah in that sense i understand yeah. his decision Okay, but it is a bit more loose than knight d5. I am well. It's maybe it's also going to c5, and yep. you can somehow put it into something very aggressive. But I am I'm quite surprised. Mm -hmm. that, that's uh, that I have to say. Well, it's the problem here is that now he allows rook b4, and this is something I don't like so much. No, I he, he had his queen on d4 so nicely placed. <laughs> that I think also with clock time and everything. I mean, for me, this is a, a seriously surprising decision. Mm -hmm. You're yeah. saying rook b4. I assume you're going to go to d6 with the queen. 
I would guess so, yes. But actually queen d6. Now white has something like d4 yeah. maybe even. Maybe actually knight e4 was not a good move at mm. all. But after rook b4, where else would you put your queen? Mm. You can take on d2. <laughs> no way he's going to take on d2. <laughs> that looks knight a4 that is a, a very surprising scary. decision mm -hmm. to me. And uh, somehow all the praise I gave Andrake and I'm about to take back if I could. Mm. This this is this is quite surprising. Uh, maybe I missed something after knight b d five in this position, but this just looks to me cozy. And you are defending yeah. quite well. You are defending the b four square. You are also having quite some squares in the center. Yeah, knight b d five uh, felt uh, more secure. This this I agree with. Did he think of something like queen b five or strong? Maybe maybe queen b five is a tactical resource. Uh, I simply missed. Yeah, but I guess but you can just play rook d8. Rook d8 is a possibility, yeah. yes. Okay, well, anyway, that, that's how, how the situation is now. He's played knight a4, and I guess... Well, I think it's promising for Aronian, but nothing, Again. <laughs> nothing is, is too decided, uh, yes. as, as of yet, <coughs> I, I would say. Should we switch to uh, Topal of Kronik once let's again? Let's have a look at that. <laughs> that, that sounds uh, like a good idea. Mm -hmm. So that's where we left you the last time. I think, yeah, bishop b5, we exchanged, and bishop c5. And Topolov chose just to take on a5 in this position. And after f 3 takes check, king h1, rook c2 has been played. And, well, the position has clarified to a certain extent. White has a clear extra pawn. It's a passed pawn that's quite dangerous and the bishop on h2 is, is supporting it but it's not extremely easy to push it forward but still it looks it does look very dangerous doesn't it yeah well i don't think there's anything wrong with topalov's decision at all not really and what about the very obvious move Rook well, B1. There is maybe something wrong with Kramnik's decision because now, now we get the computer evaluation Whoa, which says plus three. Three point three. Yeah, that's that's okay, well, is, that's uh, an indication that, that it's completely lost. Yeah, Actually, uh -huh, it's completely lost because of the last move, Rook C2. That was not a good move. Okay, you're saying here he could actually mm, have fought on yeah. to a yes something. Okay, Rook C2 is a terrible move. As uh -huh. after Rook B1, what happens here is that. The b8 square is um, well is controlled by by the bishop on h2, yeah. and he just he will simply go b6 mm -hmm. and followed by b7. I would say even so, this looks mm. like a tough tough position to defend. And rook c2 absolutely looks like a very human move, but uh, yeah. well, it's clear but something if like he's king, simply king not on time, just yes. what would the difference be after a move like rook b1 now? How how would you? put up some kind of defense. Maybe I would just play knight f4, block this bishop, and yeah. then, uh, well, uh, simply, well, the pawn it's, will not go through. It's still not great, through. great at all. But it's true that, yeah, well, I mean, it's very hard for us to ignore that we can see 3.33 3 up yes. there. It's basically giving away that um, Topolov is just completely winning. So, mm -hmm. quite a surprising turn of events. Well, let's a, see, he hasn't uh, played rook b1 yet. No, but very hard not hmm. to in some sense. Yes. Uh, it's hard for me to s to see which kind of... Um, well, rook b2 would, would happen next if you don't go rook b1. No, so this rook b2 won't happen because oh, of bishop e5 check. Actually, but, but, but <laughs> yeah, I was about to... S well, I would argue back that actually I, I could be saved by knight g3 takes f1 in that line. But, uh, oh, that's true, yes. Yeah. That's very brilliant, yes. Yeah, thank you. But um, no... Mm -hmm. it's so we are looking at this position uh, where Topalov can basically finish it off by playing rook b1 and uh, yeah, well, and simply going forward with a pawn. Mm -hmm. It's just, just as easy as that. And uh, well, the line would be, let's just have a look at this a little bit. Let's say rook b1 and uh, well, if I just play bishop f4, uh, right, uh, well, blocking this, this extremely mm -hmm. annoying bishop. Yes. You're going to go b6? Maybe not. No, I, I dislike going b6 because you have knight g3 
and then you will control b8. Okay. I would just exchange uh, the bishops so first, and then I would go b6. So that's takes, knight takes, and now b6. You're just going to ignore that g2 would fall. Actually, the game has just finished. Uh, Vichy has made a draw against Karyakin. Okay. Well, not not too surprising. Not we too we surprising. sort of expected that, and no. nothing nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, as as uh, well, it seemed that Karyakin managed to. But let's build quickly some sort go back to Mamadiar and Switler because most likely we will soon have a press conference. But this, as we said, this move b5. Remember, this has actually happened in this game, and after. Queen e3, bc4, bishop c5 has happened. I'll just and interrupt you. Okay. Uh, Topalov has just made a winning rook b1. Okay. And uh, it won't be a surprise if if uh, this uh, game will finish reasonably that soon. That could easily too. Well, Kramnik's at least he showed his point. He's playing rook to c8, and he's hoping that rook c1 check next is going to help, help him, him survive. Mm -hmm. Well, we have seen a computer evaluation indicating that's definitely not the case. Mm -hmm. But maybe there's some slight practical chances. But maybe I think bishop e5 check now. Yeah, and uh, Topalov will most likely find the, the, the way yeah, here. It is quite likely this is going mm -hmm. to be decided soon. For sure. We will go for a press conference any minute now. But as soon as, well, uh, some, some, some very exciting things <laughs> well, begin, we'll or maybe even we have a new result, we will be back and, and show you that. Mm. Yeah, see you soon. Sergei Karyakin was born in the bountiful 1990s. When he was five, his father showed him how the pieces move. Two months later, Karyakin visited the chess club of the Pioneer's Palace in his native Simferopol. Sergei's talent became evident early on, and to develop his extraordinary talent, he moved to Kramatorsk to study at a famous chess school known for nurturing stars. In 2002, Ruslan Ponomaryev included Karyakin in his team when preparing for the FIDE World Championship final match with Ivanchuk. This invaluable experience helped Karyakin become the youngest grandmaster in the world. He earned this lofty title at the tender age of 12. He was a typical wunderkind. Chess ruled his life from an early age, and he dedicated everything to his main goal of becoming world champion. In 2009, the young chess player changed his citizenship from Ukrainian to Russian. He firmly established himself in the Russian national team and since 2011 has confidently stayed in the world's top ten. Sergei regularly wins super tournaments. His biggest success so far was in May 2013 in Stavanger, where he headed the likes of Carlsen, Aronian and Anand. Karyakin is not only strong in classical chess, he is also in his element in rapid chess. He was rapid world champion in 2012 and won the World Cup in this discipline in 2010. Karyakin's hallmark is all-round strength. 
he is equally good in calm positional games as in wild tactical flights. <laughs> Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome for the first press conference, day six in uh, candidates in Hanty Mansisk. Уважаемые дамы и господа, добро пожаловать на первую пресс-конференцию после шестого тура турнира претендентов в Ханты-Мансийске. And we have a draw between uh, Vishwanathan Anand and Sergei Karyakin. Vishwanathan Anand and Sergei Karyakin сыграли в ничью. And uh, came my question to the players uh, about this opening choice. Today we had the first Berlin in this event, I think. Пожалуйста, расскажите о выборе дебюта. Впервые на этом турнире был разыгран Берлин. Okay, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't first Berlin in the tournament because, because uh, I think we we both played against uh, against uh, Andreikin with black. Ah, yeah, you're right. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, but he played D3. Yeah, first uh, game at Castle. <laughs> yes, first game with Castle. And okay, it is um, very important line which I played with both colors, but. At this moment, I mean, I remembered, of course, I analyzed this rook h1, and, and there are many moves for black, like knight d5, knight g6, c5, maybe some other moves, and I didn't remember what was the, the most precise way to, to equalize, because, because I think I, I found something, some way, but, but I wasn't sure uh, in the game, and yeah. Это был не первый Берлин на этом турнире. До этого мы оба играли его с Андрейкиным. Мы разыграли очень важный вариант в этом дебюте. А я играю его за оба цвета. Я анализировал этот вариант, но после ДИАЖ-1 здесь у черных много вариантов, но я, может быть, не вспомнил самый точный путь к уравнению. Ну, сыграл конь d5. Okay, the, the, the problem was that... That oh, okay, G5, G5 is of course I'm not sure about this move, but but my my idea was after C4 to play knight B4, but then I realized why White can play F4, takes Bishop H4, and this is very dangerous for Black. Maybe it's maybe Black is not losing immediately. Bishop F6, C5, and it is very dangerous. Я не очень уверен насчет хода G5. Моя идея после c4 была уйти конь b4, но вот в этой позиции у черных может быть уже опасно. Может быть, черные сразу не проигрывают после ответа d1. Здесь уже есть ход конь c6. Ага, хорошо. Окей, а это, может быть, есть другие ходы за черных? Может быть, есть другие ходы за черных? Ну, я имею в виду, может быть, рука Ч. Рука Ф. 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 Very important square on D1. Держу, ну, держу под контролем очень важное поле D1. And also some lines is going knight E2 or knight E4, so yes. some. Uh, I mean, the same ideas in the game: knight E4, C5, rook G6, or knight E2, rook G6, and then knight D4. Well, some similar ideas. 
I mean, here the problem with so now I'm trying to dominate his knight a little bit. Maybe instead of uh, king f3, in the same idea with rook h8, rook f8, I mean, is it working here or not? I think he just repeats. Mm -hmm. So rook g6, <clears throat> and already, I, I mean, I understand his idea, but in order to, first of all, I don't see how I can stop it, because all he has to do is to play b6 and then carry out the same idea. And um, then I was hoping that this setup would give me something. But basically, when we got to this position, I realized that um, I need my rook on h8 all the time, because it's killing his rook. Mm -hmm. But with my rook on h8, there's no way to play f4, because g4 is dropping, or something or the other is happening. Я в этой позиции понял, что моя ладья должна стоять на h8, чтобы ограничивать ладью черных. Но при этом у белых нет хода f4, поскольку потеряется пешка g4. So maybe already as he, we're getting to the setup, I understood that um, there isn't much to do, and I simply didn't see any way forward. Здесь я уже в предыдущей позиции понимал, что многого не смогу достигнуть. I mean, I can play rook h5, and then and then let's say king f5. But even that, he doesn't. He will just check and go back to e6. Yeah. He will not take the exchange. So I didn't see any way forward. And Sergey, did you see something better for white also? Sergey, oh, did you see something better for white also? I didn't see. I, I mean, I, I was searching for some ideas like. To play bishop d2, then f4, and, and uh, after black takes to play king f3, but, but, but this is slow and black has defense somehow. Okay, uh, do we have questions? В разыгрывах с Берлинским кеншем при Пасаме сказали, что такой вариант, что в лучшем случае вы бы вспомнили, как уравнять и сделали бы ничью. А, не... это, это означает, что перед партией совсем не было мысли вот, сыграть как-то более богато, чтобы и третий результат в партии был хотя бы теоретически возможен. Mm -hmm. Сергей, we have now the Berlin end game, and you told that you had maybe only you, uh, that you were playing for two results, that you were trying to uh, protect yourself, and the draw was maybe the most possible way. So, didn't you want to play more aggressively to fight for three results? Okay, if you if you analyze last match, uh, Visha against Magnus. Then you see that Magnus played Berlin with with success. So I mean, if I would have some chances, if Vishu would try hard to play and win, of course I would try my chance. But uh, I mean, if White plays a safe line, I mean, I mean of course there is nothing much to do. Mm -hmm. Если посмотреть, проанализировать матч Вишвантана Ананда с Магнусом Карлосом, то можно э, заметить, что Карлосон весьма успешно играл там в Берлин и выигрывал. Если бы Виши начал бы играть чересчур активно, то у меня появились бы шансы выиграть, ну, играть на победу. Но когда белые играют спокойно, то и таких возможностей нет. We are back and we are closely following uh, the topalov Kramnik game. Uh, Topalov had some exact moves to make after, after Kramnik's rook c2, which was uh, a, a very serious mistake. And so far he's managing it very well. He's played, he's played exactly as he should play in order to win. And um, yeah. just a couple more moves and this game could be finished, actually. It could be, but... Well, I understand rook c2 is a mistake, 
based on the computer. But I think Crowning's position was very difficult. And Rook B1, Rook FC8. Well, Crowning is trying to create some kind of counterplay. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, and yeah, well, that's probably not going to work. But let's see. Rook A A1. And he played Bishop B6 blocking the pawn. Mm -hmm. And now Topalov has given a check. King to D8. And played Rook A6. And the last move was Bishop E3. And is this pawn just going to... Well, I think Queen. that b6 is, uh, yeah, is, is, is the obvious thing yeah. here. B6. And the, yeah, this maybe concept is, is, is not so, so say, takes, easy to see. Takes King, King h2. h2 and now rook b1. Well, all this looks very logical. But now white has knight g5, I think. Knight g5? Yes, and the idea is to play for, for mate. <laughs> okay. Quite unexpectedly. Okay. Who is mating here? Let's say check. King h3. Another check. And well, why not just play g3? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll have to run away with king f8 now. You you are still not completely there, right? No, I think um, yeah. Actually, after king f8. No. Yeah. It is well. It's close to over. It's extremely but, close. But I w I would say that. Well, if you look at this position, I do somehow like that, well, Kramnik has this uh, sort of concept. From a human perspective, it looks close. Yeah. Well, also, what would you think after d4? I think that could easily win a piece. But, okay, there is a bishop f4 check. But even something like taking here, is this completely hopeless? Maybe you will mm -hmm. give a check <coughs> and then take the piece on h5. It's probably winning. I, yeah. think, I think you're right. I think so. It is, uh, well, it is. But I still think Kramnik is, is uh, he is fighting a bit, sort of. It's not well, like I sure. think he's missing anything in particular. No, he's doing everything uh, that uh, right now <laughs> depends yeah. on him. But, but uh, well, the problem is that there's not that much he can do. No, no, he has a lost position, mm -hmm. uh, very likely. So, well, b6 is really what uh, well, Topalov is considering right now. Could he even think about... I know it's very ambitious, but let's say you don't want to exchange rooks. Can you put the rook on b3? And saying, well, the rook is safe on b3, my king can go to h2, and I'm just going to queen the pawn. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to fight that at all, actually? Is Probably even that is possible. It looks like hmm. it will just basically queen the, the pawn. Yeah, rook b3 is also good. I mean, you give a check, I'm going to go up with the king. Oh, he, well, he, he, just play, he played just B6, played B6. So he's not afraid of this, this exchange of rooks. No. And rightly so. Kramnik has given a check and that he's taking back, I will guarantee. Mm -hmm. And king, king h2. two. And I would really think rook b1 in this position. Well, there's really nothing else. Unless he wants to just give away the bishop for the pawn. Well, but that he can do a little bit later. You said To me, somehow g4 looks like a more human move mm. just taking a piece yeah we'll see that's true probably well uh, g4 he will have to play <laughs> sooner or later maybe after knight g5 king f8 g4 is still yeah. the move um, there is no well let's mm. take it in this uh, oops sorry i dropped the pawn <laughs> well dropped not meaning so let's say bishop f4 check and if you take this is this trivially winning? I would really think so. You simply bring your knight over, I think. Well, I would say so do I. I'm half fed of knight d5, winning back the pawn. Well, uh, knight e5, for instance. Knight e5. And if I do knight d5, you well, are if you, a, a I can play rook a8 and rook a7 and uh -huh. b7. And when I go. Yeah, and if king f6, there is knight d7 and b7, mm -hmm. and, and somehow you're getting the... Okay, it's actually... Is Tupalov? No, he's not thinking in this position. He's thinking in, in this position after rook b1. Yeah, that's true. Well, this is where he has to make up his mind whether he plays g4 immediately or, you know, plays knight g5. But... Um, I think what he's considering right now are the... Well, is the end game after g4, rook b6. Mm -hmm. That so, must be... So you are saying g4, rook takes b6. 
And would you think something like this is just trivially winning, taking on H5? Well... I mean, some of us would be a bit afraid question. of knight and bishop against king. But <laughs> well, I'm sure that Topalov is not afraid of that. <laughs> no, no. But, uh, uh, yeah, I think this is trivially winning. Probably you're right. You you will take the I'll knight, just take, take the h-pawn. Exactly, and I'll just take the h-pawn. And, well, you can see that as soon as my knight comes to f6 with a check, I will probably have... Probably, uh, probably this is <laughs> is just trivial. Yeah, we 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 don't sound uh, overly um, <laughs> convinced. So after g4, well, maybe there is the move knight f4. Actually, maybe this is Kramnik's point. Hmm. And now, well, rook a3. Well, then I go to d5. Okay. Now, now you managed to. Well, now unfortunately, to take it I had control. a glance at a computer line which says b7 wins. Rook b7, knight g5, and I'm threatening rook mm -hmm. a8, mate. That's and very And your nice. only move is this, and then I'm going to give a check and take the piece on f4. This is not trivial, though. No, this is not trivial. I agree with you, but this is very pretty tactic. We have a tweet from Baratia Race who's writing: "Vlad is not in his Vlad not in his seat with just 13 minutes." remaining at the clock. Uh, does it mean that he has given up? Not at all. No. He just has, well, it's the kind of position where he will have to react with only moves. Uh, there is six, uh, he has six moves left and 13 yeah. minutes. It's not serious time pressure. No, no I think he's, uh, well, he's a bit nervous or, I mean, well, maybe he's actually past the state of nervous because he's lost. I what, think um, he's, he's uh, pretty convinced that he's lost at this stage. Yeah, I think but, you're right. Uh, but he's not going to give up uh, at no. all. He will, he's, he's he will really uh, sort of, if there is any kind of small practical problem to pose well, a Fotopalov, he will do I it. Think, uh, yes. It, this is, it's winning, but it's not uh, extremely easy. I think he is going to try the move knight f4 here. Mm -hmm. This looks very logical. Uh, G4, knight f4, you think. But isn't this the kind of uh, tactics that, uh, well, they will see in a flash? Maybe, but it's still, I mean, to play B7, it's not what you really would like to do. It is, after all, you are sort of a strong past pawn. I actually think that this is very easy for them. <laughs> okay, so you think that just, you really think, I think at least he would play knight G5 first. Yeah. And after king f8? Then he could go b7. Yes, that's Still, you think that's just trivial? I think so, yes. We're talking about the best players in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, such tactics, I think they see. Yeah. In well, a few I seconds. mean, okay, no, it's not even. <laughs> well, we said that Kramnik, he's not sitting at the board while the opponent is thinking. Actually, he's not even back here yet, yeah. in a way. But he, well, time is not his biggest problem. Not, in this not position. really. That's the, that's the position. Well, let's think about it. Could he really be thinking about rook takes b6 now? And um, that he can save this? I doubt well, it. Well, not there that is, he can save this. There is even this, a check on a8 as but well. But there is a check on a8 and he's a piece I, down. I, I really he's not going to play the this. I the move he's going to play is knight f4. At least force your opponent to play this uh, highly tactical moves. Mm. That would, in my well, opinion, that would make a lot of sense. Well, maybe bishop f4 check and, uh, well, just sort of just... Well, to let him... Yeah, we just discussed this as well, right? Yeah, just let him prove that he no, will that queen. <laughs> that, of course, also could make some, some yeah. sense. Yeah, I think you're right there. I think he's going to try one of these moves, and he's, mm -hmm. he's going to give it some thought. But, uh, well, by sort of correct play by both players, it's going to be a win for, for Topalov. And yeah. Uh, well, correct. Topalov is back to 50%, and so is Kramnik, actually, then. Yes, that's true. And, uh, well, Topalov has beaten his arch rival in, in some way. Yeah. And, and no, uh, that, that must, uh, well, it's gonna will have beaten. Well, it's going to inject a lot of energy to yeah, him. Yeah, for and, sure. Uh, well, tomorrow we're going to have a free day. Maybe that's good for Kramnik in the sense that actually yeah. he will have time to, to regroup. Uh, I, I think I, I so. Would say. so. We should probably switch now and have a look at Svidla's game. Uh, yeah, some, some, some strange things have been happening there. <laughs> Well, I think we left you in, in this situation and wondered uh, would Switler play the move b5? And uh, he did actually. He played b5. Mm -hmm. But it's not the end of the world at all for uh, Mahmoud Yarov. Actually, things has heated up considerably mm -hmm. here. Queen e3 happened. Bc4. Bishop to c5. And now, Queen to c8. And here, 
Mahmoud Yar played a rather amazing move, I would say. He played the move h4. He simply wanted to attack um, h4 is an amazing move. But if we think h4 is an amazing move, what about h6? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, okay. Well, the players, <laughs> they really keep on surprising. Bishop but d6, bishop isn't isn't d5. it just really bad for Swidler? Hmm. I have no clue. What about the move? What is, no. what is it that he has done to his position here? I don't know. Maybe he's completely it spoiled. It's terrible. I was just talking about how pleasant his position is and uh, that he has solved all of his problems. And he's put the queen on d7. Mm. But was h4 so powerful that Swidler had to give up? The pawn on g6. Now he's just lost. This basically. is amazing. Yeah. Why would he play h6 in this? Is is the threat of h5 so so terrible? Yeah, h5 was scary. Uh, no, h4. Well, this 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 uh, move that uh, Shahriar has come up with, h4, it's not a very uh, natural move in that position, no. and this was probably extremely strong um, and unpleasant for Svidler. But still, what Svidler did, he just Give Eight away six, a pawn. And bishop takes a d6. And, and uh, yeah, hmm. this is hard to explain. I still think it's too early to say that Swidler's position is lost. He does have some trumps. I mean, there is a past c pawn that will be a factor. And he's planning rook e6 next. Even so, I think something very hard has hit him in mm. that sense. Yes, the well, for a start, uh, instead of h5... Um <coughs> Uh, Shahriar has done has made h5 just before uh -huh. this, right? And uh, here, bishop f5 was we think winning. Bishop f5 was okay. Was just putting, um, yeah, was just and completely. Huh. Queen d8, but it doesn't look great at all. No, but no. even so, this position. Okay, after let's h5, see after h5. Yes. Queen d7 has been played. I still think that it looks. Well, very good for for Mahmoud Yarov. Maybe there is something like Rook B1 coming to B8, for instance. That well, uh, the computer is just showing that White is winning. Okay. Simply uh, that, and uh, well, if we just uh, sort of go back five moves, uh, no one could have predicted that kind of no. scenario. It's just <laughs> things have gone massively wrong for Svidler here, mm. and um, yeah, once again he has. This is Problems with black, but out of a really decent position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this, is, this is surprising. Hmm. Well, this could mean that s both S Switler and Mahmoud Yarov also will be to 50%. There's a lot of players going to, to 50%, actually, maybe. So. Okay, we uh, will switch now to Aronian's game, as we have uh, somehow <laughs> left that a bit. Mm -hmm. And that's also another of... Um, well, it has huge implication for yeah, the top standings. For sure. I think we left you after the move knight to a4, if, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's right. And, and then um, that was a move that... Rook c1, that rook d8 and h3 has happened. And I think we had a couple of more moves just recently. King has gone to f8 mm -hmm. and queen b3 has been played. Yeah, and still... Well, this is one game where uh, things haven't cleared up yet at all, actually. Um, it's still very, very unclear, but, well, knight on a4 is not well placed. <laughs> no, That's I would somehow think it's easier to play white in this position. I understand that maybe the computers are saying black is basically okay, but I think it's easier to be white here. Somehow Black has to, well, coordinate his pieces a bit more. His position is a bit more loose. Mm -hmm. It's easier to drop material quickly with Black than with White. I think he's sort of the short summer. Well, that's position. just a given. Yes, yes, and also, well, Andrekin has has uh, once again a problem with his time in this position. So yeah, he has less than a minute per <coughs> move now. He is under pressure, of course. Mm -hmm. But, well, the very logical thing would be for him just to try to bring back this knight, maybe just to play knight c5. But, of course... Yeah, <coughs> after knight c5, well, there could be a move like queen a3, exploiting the, the pin. Yeah. 
Oh, that this could also be Queen B6. Yeah, it looks, getting it looks, pinned like this, it looks scary. It looks very scary. Even if it's holding yeah. uh, objectively, probably he's not going to do that. Would be a strange that. decision mm -hmm. for him. Could he yeah. lash out and attack with knight e4? But that also has a scary look to it to some extent. Well, but maybe he's past the stage where he can <laughs> just yeah. do something that's not scary. But low on time and yeah. things are not... Uh, I would be very nervous on... Um, on Andraikin's behalf. And I think... 94 is interesting, of course. It is an interesting move. It's probably threatening to take on F2, well, what although he has it's still a bit loose. No, what he has to consider is, of course, if White just can take on E4 and play Rook B4. Yes, takes... What about that? Takes and Rook B4. I think on a very bad day we have Queen, Queen A8. A8. Mm -hmm. No, that's maybe Something there's nothing like wrong this. with this maybe move. Maybe this is okay. Yeah, but still, the knight on e4, and that's I have Bishop always going to be a, a problem. But yeah, hmm. uh, it's still, I'm puzzled why he put the knight on, on a4. He could have had some concrete reason, and then suddenly mm -hmm. things that didn't really didn't work, work out the way or something, he thought. Yes. That but could very well be. But also, he's taking his time, and um, that might not be fantastic. Yeah, that's... Hmm. No, it's not an easy spot for, for um, Andrekin to be in. And um, objectively speaking, it's not surprising if he loses this game. No, I, he's been under severe pressure right out of the opening. And I think he is in, in quite some trouble here. But, well, it could take a bit of, of time. Well, actually, Topalov Kramnik could be sort of closing in uh, to finish. So, should... Ah, hang on, there's a move coming here. He's played the move E4. E4, okay, that's... That's, That's an unexpected move. Well, it's <laughs> shutting down the bishop on t2. And Draken so is not really the kind of guy who will just, uh, you know, continue playing quietly. <laughs> okay, actually it was h3, king f8, hmm. queen b3, e4. This is the situation we have, yeah. as far as I can see. For some reason our live board is not updating. No, it is. And but e4 is... Oh, risky, risky, it is. Uh, I think so. I, it's much easier being white here, and you could also be there simply objectively speaking. You're much well, for white. a start, uh, what about rook c4 and just taking on a4? Maybe he has decided that here he will. You think he's gonna try and defend? No, that, like queen that I think is nothing actually. Mm. You think he will play c queen d5 here and after something like that? Rook a4, he is gonna. He will take on b3. Something like no, no, no. Rook b7 is hanging. He cannot do that, actually. Ah, he can take mm -hmm. an a4. Yeah, here. yeah. You that's that's a bad line. Sure. But he can get the same thing with rook takes d7, for instance. Are ah, you saying now to take on d7? Mm -hmm. That's a possibility. Yeah. I but think... This is not great for Andrake, and at least things has clarified a, a bit. And, and that's uh, what he's looking for. He's yeah, trying to clarify things a I bit. I think Aronian would ideally keep more pressure than... Uh, just doing it like this. I think he's still considerably better, but it's uh, it's very unpleasant for, mm -hmm. for Andrejkin. I think Aronian will take his time now, so we should switch back to uh, Topalov's game. Let's do that, yeah. And then we have uh, a couple of new moves. Yeah, we saw the move g4 here, and then, well, Kramnik chose to give a check with the bishop, bishop f4, and Topalov didn't even take it. He played king g2. Mm -hmm. After take takes, check. Topalov has played king f3. And this is probably and something that doesn't Kramnik change. Kramnik has put the knight on e6. Anything at all. And, well, for instance, it's b7 here winning immediately. Yeah, it seems so, among other things. Maybe yes. you can give a check on b3. Hmm. After b7. Rook b3 check, and if I just go somewhere like king f2. Yeah, most likely. Just further away that's from, more or less from checks. I think you're going to be a... Crowning is going to be a piece down. Mm -hmm. He's going to resign here, probably. Yeah. And if you do something like, let's say, knight f8? I would guess that you can just play rook a7, followed by knight c6, for instance. 
and that's going to be it. That's it. Uh, there's that's nothing, it. absolutely no. nothing that uh, no. Black can do. I think Kramnik understands this, this one is knows this one is that gone. this one He's is just, finished. Mm -hmm. Well, why not make a couple of uh, moves? But yeah. uh, this one, this one seems gone, and that is that is quite dramatic. Actually, then we will have. Topala back on 50% and mm -hmm. uh, Kramnik as well. Back on 50% and it's not unlikely we will also see Svidla back on 50% as well as after Mamadiyar. today's half. So before game. today we thought basically the field was cut into two halves. But yes. actually after today most likely we will see Vichy a situation in, 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 with maybe Vichy Aronian on plus yeah, two. And that's then true, Vichy and four Aronian. players mm -hmm. uh, trailing them by a full point. Mm -hmm. So that is quite a quite a development. Still a bit early to, to call but generally... It seems very much to be going in that direction. Still, what surprises me most is what happened to Svidla's position. That is very strange. That's just uh, uh, something that is yeah. uh, unbelievable. It's a very... Yeah, I don't get it either. I, I think he was under some pressure after age four, but what, what then happened... Well, I'm sure he's going to tell us why, but mm -hmm. uh, this is this is very strange. Ah, and the point is that if he plays... Well, I just saw uh, Topalov shaking his head as though he doesn't like something, although really uh, it seems that there's nothing not to like. If you place b7, knight d4, check, king e4 exists. So that just, You're saying that's just a piece. Here and king e4. Yeah. And the threat is rook a8 on... Or king takes d4. Mm -hmm. That should be more than sufficient. It's That's the end. It's kind of, it. of strange. He's but well. okay. So b7, rook b3, check. He will play king f2. There are no checks with the knight, and that's it. Yeah, I think so. And that's just it. You can't really stop. Well, check and queening. Apart from well, if you go knight d8, attacking the rook pawn, a8. rook a8 mm -hmm. is going to win the knight on 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 d8. Yeah. No, this one is completely over. It's. Uh, well, maybe so he's just taking his time, relaxing, making yeah. sure he doesn't uh, blunder anything. Yeah. Yeah. No, but, but still, it's, uh, huh. it is a bit surprising. Yeah. Aronian has played the move rook c4 that we discussed, but mm -hmm. we thought that it doesn't really change anything uh, massively in the position, I would say. No, rook c4 is, is the move to... to yeah, yeah, to, but it yeah. sort of... We thought that it was pleasant for Aronian, but... Um, well, it, the, the game is definitely no, not over in, 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 no, any, not in any way. Mm -hmm. But, uh, well, we wanted to see the f end of this game. But, yeah. well, it doesn't really seem like uh, Topalov well, is cooperating. Let's have a look a little bit if, if, if Topalov will just uh, make his move quickly or if he will take mm -hmm. take some more time. Yeah, no, that's that's a bit interesting. Mm -hmm. mm. It's well, he hard must to be see. Well, yeah. I'm sure that uh, there is also other good moves, but this just seems so straightforward. Of course, once you take one's time when you're actually well pushing forward your pawn that could be lost, but mm -hmm. it seems to be not the most complicated tactical line I've seen. So no, I I'm a bit puzzled there. He just made he it. just made b7, b7. and mm -hmm. I think now. Okay, now well, let's see, see if Kramnik is actually. More or less gonna resign, or he will he will try a a, a couple yeah. of of couple of, of of tries. Let's see. It's really but I, I really don't see a way to to find in this position. So knight d4 checking e4 yeah, will be free checking just, f2. Well, of course you can give a couple of checks. Yeah. I mean you can well rook b3 king f2. You can give another check and b2. But oh, well, and after knight f8 there is the only winning move, but it's enough. Yeah, uh, rook a7. I understand that you have C6. to make an only move, but uh, well, rook That's a seven here. Yeah, this is uh, this is not complicated. No, well, he could actually resign in this position, mm -hmm. but uh, let let's see. Yeah. Let's see. Mm. This. Yeah, that's well. That hasn't been a good game for Kramnik in no. in no way. Just um, no. he got into a, into a tough position. Well, somehow he got into some opening problems and yeah. then he didn't react uh, in an optimal way and even he reacted in a way that was well awesome. overly um, aggressive yeah. because this f5 f4 was yeah but i don't know if you can even call it aggressive we can also be seen as uh, well he was simply i mean very afraid of uh, somehow the white position but i think the the medicine was much sort of uh, tougher than the disease. Yes, uh, yes. It, it wasn't that uh, that dangerous a position, no. but it became. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, he's given a check on b3, and I think Topalov will move his his king. I don't know if Kramnik actually will try and make it past move 40, and then 
sit there, but it doesn't but, make uh, sense. It I doesn't think. really make sense. Well, now we should mention that King F2 is the only winning move. <laughs> Anything sure. else is, is, is not winning anymore. And no, that's but, but okay. This is but that's a very easy move. Yeah, there it comes. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. King F2 and Split King F2 and uh, well, the point is after Rook B2, the king is just going to uh, sort of carefully come closer. Yeah, and you will that's go. going to be the king E3 or e, king yeah, E1. one and then D2, C1 and, and that's it. And yeah. Well, maybe he will play knight F8, forcing Rook A7, but well, he gives a check. Okay, they have they have reached move 40 here. Should we have a look at the, the other games? Um, you don't think that it's going to be finished any second now? It's very hard to say. Uh, it, it could be. It could also... Drag out? Take a, uh, uh, sort of. You, you could be right. But, well, they actually have more than an hour each. In some sense. <laughs> That's but, uh, true. But I think well, you're right. That it's should they want to? You don't really want to look at this position for an hour. No. Uh, if you're no. Kramnik, and no. I think. So, no, let's see. Okay, let's just go to to Swidler's position, mm -hmm. I guess. As um, yeah, as that looked very very dangerous. Well, I think that Mahmoud Yarov should be close to winning in this position. Well, we have it up on the board now. There is some activity for for Black here, but still. Well, I think the last time you saw it, it was Queen D7, and um, well, then Mahmoud Yarov played Bishop D4 to exchange off the, the dark squared bishops mm -hmm. and then th that was followed up by ruby six and bishop f7 check has happened here hang on what is this <laughs> maybe swiddler will manage you think so yeah i think it's it definitely has become better so let's say queen f7 rook f7 and uh, rook e3 free. rook g7 check king to f8 yeah that's well that's a very uh, direct line that's okay. ja happening right now no and what? okay swiddle is in for another another opposite sort of colored bishop, opposite opposite colored bishop ending. i don't think he's going to take an e3 here there is of course a past a pawn but even so no no this he would uh, this he will manage to, to yeah this is quite surprising say, oh here momenjaro has has let it slip i guess what about aha uh -huh, rook takes e2 is also a threat i was thinking Something like rook g6, but I guess you're just going to take an e2. And, uh, yeah, yeah, and g3 are. will be hanging. Uh -huh. Maybe oh. there is the strange move king f2 in this position. King f2 would make sense, but what about rook, rook e7 and then rook e6, right? Hmm. Oh, rook so e7 and, well, I mean, if we think that uh, this endgame is a draw. You're thinking about rook e7 now. Yeah. And you're saying that you will simply rook... G6, you're gonna go rook e6 and rook g4, you're gonna go rook e4. Yeah, that would be my point. But okay. but of course for that, uh, I have to be sure that uh, the, yeah. the other end game is that, a draw. That is, and, <coughs> and that I'm not sure not about. Not necessarily a no. given at all, actually. That could be, well, both an past h and an a pawn. Mm -hmm. But maybe he's actually down to that in some, some way. This is, this is quite surprising. Mm -hmm. I really thought that after queen d7, white's position was just... Very winning, but the appearance is not so simple. He was a pawn up, and yeah. um, and uh, let's say he had some very effective move in rook d1 apparently, but this is mm -hmm. a computerish line. But um, well, the point is that mm -hmm. well, the, simply the bishop on g6 is so strong. Wow, rook g5, <laughs> rook g5. has just been okay, played. Okay, yeah, that is that is a move. <laughs> rook g5. That that wouldn't have been easily guessed. Well, is it good? I don't know. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Rook G5. No, okay, his point is that... Uh -huh, his well, point is uh, that he wants to get this endgame. But now he has a passed with H two pawn. Passed pawns, H and A. And, well, they can't be further away from each other. <laughs> no. <laughs> Which is uh, obviously a well, big plus for Someone him. was telling me there is a rule that says that if you have... Opposite colored bishop and things with two passed pawns. It, it's winning if you can sort of uh, not touch both pawns with your hands. And I think an A <laughs> pawn and an H pawn, it doesn't get further away from each other. So. No, no. But is it really winning? Okay, let's see. <laughs> I, I don't know exactly here. Well, but So let's say something like, well, let's just have a very primitive line A4. Mm -hmm. And... No, my question would be... Um, King is. Hmm. I 
would assume that it's winning in the sense that well the h6 pawn has to i would assume is going to be blocked by the <laughs> king and then the white king is just going to go to the to the queen side and i think eventually it's going to collapse for Swidler. but maybe he doesn't have any other choice after rook yeah g5. rook g5 is a very very concrete move yeah that basically that uh, that doesn't leave him a choice no no i would think so hmm. Hmm. Interesting moment. Swidler has he has nine minutes left, and he doesn't like it. He, I don't think he want to take a d5, but it's not like he's left with a huge choice. No, rook g5 forces him to go into that. You can't even. What are you thinking? You could know. On the first glance, it really looks like the end game is um, it's is just, bad. Yeah, it could be just lost simply for Swidler. Then rook g5, it's, it's quite a move from, from Mamed Yarov. Mm -hmm. There is simply no, no other move as far as I can see here. Yeah, oh. and oh. okay, a and h pawns. Mm -hmm. They are just, uh, well, uh, the point is that the king will have to block one of them, the bishop the other. And in the meantime, white's king will uh, well, just come closer, and, and that's going to be it. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I would assume something like this let's say c3 h6 king g8 and you will just well i would assume something like this bishop to c1 and basically the king is gonna enter like this or oh sorry okay. we are we are <coughs> this. okay yeah this uh, this game okay. the game and, between and topalov and kramnik has uh, finished re mm -hmm. so we will most likely soon go to a press conference. But let's just have a look at uh, Aronian, how, how he's, yep. how he's let's doing. Let's do that. And it seems like, well, they almost have the same position yeah. as, uh, as before. It seems so, yes. And Aronian is, is I think, considerably better here. Mm -hmm. <coughs> After rook d4. Okay. You rook think c4, he actually, sorry. Well, a few moves has happened. Rook c4. Queen d5. Queen ah, d4 okay. Queen check, d4 king check. g8 and yep. rook to d4. Mm -hmm. how, how are you defending at all here? Well, everything seems to be completely tied yeah. up. I mean, a move like queen c5, can you then just take an a4? That could be. Yeah, queen c5 you have to play now, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise you're just uh, losing everything. Okay, and Svidler has just resigned as well. Svidler has resigned. Well, yeah. That was uh, quick, but basically no, but it was the last ending. So yeah. we're actually going to have two press conferences in a row here. Mm -hmm. But we also have quite some action in the Aronian game. We will game. keep an eye for uh, well on Aronian game for mm -hmm. you. And uh, well, as soon as something is happening there, we will, we will come back. back. But uh, yeah, Swidler's game was, was, uh, was quite a surprise and how quickly yeah. it deteriorated for S Black. S yeah. Out of I, I think there was some huge blunder involved at some point. Yes, and, and, uh, must well, have been. Probably that will come up at the press conference. Mm -hmm. But well, we will stick around and keep a close eye on the Aronian and Draken game and we we could easily be switching a bit back and forth with with updates. I I, w I would assume, but uh, well, Kramnik Topala should also be a very interesting press conference. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I if if it's happening at all, I don't well, know, but I I probably it has, it has to. to. <laughs> yes, it has well, to. Things. Yeah. yeah, we we will switch to that. We will, so we will right now on the screen we can see the the only remaining um, mm -hmm. game today, and that could easily also end it in a in a. And in a decisive result. Very much so. And then it would be Aronian has would have caught up with Anand, and they would have a full point lead uh, to four players on on fifty percent actually. But mm -hmm. uh, still oh, a actually, bit early to wait say. a second. He just played Queen C six. Mm -hmm. uh, here, it's Bishop takes E four is very good. It seems like Bishop takes E four. It is seems possible. that uh, well, Andrekin is, is not anymore in Rook E four. Yeah, Rook takes D seven is possible. And yeah. uh, things could end extremely quickly. For instance, after the move rook f8, I think there is this line that, as far as I can see, it's is just made. made. Mm -hmm. So, well, actually, things could really be over now. And it seems that, well, we're going to get the tournament situation we spoke of. Aronian yes. and Anand, a point clear of Svitla, Kramnik, Topalov, Mamedyarov. Mm -hmm. 
Kayaking on minus one and riding on minus three, and this seems to be the situation before the free day. And well, uh, we we still have this game on going that on, is but true. but at this very point, um, it looks like after bishop e4, isn't it more or less hopeless for Mandrakin? Well, the point is that he's not managing to control all of his pieces no. anymore. I think the he's going the to lose something. Yeah, but then and that's going to be. I think it's it. just pretty gone for Andrakin actually. So. Mm -hmm. But I think it's been quite a good game from Aronian's side, uh, Yeah, he side, put, he put pressure in, yeah. in, in a very sort of um, mm -hmm. good way and uh, he's managed everything. Mm -hmm. Sure. No, that that he probably planned. Okay. okay. And uh, can you please show what happened today? In fact... I think, uh, well, I played this move, bishop c e5, which is objectively dubious, uh, and there should be several ways, but I thought it, uh, for one game, interesting, you know. So, okay, its position is really complicated and really deep. Mm -hmm. Maybe for him it was uh, today too deep. Uh, на самом деле мой ход слон Е5 объективно сомнительный. Я в одной партии его видел, поэтому сыграл. На одну партию. На одну партию, да. А эта позиция получилась очень сложная и глубокая. C6 и G6 are fine, but I think F5 is not so good. Я считаю, что ход F5 не очень хороший, а C6, G6 вполне хороший. Well, maybe black, especially in this position, I think it was I don't know Bishop H2. I thought it was because in other positions we were looking with my second this move that okay you can simply you know sacrifice sacrifice a pawn. So I thought it was maybe just a compensation. I don't know. My secundanti смотрели здесь. Примерно в такой позиции ход слон h2 и считают, что за пожертвованную пешку h4, что вполне ее можно пожертвовать и что с компенсацией у белых эта позиция будет. Ну, по-моему, уже после рокировки объективно Автокансел большой перевес за то, что вся идея, вся идея хода e5 как-то, по-моему, то ли b5, то ли ферзь a4 очень сильно. И, B5 or A4 is quite strong. No problem. We can continue in English. Ah, то есть я не знаю, как собираться. То ли B5, то ли ферзь A4, по-моему, как-то. I don't know what I was going to say. Слон A4 всегда B5 тоже. Я как-то уже прорываюсь. Поэтому, если бить пешку, то вообще надо было до хода B4 без включения B6, B4. If black takes H4, they should. And this looks at the very, I think, very bad position. Strategically, no, just if you look at the figures in the last round, one knight is on h5. I think it's a dangerous position. I don't know. Let's say here. I could have played just rook c1 here. No, this is also strategically won. No, this is also technically won. This endspiel must be technically won. Beat the second pawn, let's say, in this way. I didn't like this line because of the bishop before. But I think it's won anyway. No, I don't know. I don't know. Ну, я не знаю, как-то хотел по попроще. И здесь, может, мне казалось, коне в честь лучше. Как-то пытаться активизировать коня за то, что на, на слон d6, то коня d6. То есть мне казалось, что надо включить коня, а после ладья c2 это просто... Так только кажется, что это угроза, а на самом деле я уже надвигаю пешку и нет ничего нельзя поделать. Рук C2 just seems to be a threat. Да уже абсолютно безопасно. After Rook B8, Black has problems. This B pawn is so strong. Пешка была очень сильная. Even даже если остановить эту пешку немножко, все равно как-то проиграно должно быть. Ну, вообще, скажем, в этой позиции 
Идея в том, что, скажем, таких мотивов все время. То я собирался дать два пару шахов. I wanted to make и всегда как-то шах и, бес, и, и бесим. То есть это всегда... Ну, я думаю, после, после этого хода уже большой перевес. Да, но мне казалось, что B5 очень сильно. Очень быстро все получается. Mm -hmm. По-моему, uh, yeah. Hi, we are back for the last remaining game where um, Aronin had a very winning position, but he seems to have done it probably in a suboptimal way. He still well. will be winning. Uh, quite lucky what he is yeah. He played the move rook b takes b7, and, but he's sort of gotten an ending where he's a pawn off. Yeah, and uh, he will in all likelihood win this position. I think so. I think he has a, a passed pawn in the A-line and the bishop sort of is uh, going to support it. It looks like a, a technically winning position. There is mm -hmm. still some work to be done, but I think it's, it's quite... Uh, I mean, it should definitely be a winning position for... Well, in this position Aronian, that we have say. on the analysis board, um, Aronian just took on d7. Yeah, I think that uh, looks like quite a, a logical move. Well, bishop takes e4 was still uh, the more sort of yeah um, the computer is showing that but uh, you're right but rook takes b takes d7 knight d7 queen takes a4 i think that well he has an extra pawn now knight f8 mm -hmm. well he will take an e4 and the a pawn should be very strong of course there is quite some some work left but uh, even so i think he's just technically winning for a run in this position and i assume he's gonna have play the move bishop takes e4 and it should be a win for him Mm -hmm. Let's say bishop e4, rook d2, and most likely something like rook a7. And he yeah. will transfer the bishop to to the this, this diagonal at some point, and he will attack the f7 pawn, and the a pawn will go forward. It looks like pretty much winning. Still maybe a bit of hope for, mm. for Andraikin, but generally... But Andraikin, instead of playing knight f8 just now, he could have... Tried something like a five, blocking the bishop at least temporarily. Yeah. And uh, in case he might have been afraid of rook d4, I but would then really king f7. So. Sure. And uh, maybe he was afraid of g4, even g4, d3 g6. in this position. Something like d3 and taking. Yeah, I would take d3. back, and the mm -hmm. a4 four pawn will come come yeah. next. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Probably just uh, lost uh, in I, in, I, I really in think either so. way. So I think Aronian will very likely win this game, and he will catch up with the. Leader Anand, of course, Anand will still be leading uh, yeah. by tiebreak, but that is uh, well. It's very early in the tournament mm -hmm. for that. But, yes. um, but we will. T today is uh, an unexpectedly sort of uh, well, a game uh, sort of a round full of decided games. For sure, no. I well, I think three decided games we're most likely gonna games get up we, to. Yeah, that seems to be the case. Mm -hmm. And, and well, I think Aronian is the big winner of today's round. He's gonna catch up with um, with Anand, but also he's sort of before this round he was equal with Switler and uh, um, Kramnik, but now yeah. he's a full point ahead of these two players. So this yeah. has been a spectacular development. He actually took on e4 with the rook. Mm -hmm. Does it make a difference? He Not took on really d2. Really, probably. You think he's point is to play a4 now, but that would surprise me a bit. Well, yeah, rook a2. He just did. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Isn't he making his uh, his task a bit more difficult? Mm. Just out of curiosity, rook takes e4, rook d2. And now rook a2. A4? 
Which setup is he going for? Is it bishop f1? Hmm. And pushing the pawn forward. Maybe he thinks that bishop f1 to c4 will be quite quite good. Let's say bishop f1 now. Knight e6. And now let's say rook to b4. Mm -hmm. And you want to play bishop c4 next. But of course... He there is some 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 work, some, to some, some work mm -hmm. to be be done, I think. But that could be still a theoretically winning position. Right? Very likely, but there is actually some some work left here uh, for Ronian. So, well, I think also this game is at some point we thought this is just going to be over right away. But actually, this game could drag on for even a couple of hours. I would say. I still yeah. think it's probably winning for Ronian, mm -hmm. but. It's going to take a while. Well, Aronian uh, sort of chose the most, um, uh, well, human way to play this, yeah. I Yeah, no, I mean, of course there was a couple of computer wins, but they were rather complicated. And this looks sort of very pure and very logical. And well, probably he just thinks this is actually a winning position, or at least very close to it. Mm -hmm. I but agree with you, yes. yes. Uh, of well course he's going to fight on a lot in this position. But, uh, well, I think he should really really put the rook on, on, on b4 in mm -hmm. this position. No, he, he doesn't and even have to play bishop f1. No, bishop rook f1. Rook b4 is completely fine. And yeah. Uh, and just later he can... Well, you can put the bishop on d5. It doesn't, ma doesn't make it a, a, well a, a difference. But the, the difficult bit, of course, is, well, something like this, is to get the a pawn forward. Mm -hmm. I would have shoot something like knight e6, although... It's close that you can take an e6, but, well, you, I guess you would rather keep the bishop. Something like mm -hmm. h4 next, maybe. It's it's very, very close to winning. Yeah, it's a kind of position that will be winning little by little. It yeah. could take some time, but uh, the the final result of the game is really not in the... in, in a, It's not a real question, I guess. I still don't think it's a given, but of course it's much more likely Aronian will win than uh, Andrekin. But mm -hmm. at least Andrekin doesn't have to care so much about calculating tactical variations anymore. Now, keep the rook in the A-line, put the knight on E6 and, uh, uh, well, get a bit of air for your king. Or, and maybe try to bring the king to the center. Mm -hmm. At least it has simplified his task a lot. But of course, well, it could be, it's a simple task, but a lost cause. So, so exactly. <laughs> so, it's well, not much to do about that, I think. No, no. No, Aronian has been playing this game uh, quite yeah, well. Yeah, quite well. I, again, well, the computer will, will, will criticize him a bit for that there could be easier ways to win. Yeah. Well, the press conference is probably uh, about to start and we are yeah. going for that very, very soon. Can you give us some ideas what happened today? Пожалуйста, расскажите, что сегодня произошло. Well, I played a new opening, uh, which I was kind of was planning to play at some point during this tournament. And uh, well, this is, a, this is a well-known position in which uh, uh, Shach's reaction gave me a very, very interesting position. And I uh, basically, uh, after e4, knight d4, well, black is obviously fine because uh, you, you don't normally get so much by move 10 in the Dutch. And uh, and here maybe already I could have done something uh, more ambitious. For instance, for some reason, I, after rook f7, if, if white goes b5 here, I was planning to play knight g4. Шахрияр, благодаря его выбору, получилась очень интересная позиция. Здесь, конечно, после e4, конь d4, белые достигли многого. Простите, да, простите, черные достигли многого. Можно сказать, что в этом дебюте так обычно не получается. And uh, for some reason, I only considered knight g4 in this position, when in fact I can even start with knight g4 here. Даже здесь я могу начать с конь g4, хотя почему-то рассматривал. The threat of e4, e3 is quite serious in this position, and b5, rook f7 transposes, and okay, white could maybe try something like h3, knight e5, queen b3, but then, uh, well, it's clear that black is doing fine. Even something like knight c6 is possible, for instance. It's an improved version of what I got in the game. После конь g4 очень сильна угроза e3, и после h3 конь e5 перспективы. Yeah, but I'm still, I'm still okay after rook f7. Это лучшая версия того, что получилось, чем uh, but, but here, here after queen b3, I realized that if I play knight g4 here, uh, why can simply play rook d1, e3, and f4. And now if knight f2, white simply goes knight bishop d5, and uh, 
And okay, I exchange all my active pieces and I'm probably even close to lost because basically uh, white has all the pieces out and I have nothing nothing in play. Yeah, so uh, in this position I, I have to do something else and uh, basically uh, by playing rook f7 I allowed white to play queen b3 and now his pieces connect much better. Да, но сыграв ладья f7, я позволил белым пойти ферзь b3, и теперь его фигуры гораздо лучше взаимодействуют. Uh, so finally I, I settled on knight c6, and we get this, uh, this position. I, uh, well, white can maybe avoid playing f3, but we both uh, went for the same position here. f3, bishop b6, rook a d1. В конце концов, я остановился на конь c6, и в этой позиции, может быть, белые могут uh, и не играть know, f3, но мы оба пошли на этот вариант. I don't know what Shah thought about this position. I felt that I should be at least fine, but... Я не знаю, что думал Шахриар по поводу этой позиции. Мне казалось, что у меня как минимум неплохо. Просто нормальная позиция, интересно ее играть. If I want a quiet life, I can maybe even take, take and just play rook d7. Если я хотел спокойно жизни, я мог бы просто взять и сыграть ладья d7, следующим ходом ферзь f7. Yeah, four and I don't know queen f7. Yeah. No, but I didn't want. Basically, from a very, from a very far away, when I played knight c6, I saw that I can play a6 in this position, and I was absolutely sure I should be fine here, at least fine. And so I was very happy when we got here because I thought, okay, this is a very interesting position with chances for for counterplay, and I think I was correct. Из далека, когда играл конь c6, я видел, что в этой позиции могу пойти a6, и считал, что мне здесь все неплохо, потому что хороший шанс на контр игру, и думаю, что я прав в этом. And uh, actually, the next moves seem to be quite forced because White cannot allow it takes b5. It's, uh, I mean, everything will collapse if I take on b5. So b6 is forced. Rook a6. F4, I think, is forced. Now it's important not to take with the knight because if I take with the knight, uh, I think bishop e4 and knight g5 is quite strong. Важно не взять конем на e4, потому что после взятия слоном на e4 конь d5, я думаю, что очень сильная позиция. And here, uh, White gets all his pieces coordinated. Rook f7 and knight e7 check is always a threat in many positions. So this I wasn't uh, really. This I didn't like very much, but I thought after f4, after f4, White still, I, th I think White more or less has to take uh, take on e4. So we get this position anyway. Takes takes rook f1, bishop rook f1, and here I have a, uh, a number of options. Здесь у меня есть несколько возможностей. Uh, for instance, I can play bishop h3, but uh, finally I couldn't make something work after rook f4. Но после ладья f4 я не варианты не составлю. Basically, uh, if I go g5, uh, bishop d5 checking h8 and rook e4 is very strong because I have no squares on the f5. Здесь ладья h4 очень сильный ход, потому что нету полей на. If I could play either queen f8 or queen f7, I would be winning, but. But uh, basically, white has a very important tempo to play bishop b2, so. He is maybe even winning here. Then I switch to queen e5, and this would this would be a very very interesting option because the queen is threatening to to enter the the white camp. But basically here, white goes bishop d5 check, king h8, and bishop b2. Ладья f8 с спецом d4. Not not rook f8 check. This at first I thought I was fine because if rook f8 check, bishop f8, bishop b2, then I have bishop c5. Да, но здесь еще раз. And it's a draw. I think it's a draw because e3, bishop e3, queen e3, queen b2, queen e8 is a perpetual. Потому что это вечный шах. I think, or maybe I'm actually no, maybe I'm losing. Yeah, maybe I'm losing actually. Queen g8. No, no, no. No. Uh, and queen f uh, no, but there's no mate. Yeah, queen g7. Queen... No, I was looking for a win for white. No, of course, uh, of course, queen e7. Yeah, queen, queen, queen e7 is a draw, but I was, I was checking if I'm losing, but I'm not, I'm not losing. Uh, so I was, I was happy about this for a while, but then I spotted bishop b2, just tra tra transposing the moves, and now I'm, and now I'm lost because, uh, because queen b2 rook f8 obviously is winning on the spot. And I always had this backup option of playing b5, but for for a very long time I couldn't see a very simple thing. I thought bishop g5 is unpleasant. 
После and того, I, конечно, у меня всегда была возможность сыграть в 5 но долгое время I, я не мог reason, довольно I, простую вещь увидеть. Я думал, что слон d5 неприятно. Я автоматически давал этот шаг в слон d4. И после h1, может быть, нет квалити. But after a very, very long time, I realized that, that I can simply take immediately and take on e2, uh, basically keeping bishop d4 check in reserve. Uh, and uh, even after d6, king h8, uh, we both calculated a very, very long line here. Basically, bishop d4 check is a huge threat, so white has this funny option of bishop d2. Take, check. Uh, check, check. I have to play g5 because king g7 is a draw. If I want to play for a win, I have to play g5. Uh, rook f6 and no, actually here maybe king h5 is winning. Ah, no, no, g4, g4. Queen g4. Take d6. Rook a8. Yeah. <laughs> dc and rook a8 and black is winning. So actually, this this maybe isn't even possible for uh, for, for for white. And, and, так что это может быть даже невозможно. And I think uh, potentially maybe I'm, I'm slightly better here. But, but uh, starting from Queen E3, I went completely brain dead for about 20 minutes, and it, it decided the game. после Ферси 3 мой мозг на 20 минут, можно сказать, отключился. First of all, I completely, I mean, I didn't even consider Queen D7, which somebody already pointed out to me. Uh, and it seems that black is just much, much better. Of, uh, basically, the, 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 the threat of bishop d4 is so big that, I don't know, white maybe has to play bishop c5. And, and then, compared to the game, I, I actually managed to take on c4 with the bishop, which is something I wanted to do very much, of course. And the rook on a6 connects to everything. Uh, the rook connects, and I play rook e6 next move or something. And, uh, I mean, I I don't know how much better I am, but it's clear that I'm better. Я не знаю, насколько у меня лучше, но очевидно, что лучше. And uh, this is a bit unpleasant because uh, this means that the whole concept was correct, and I just went completely completely crazy for. for Немножко неприятно, потому что означает, что вся моя концепция была корректна и просто. First of all, I, I realized B takes C4 is. I mean, after Bishop C5, I'm no longer better, but uh, losing this position in, in three moves is is. Completely inexplicable. Я понял, что здесь у меня уже не лучше, но проигрывать эту позицию. First of all, I I I can play c7, c6 here, because basically white white if I do nothing, if I do something like let's say I don't know h6, just to to give a demonstration, white's threat is bishop b7, let's say rook a2, bishop d5, rook a6, and bishop takes c4. Да, если я сыграю h6, например, просто чтобы продемонстрировать, то вот в таком варианте заканчивается все ходом слона. So basically playing c6 and protecting against both bishop b7 and bishop d5 is a natural move. But I didn't like cutting off. I didn't like cutting off the rook so much. Мне не нравилось, что я свой ладью. I don't know. This, for instance, allows bishop d4, and I mean white is white is quite comfortable here. Был довольно комфортной позиции. But still, after c6, game game continues, and also I had a look. The machine. Но все же после c6 продолжается партия. The machine says queen d7, the move I wanted to make very much. And now after rook b1, I I would have played rook b1 without thinking, but then I spotted rook b1. And I, frankly, I couldn't see what to do with the threat of rook b8 check. And the machine just goes. The machine just goes king h8 and bishop g8. Apparently. And says black is completely fine. И говорит, что у черных все в порядке. Which is a bit surprising, but I can believe that because it's very difficult to. I mean, I have everything under control. I will play rook e8, rook e6, rook e8, maybe or something. Немножко удивительно, но я могу в это поверить, потому что у черных все под контролем, молодец, шесть, шесть, восемь, возможно. And basically, black is just fine here. So there was absolutely no reason, no reason to panic. And after queen c8, I I forgot about h4, but even here, for instance, после h4 я забыл о h4. A reasonably simple idea of rook takes a2, h5. And rook a1 should save the game quite comfortably because without without rooks on the board, I shouldn't really be in a lot of trouble. I'm not going to get mated with only the the queen and the bishops. So basically, queen c8, h4, h6. I there are no words to describe this. Просто говорят, а ферзь 8, аж 4, аж 6, у меня нет даже слов, чтобы это описать. I have no idea what this is. I would very much like to sort of unsee this. Make me unsee this. Я не понимаю, что это, и я бы хотел это развидеть. 
so after bishop takes g6, I mean the, the rest, I mean Shach, Shach found the most precise way to finish the game off, but, but uh, why, why did I make those three moves in a row? I have no idea. Почему я сделал эти три хода один за другим? У меня просто нет вообще даже понятия. So, over to you. Uh, I just want to say, okay, uh, opening up, of course, is, uh, before is not very good move because I was debut. tried uh, in the, some tournaments. I played knight d5, move d5, or rook e1, every move I played. But uh, I, yeah, and I think every time I played draw. And, uh, and, but I tried to play before, and uh, okay, of course, I understand this is not a very good move, but it is, you know, after before is very, uh, I hope it will be an interesting game. And, and uh, now, after e4, knight e4, I'm afraid to move queen e7, because I think if he, he played queen f7 and he, he played думал, without any risk and queen f7? Yeah, uh, why not? Queen b3? In nice c6, just take Yeah, I thought about, I thought about this, but I, I thought this is a bit boring. I thought uh, b6, uh, no, I mean bishop b6, knight 7 maybe. Uh, rook c1, knight d7 and bishop b2 and I thought Maybe you right. But it's uh, it's okay for for both sides. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I looked at this, okay. but it's just fine for. Yeah, it's, uh, for of both. course, it's boring. Yeah. Yeah. But okay, when after when he, okay f three, okay, I understood this black is okay, and I think white is also. And uh, it is very important moment uh, when he played b five. Uh, I think about thirty minutes or twenty five. Uh, I, I think. Of course, I answered maybe is bishop d5 is better move because bishop d5, I think, this is draw. Uh, probably yeah, this, this uh, long line. This because long line not long, yeah, I can, I just I calculate I d6 and just queen d5. Just ah. play queen d5 and not bishop d5, and I just calculate c take and I can, of course you can, queen c4, but I just uh, check and ah. same I, idea, I know, but it's, I just change and queen b7. Ah, very nice. It's draw. This yeah. I didn't see. Yeah, and I see. Okay, I calculate his draw after queen d5. I, I but okay, I uh, but yeah, after. I thought that after this variant, after first d5, nothing. But okay, I think uh, to play or not. But after I see queen d3, and I think uh, I play again without any risk, and I think only I can play for win. But I miss absolutely yeah, queen d7. Yeah, we both, yeah, we both yeah. completely missed queen d7. If of course uh, it was, uh, I see queen d7. Well, I thought I could play for win without any risk, and of course I missed queen d7. Yeah, yeah. If of course it was, I see queen d7. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah
what is probably a theoretically winning endgame. I think it's very close and uh, well, things have quite some interesting development in the time pressure phase. Yes, and uh, right now we have this um, very typical four, uh, well, three pawns against three on one flank and uh, an extra A pawn that, uh, well, has been widely discussed in uh, but, chess books. But there is a quite a difference. If you take the pawn on E6 and put it back to F7, I would say it's very typical. But with this pawn structure, there is actually some kind of uh, change i would say for sure but i think well it's uh, we probably both agree that this is not to black's advantage generally not but what i think is a bit of a problem with aronian is that somehow it's not so easy for him to find a stable setup and the pawn on e6 it will go to e5 and poke the the black sorry the white rook and mm -hmm. let's say it goes to e4 then the rook at some point will start go to a2 and attack the f2 pawn well, there's always going to be huge winning chances, but if it's actually just easily winning, I somehow doubt, actually. Mm -hmm. I don't see how, how a run well, should do it. Well, the end game is never easily winning. <laughs> well, it really de depends, I think. Um, no, actually, I think it could be a draw, mm -hmm. but I, I'm, well, I'm not going to say anything with cert certainty here. But uh, I think Ronin is spending quite some time, and I'm actually surprised that he took on E6. Maybe he just thought and still thinks this is completely winning. And it, of course, could be. But how are you... Well, I think what he really likes about his position is that, that well, these are defending each other. And, of course, ideally, you would keep the rook and the pawn protecting each other and then switch the king to the, the queen's side. But mm -hmm. I think that e5 will break that down at times. Mm -hmm. And somehow, I mean, I, I think Aronian has sort of decreased his chances of winning the, the game. He could still win it, but I think... Right now on the screen we can see, uh, well, a lot of spectators for, well, for Hunter Mancis, because generally there are not many spectators uh, usually here. And uh, I think that most of them are Armenian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, well, uh, there is a very friendly, I think Levon has been mentioning that in his press conferences, that uh, the diaspora here um, is very friendly and that he they... they are um, supporting him uh, very, very nicely. And yesterday, after the after his very long game mm -hmm. and uh, also a very long press conference with Vladimir Kramnik, well, his compatriots were waiting for him all that time. <laughs> and uh, well, we were just we happened to be well. leaving at a similar time. And of course, well, it is quite impressive. Right. And and this kind of uh, support must um, must feel very pleasant and very nice for him. It yeah, even so, I think right now he's heavily into his, his chess position and I think he's he's upset with himself because he's actually given Andraikin a possible chance to defend this game while in the time pressure, I think he was he had a number of, of winning options. Mm -hmm. Well, if we go back, they had this position, bishop d5, king f6, rook e4, rook a3, and now he chose to take on... Hmm. But actually, it's not so easy to get forward with the A pawn, and knight well, C five is coming. Maybe here is your answer to whether he thought that this is better or or worse with the pawn on E six. He specifically went rook E four, and only then took took E six. So yeah, clearly you can say he could thinking. take here, but yes. but okay, that's um, well. Yeah, I think also if you take on E six and he takes back with the king, well, at some point. There was even some brilliant new discoveries by, I think, uh, a player called Steckner, who found some uh, amazing win in the position earlier, sort of Considered drawn. Choice. And I mm -hmm. think, for instance, Mark Doretsky has written uh, a very good uh, article on that. I think it's uh, on, I think it's, uh, you can find it on chesscafe.com if you go to the archives there. But that was a very specific position. And I think generally, well, when... Um, the defender is in time to, to sort of make a couple of accurate moves. White will actually not really sort of um, get these things uh, going. Of course, this is a better version for, for White, but even so, I mean, I don't feel confident that this is enough for White to win actually by accurate defense. I simply think that Black will, with, well, a setup with e5 and king f6 and the rook on a2. It's not clear to me how, how, mm -hmm. how this is going to just collapse. Well, what you are saying is that uh, this pawn on e5 could be... Yeah, let me just make a, a couple of sort of uh, random moves in order to yeah. sort of illustrate 
what kind of scenario I, I'm talking about. Something like this. And, well, these pawns are, are weaknesses. And it's not trivial mm -hmm. to sort of make progress in, mm -hmm. in, in this position. Well, generally, maybe we should remind that, well, the way you are supposed to win this ending is by, well, there is no other way but to bring the king over to the well, to support the A pawn, mm -hmm. else it doesn't it doesn't come come forward. No. And in the process of doing that, you also have to make sure that you don't lose all of your king side has, pawns. There's even been maybe one or two famous games where yes. the one with the extra pawn actually lost yes. because he brought over his king, and yeah. then things happened. And, uh, well. and well, that's just an indication of uh, how complex the end games mm -hmm. are, and even to really very strong players, yeah. it's not uh, easy because you can never calculate until the very no. end. You can just assume somewhere, well, sort of stop somewhere and say, okay, this this should be winning, or, well, here yeah. I will have good chances. But so but actually, hmm. well, I think the position could be a draw, and I think actually it's not even easy for Aronian to come up with a excellent practical winning attempt. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you sort of go away with the king and give up the f2 pawn, well, the e pawn is actually going to be passed right away. Yes. And well, right now we don't have, uh, let's say, any, any endgame theory book at hand where we could um, check it. But uh, you're very welcome to tweet <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and help us a bit there. Uh, because, uh, well, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if exactly the same position or a very similar yeah, structure I'm, I'm would have sure been... I'm not sure with this exact structure uh, in that sense. Well, I think also it will always depend a lot on how the rook was positioned. Let's... Mm -hmm. well. Unfortunately, at this board, I cannot sort of just uh, rearrange the pieces. But let's say put the rook on g5, mm -hmm. the pawn on f4, and the pawn on a5. Well, then everything is controlled. And yeah, that apart would be from lovely. that, would be <laughs> lovely. Maybe even then there would be a move e5 at some point. But let's see. Okay, Aronian played rook e4. That one we actually predicted. Um, but let's see how he's gonna sort of try try it out. Yes. Maybe he's want to put the pawn on f3, but then the rook is just staying on a3. Well, I, I really think that he should try to put the pawn on f3 and maybe play g4. Well, uh, somehow uh, make sure that yeah. he, well the pawns are a bit more stable before he... Uh, well, the only way for him to try to win is to but bring the king you're somewhere. You're saying something like this, f3, e5, g4. Well, just but as an example, yes. I think well, you will most likely... But maybe something maybe like G5 even possible. Uh, well, even without taking on G4, I don't know. You're saying in this position, G5 even. Uh, well, that's just... Uh, but probably maybe, oh, I can take on G5 and think. give a check on E5. That would actually yeah. be unfortunate. You're right. Mm -hmm. that, that is not a good idea. No, but... Um, I, to be honest, I think this position is actually a draw. Mm -hmm. That would be my, my hunch. But that's... And well, that's, uh, a bit... I mean... Ronnie is going to be very disappointed by this this uh, turn of yeah, events. Yeah, that's almost shocking because, well, uh, just before the uh, yeah, just before the end of the time trouble, it really seemed like he completely outplayed Andreiken, and also um, he had a couple of ways to to win. Mm. Some were more direct and more convincing, others less. What he chose. I, I really thought that his idea was to keep the bishop against the knight and yeah. to slowly move uh, the a-pawn forward. But, and Reichen did manage to create uh, some rather direct counterplay. Yeah. But, yeah, but yeah. I agree. I mean, this was uh, But I wouldn't rule out that, uh, that it was possible for him still to play this position with a bishop. Not, not, not no, give no, away I, the bishop agree, and just uh, play on, uh, play mm -hmm. on and uh, do something here. It's not like it's... A trivial draw, but and I mean, I could easily be wrong, and this is just lost. But I would still be well. It's be quite at surprised. least it's it's, uh, it's an improvement for Andreikin because well, here at least not, not just an improvement, but but a massive mm. improvement as compared to what he had before. Let's say something mm. like King F6. Would you consider F4 to stop? No, I e5, was I was thinking about f4, but uh, well, uh -huh. what's the point when g3 is so ridiculously yeah, weak? Yeah, I think also that's just maybe even you can start checking him and uh, yeah. Well, he just actually he went to f7 instead. It probably doesn't make a difference because no. well, I think he's just asking the question, uh, well, what next? Mm -hmm. Simply. Well, I guess Aronian will. Well, King f1 would be logical. Would I you guess. say that having a rook? Yeah. Well. 
a Ronin, for instance, can try to put the rook in front of the pawn, but having it uh, from the side is generally considered to be better as it also protects, well, at least has a chance to protect the pawns. Yeah, well, I actually wouldn't rule out that if it's, it was possible to get the rook on a8 and the pawn on a7, this position is actually winning at times. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think now I'm going to make some really random moves, so please excuse me, but uh, let's say something like oh, this. Oh, king e7, yes. Mm -hmm. Check here. Yeah, that's also here. what I'm curious about. Well, now I'm just going to make some uh, King G7. move, something like this. Mm -hmm. And even that's this, I'm not sure if this is winning. No, that's that, that you're going to win, I think. Are you completely I, I, sure about you, this? You remember, I recently I lost something Yeah, similar. but this could also be very similar to... There was a game uh, in the 2007 World Championship tournament between Kramnik and uh, Anand. Actually... Well, the king will go to e7, for instance. Mm -hmm. But even if you take the e6 pawn for a start, it's not, not a given that you are, you are going to win, actually. So even that, but I think, okay, now we got a bit far away, but it's not even clear that this position is winning. Maybe you should keep the pawn for a6 and such. But even this, I think when you take the e6 pawn, it's not a given that this actually is going to be enough. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this was uh, sort of going a bit away, and he's played the move king f1. Mm -hmm. Can I can play the move e5 now? I would guess he no, can. No, that's not what he's doing. He just plays rook a2. Rook to a2, that's very logical, and king mm -hmm. e1 has, has, has happened. But, well, I would sort of try and latch onto the f2 pawn. That's exactly what he's doing. So if, let's say, f3 would happen now, I would stand on a3. Yes, well, that's, that's obviously his only I would idea. actually consider playing e5 here. And it's not... I don't know if I have any kind of argument for why. But, but I, I don't think there is, there is any uh, sort of hurry to do this, to make no. this move, because f4 is uh, cannot, well, can be never a threat. <laughs> ah, sure. The only point is that maybe you should consider putting his uh, your king on e7, as after king d1, at times yeah. rook f2, rook f4 will be possible. Exactly. I, I, I somehow... Should show this, yes. Yeah, well, we are saying that uh, something like king f6, well, you could consider king d1 now. Mm -hmm. and, and the co uh, concept But again, here you can play e5. Yeah, just but the concept should be that <laughs> at times when you take an f, f2 in this position, well, rook f4 would be winning pawn and then, ah, sorry, now um, the position disappeared. So here... Well, I think both e5 and king f6, or any move, basically. And I think there is probably also nothing wrong with, let's say, doing like this and giving another check. But now, actually, he's going to go king c3, yeah. and suddenly, well, he's actually, ah, the pawn is not hanging, so that would be a blunder, for sure. Mm -hmm. So that's why maybe e5 in this position would be logical, or... Mm -hmm. Well, that's King actually to, a very <coughs> King to e7. <coughs> that's that's a very interesting end game we mm -hmm. have here, and uh, well, it's always nice to see a theoretically, uh, let's say, complicated end games play out For on sure. the highest level, and it doesn't happen all that often. Okay, so. let's try and make a move here. King e7. How will you proceed? Well, this is simply too slow, right? You're uh, just going to take yeah. this pawn. You, you cannot and afford to have yeah. it. I mean, if you could get in a5 and rook a8, uh, mm -hmm. a4, but this is not happening. So no. here you have to do it slightly differently. But how? But how, yeah. <laughs> how are we going to get this going? Well, I think that he might be considering f3 or... And what about this? I'm trying to four. switch the rook to mm -hmm. a7. But you will just stand on f6. But now now I can play king d1, actually. Mm -hmm. So maybe... Well, I don't know. It's, I mean, normally you would try and get the rook on b4. But maybe here... But I think even putting the rook on a7, it's not really going to make a difference. Yeah. But Andrekin is taking his time here. Yeah, and that he should. Yeah, sure. Well, I'm actually... I don't know Andrekin's games well enough to say how good he is in the end games but my hunch would be that well they're all very good <laughs> i think also they well that's i mean that's gonna uh, depend a, a bit in in a way but um, i think he's a well quite a serious student of the game so i would expect him to have quite some <laughs> yes. but also well for instance i actually at some point had a 
two weeks training session with Mark Doretsky together with uh, well, the Brazilian player uh, Lai Tao and we spent two weeks with Doretsky just studying theoretical endings and uh, mm -hmm. well I, I'm afraid I have forgotten most of it so it's not something you have to, to rehearse now and then but well I'm sure that all the top players are definitely studying endings but well you will get some knowledge but another thing is actually playing it out on the board Mm -hmm. um, well, I can see there is a, a, a tweet from Vidit Gujarati just a, one minute ago who says that he just analyzed Aronian and Drake in Endgame for a while and it looks like a draw. Yeah. That's our impression as well, that this is probably not going to be enough for Aronian. It's, uh, well, everything is protected, he's a pawn up and such, but it seems very hard to, to go on. Mm. Okay, here in the picture we have the, the chief arbiter. He's. Uh, Maybe he's reading up on the rules. <laughs> it's all yeah, actually, good today, to today the, the rules have come into question. As um, well, for a start in in the in the game that uh, has finished some time ago in uh, Vasily Topalov's game against uh, Vladimir Kravnik, there was no handshake neither before nor as far as we can judge well, after uh, the game. I, I well, we didn't have full photo coverage all the time, and no. also I don't know what the rules are saying exactly no. in some sense. I mean. Do you have to shake hands, or is it only if you are offered a hand you actually have to shake it? Yes. Uh, and uh, there is things. And also, like it's this. a bit tricky when, well, when both players are not making a move to do that. Yeah, Who, whom to uh, punish, yeah, sure, right? Sure. Well, both. Uh, I thought I would assume, but uh, I mean, yes. No, well, well, I doubt something will happen there. No, but that's I, I wouldn't think so either. It's probably also as, as, as um, not it's our, just our role to evaluate that. that. But let's let's yes. let's see. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see. Well. King E1 is played here. I really doubt that any kind of... Uh, it more or less doesn't matter what uh, Andrekin is doing in this position unless he blunders something, which actually is... It's pretty hard to do that uh, unless you really try, mm -hmm. um, I would say. So, but this could actually, I think, drag on for really a long time without too much happening. So, maybe also if you have some, some tweets, please uh, tweet us uh, and uh, Your questions ask, ask some and questions. Or, and even well, if you find a win for White here, please, <laughs> please let us know. Yes, we will be very, very grateful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's not so easy for us to analyze this um, very far, far um, sort of, um, well... Yeah, well, I simply don't see a good way for Aronian to actually yeah. sort of progress here. And I, well, you think King E7, I think maybe E5, but basically it's the same point. We want to mm -hmm. be ready to take the pawn on F2 given the chance. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and well, uh, well, it should be mentioned that the rook on E2 is, well, as active as it gets in these kinds of opening, <laughs> uh, of endgames, of yeah. course. And that's, uh, yeah, yeah, that's how oh, it is. I, I would, well, I would think so. I... I I don't see a, a and good even, way. Yes, even if white manages, well, let's say if white plays a free g4, it's not but at all clear what he achieved. Uh, well, the white black pawn is going to be passed then. And uh, also the exchanges the generally exchanges should, should favor, 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 mm -hmm. favor the, the, the defender here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I I don't see how, how this should be done, actually. Yeah. And it sh should also be mentioned that well, in this particular position, the engines are not helpful at all. <laughs> not all, no. I mean well, unless you suddenly see it jumping to plus three, then probably something, something has happened. Well, but in this position, it's um, well, it might have a reasonably accurate evaluation. But for instance, put the rook on a8 and the pawn on a6 or a7, you could suddenly see some engines jumping to plus three or plus four, despite the position being a dead draw. Mm -hmm. But it's very difficult for the engines to understand that you are a pawn up, you have a pass pawn so close to queening, and even so there's nothing to do. I mean, this kind of things uh, has happened. I think they have massively improved the engines' understandings of this, but even so, I think there you will still see some, uh, some of the maybe biggest uh, engine evaluations uh, mm. mistakes, actually. We have a new tweet from Lucas. How do seconds work with the player on psychology, especially after a loss during the tournament, or, well, in a difficult situation? Peter, you have ah, uh, you, you yeah. probably have a lot of experience in that. <laughs> You're saying that <laughs> the players I coach have lost a lot of games. Yeah, <laughs> no. Well, I think it really depends. Of course, I mean, um, well, I think, for instance, with Anand, he, he lost, of course, a, a crucial game to 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 Gelfand in the World Championship match. But, but I think we basically decided uh, that nothing too terrible has happened. I mean, maybe maybe we went for a walk or something like this. But I think, well. 
the battle continues and such. Of course, there will always be different circumstances and different players. But, well, I mean, maybe you will say that, well, after all, chess is just a game. And this is, well, it, this is sport. And you will win some and you will lose some. And uh, well, sort of over empathizing the importance of the result, I think generally is not a very, very great idea. But um, I think it's going to depend on the circumstances very much. But would so. you say, Peter, that a good second should also be an excellent psychologist? I think that's maybe overdoing it to some extent. But of course, um, well, at least you have to know you, your player in that sense. I mean, if you, well, I mean, if he's, for instance, a nervous player, and then you add a lot of tension by mm -hmm. telling him this was very important and stupid, that of course would be bad. And that doesn't somehow, make sense, yes. maybe also some players has to be woken up, and then you, of course, well, had to do that to a, a certain uh, extent. And I think even, well, for instance, in matches uh, where we are a lot of seconds. I mean, we might even have different roles that somebody wants to push the player and get him to walk up and the other ones would like to come to him and sort of... And maybe that works out well in the sense of balancing or else there will be a, almost a fight. But uh, no, of course, that is also the part of the role of a second. But, uh, well, I mean, some players will go with their wives or with their uh, parents, depending on their age, right, and such. Mm -hmm. So it really, there is individual sort of circumstances uh, in that sense. But of course, well, it's not enough only to have focused on the purely chess aspect, or especially the opening aspect. I mean, if your player is sort of falling to pieces psychologically, right? But uh, um, no, of course, that is that is part of the role, Probably but still, the, still. Uh, yeah, uh, a very important point is that you have to know your player well, and, and you have to know what uh, what works for your player as a second. I, I would really mm -hmm. assume so, and I think, well, that's, I mean, you will have sort of an understanding of, of certain players, and I think, there is no such thing as just being a good second or a bad second. You could be a good second for somebody because, well, you can sort of interact reasonably well with, with that person, for instance, uh, and such. Um, but um, no, of course, that's also part of it for sure. Right? Yeah, and you, but you'll notice that, uh, well, let's see, to, the, to a tournament like that, no one comes along generally. Every player needs someone to sort of to speak to. Yes. And there is another tweet. Mike Johnson is uh, writing, what has Anand done differently in candidates, which makes him play so good compared to the previous tournaments he has played? Yeah, who knows? I mean... That, well, that's a question <laughs> yeah, for Anand. It, it, it's a good question. And well, As far as I can see, he's not doing things very, very differently. I mean, he's playing the same openings and... Uh, well, things are working out for him, certainly. Maybe simply the pressure is less in, in a way. And uh, But I doubt that to some extent. It seems to me that uh, Vichy is doing like he, he he used to do, and Vichy is being the same person as he used to do. But the uh, point seems to be well rolling in to a certain extent, right? And, um, well, I mean, well, I think Vichy at his age and with his success he has a, as a chess player here in life, he has really believed in his concept and he somehow thinks that, well, okay, starting to think something dramatic is wrong. This is what I've always been doing and this is what have given me f five world championship titles. He actually believes this is the right way. Of course, there will be adjustments and you will surprise with some things in the openings and, uh, well, you maybe you will surround yourself with, with new helpers uh, and stuff like this. But I think when it comes to the core of it, Vichy is very much playing the same kind of chess he's always done. And right now, things are working out. Um, well, I think maybe Wishy, to a certain extent, uh, thrives as an underdog. And, uh, well, I think maybe sort of the chess world started to actually underestimate his, his skills a bit and thought maybe, well, I think there was even speculations he would simply not show up at this tournament. Uh, well, right, no, right. Uh, not, 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 not show up, but sort of decide not yeah, to yeah. play. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> not, not sort of, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, let's, yes. let's correct that. But, yeah. I mean... There is nothing sort of miraculous that has changed or anything like this. It seems to be, well, certainly the things are, are just working uh, correctly for him mm. in a way. It's, it's still t too early, but, well, he hasn't even been close to a, a bad position in this tournament as far as I can see. And he could maybe even, well, have pressed a bit more against uh, Andraikin. I think uh, he actually pressed quite well and uh, Andraikin defended quite yeah. well. But it seems to be, well, Vichy as it always been, but uh, suddenly... It's actually working quite well for him again, and uh, 
I mean, to say that something very dramatically has changed, I, at least I don't see it, but well, maybe, maybe he does to some extent, mm-hmm. or maybe others do, but at least I, for me, it seems like Vichy is doing very much as he used to, and uh, things are working quite well. Mm-hmm. And one more tweet from Mike Johnson. Is there any other of the players who have uh, revealed their seconds? What? Yeah, many, I, I, I would guess so. I think uh, Shahriyar Mamadjarov has mentioned Ralph Mamadov and... Uh, well, well, Khalifman is obviously also his second, Yes, right? yes. Uh, yeah, and uh, well, Vladimir Kravnik is with, uh, well, with Zakharia Filinko from mm-hmm. Ukraine, that we know, and... Um, Topalov yeah. is with uh, Eduard from France? Or I haven't no, seen him or maybe yet, he, I don't that know. Maybe they had problems with his visa. Actually, this is not clarified. No, no, this, uh, this, uh, this well, is not Silvio sure Danilov is here, that's, that's very clear yeah. at least. Yeah, he's, he's made his present felt um, like that. And I think Aronian is here. Is it here? Who yes, is he? Uh, yes uh, he has been mentioning uh, definitely during during uh, some press conference. We will read uh, mm-hmm. on that and, and answer your question. Anand is here with uh, the Indian player Sandipan, who was also part of his team in the match against mm-hmm. Carlsen. And I think also he, he was seconding Anand in, uh, in Norway chess last year. And mm-hmm. Well, they have had training camps as far back as at least 2007. I remember mm-hmm. one of the strong novelties, Anand played in the in the World Championship tournament there. And maybe even I was praised for it, but it was Sandipan's idea actually. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, they yeah. have also had quite some history together and I think they're working even even closer right now. And Sergei Karyakin has uh, mentioned, I think, no, he has announced uh, even before the tournament began that he, uh, well, he will be here with uh, with uh, Rustam Kasinjanov and from home he will be helped by Yuri Dohoyan and, uh, and Alexander Motilov. Yeah, Motilov so. was a bit busy winning the European <laughs> Championship, right? But, but now uh, he's probably not busy yeah, no, anymore. No, no, no. <laughs> Yes, uh, so that we know, but actually the the player in the picture, he well, it's not very clear what oh. what he. <laughs> no, you were thinking of Andreykin, yes, right? Yes, um, yes. Well, I think Andreykin. You said that he had mentioned that he used to work alone, but for this tournament, he has gotten mm-hmm. help from somebody. But I don't think he has revealed who it actually no. is. Right? Uh, well, at least I haven't seen it. Uh, hmm. Yeah. And also yeah. Peter Swidler, actually, I don't know if we know who. I don't think he has mentioned. No. At least, well, again, we, we, we haven't read about it. No, I think he came here with the wi- his wife in the beginning, um, but um, sort of, no. Well, also, well, we are not s- the sort of commentators and journalists are staying in one uh, hotel and the players in another. So actually, mm-hmm. we don't have that much sort of... Uh, Info, well, simply. Well, yeah, we, are not, we haven't really uh, worked well as spies in that, to that extent. Normally, well, that's one of the good parts and being of location, that you will actually pick up some kind of information like this. Yeah. But uh, the, the seconds will not come to the playing hall. There could even be a rule prohibiting them from being in the actual uh, uh, playing hall. Mm-hmm. But I think generally also, well, they're just going to stay at, stay at home and uh, maybe, well, hopefully they're even following some commentary. But you're following the games there and getting some sleep and, well, also preparing for the next round. I think just to sit in the playing hall is both boring and not overly productive in, in, in mm-hmm. that sense. Well, I don't know if it's boring for the seconds. <laughs> if it's well, I think too for exciting. That, yeah, that came out wrong, but <laughs> <laughs> but I think well, to sit there for five hours is maybe not. I wouldn't say it's very p- professional. Maybe it's just a waste of time, as yeah. you could be using your time more productively. Yeah. At, uh, at some point, I had the idea that the best thing the second could do during a game was actually to sleep, but it's. Uh, it's very hard to do when, when the player is playing and you want to follow it closely. Mm-hmm. So Okay, we okay. have a new move. We had a move. I wouldn't say that it's changing the position massively. It does actually allow King D1, but I think after E5... Uh, he just played it. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At least it has the advantage. Well, it gives the opponent a chance to take a pawn and lose immediately. Oh, but he's going to play E5. That would really be my bet. E5 is a move that well it doesn't cl- uh, it doesn't seem that it spoils anything for black. No, but you can also play king e7. How would you respond to that actually? I mean that uh, I could have well, to go back to e1. <laughs> how is I mean if we I mean I'm desperately trying to make it just a bit interesting here. So king c1, rook f2, king b1. Yeah, but the pawn is way way too far. Rook f3 now. <laughs> You're saying here you're saying I'm doing excellent to lose this game. Yeah. Well. Rook G4 is existing. G5 is existing. Okay, this was 
No, no. It wasn't very bright. No, no, it's just, but well, it just shows some of the dangers in this position. Yeah, well, I think. You. So let's say king e7, would you play? A well, if you have. Uh, f3 has to be the move. Uh, else, I think if you play rook f4, well, I do have e5 here as well, right? Yeah. This is something, well, to consider and at least. Well, if again, I want to try and give up a pawn. So let's say mm -hmm. f4. Actually, this could make some sense. Now, rook a3, I'm going to go king c2. And when you take on g3, I'm going to go king b2. Mm -hmm. Here, it's probably still a draw, but I thought at least here. I mean, my pawn is a bit more scary than yours, and mm -hmm. I still have some kind of control. This could, I could actually see Aronian playing like this, mm -hmm. just in order to, well, to create some... Well, then why don't you just play e5 <laughs> yeah. in the very beginning of this line? You mean like this? Mm -hmm. That's what I mean, yes. Mm -hmm. And, well, this gives Aronian the chance to exchange a set of pawns, as far as I can see, so... But that should really be not in his favor. Generally... I think you're right there. So let's say king e5, mm -hmm. rook to b4. But okay, I think you're right. We will just start attacking the pawn here. No, no, this is this is well way way too far. Everything is way too yeah. far for white. Yeah. So, I <laughs> interesting. What could be the reason for Andrei not to play e5 immediately? Well, he has plenty of time. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but no, generally, is there mm -hmm. something that we're missing with e5? Because let's say if um, after e5, if you just play, well, rook b4 and I play king f5, uh, what is... Well, f2 was actually hanging. So yeah, sorry, mm -hmm. That's so, that, so that was wrong, but it's true, you have to play f3 here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but f3, well, we're going to put the rook on a3, right, and you're going to go king e2. And, well, for a st start, you can start checking. I guess you can also play king f5. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think Aron is progressing here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, and also sometimes now he can have simply a rook a2 check, rook a3. Uh, as and well. And how, then how are you going to... No, exactly. <laughs> and it, well, especially the, the in the lower position. Yes. If you drop the f3 pawn, the e pawn, e4 pawn is almost quicker yes. than the a pawn, yes. right? So yes, no. that is... Well, e5 looks very tempting yeah. from what... But Actually, I, can tell. That's, I mean, I understand that it's going to be quite tough for some players who has lost today, but the tournament standings has actually become pretty spectacular in some sense. Mm -hmm. We will have Anand on plus two and Aronian on plus one and then four players no, on Aronian 50%. either on plus two sure, or plus one. Sure, sure, but let, let's say this is going mm -hmm. to be a draw, actually. I mean, then, well, we have Rishi in the lead, but there's suddenly both Mamed Yarov and... Topalov has sort of joined into a one-point distance. And Swindler and, uh, and Kravnik has, well, yeah. sort of... Uh, and we are just talking of yeah. one player on plus two and one player on plus one. It's actually, I thought before today, it looked really like it has been cut into two halves. There is the mm -hmm. players on plus and those on minus. But today has actually been quite dramatic, uh, I would say. Definitely. So this is, well, it's way too early to call. And it's also not like... Should Aronian win this game? It's not a dramatic change in, in, in any no. way. But still, I think for the four players on 50%, well, I mean, two players one point ahead of them would be quite uh, different than so, sort of just one. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have a new tweet from Kaldeep Batia. Hi, Peter and Victoria. Can you tell us favorite op opening of GMs playing this tournament? It's always good to know more about them. <laughs> Well, Peter, you know, <laughs> probably, well, do you know what is Vichy's favorite opening? Well, it's hard to <laughs> hard to say a, a bit in some sense, right? I mean, well, this is kind of a dynamic I in a way, right? Um, well, yeah, well, we can debate even the first move, I think. that Well, Vichy's fa favorite move has always been E4, but he's mm -hmm. been very successful with D4 in, in World Championship matches. I think even, well, I think Kasparov... Uh, wrote some when well, after he sort of uh, gave up on, on playing chess he wrote an article and I remember he was saying that well he was playing e4 by far the most in Linares but statistically speaking he was much more successful with d4 and he, he said well had I only known in time uh, <laughs> in, in some mm -hmm. sense I think he was half joking and uh, but still um, well the Berlin has done spectacularly well in this tournament and that is well, no surprise and you could say that this is Kramnik's favorite. <laughs> yes, very much. But actually, Kramnik hasn't played it. it I think simply no one even dare, dare, dare to play it. <laughs> yes. You saw Anand playing one 
D4 against him. We we all assume that Kramnik is going to play the Berlin, yes. but actually we haven't seen any evidence of that uh, in That's a way. That's right. And um, so, well, I don't know if there's been any sort of huge uh, surprises in that sense. Well, we saw Switler doing uh, a bit of Dutch. Well, and Switler's uh, favorite opening is easy. Yeah, that's that's the Grunfeld. So, okay, it's true that Switler has... Well, he, he's a Grunfeld player. Kramnik is a Berlin player. Other players, I wouldn't say it's, it's so fixed uh, no. in that well, also sense. For, uh, in, well, uh, on this level, you have to be also a very universal player. And it's quite unusual to just stick uh, to one or two yeah. favorite variations. Well, Aronia's opening, favorite opening in this tournament, well, at least the opening he's played, he's played uh, a couple of marshals, but uh, he lost to Anand and was, uh, I think, uh, in some moderate trouble maybe against mm -hmm. uh, Topala. But he's true. He's been, a, I mean... A Marshall player for really a long time. He's also doing the Berlin, but really seems to like yeah, the, the Marshall. But though. I think that you could argue that normally uh, players have their pet openings when they are very young. Yeah. And there you can really, for instance, um, Topalov was known for playing, I think, uh, Benoni well. Well, for quite a while. For quite I, a while. Think, uh, this was, well, I don't know if it was his main opening, but at least, well, if you if, if you are sort of trying to get good in playing Benoni, you will check a lot of his games. I think also, yeah, but Topalov sort of, at some point, uh, sort of rise in the sort of world rankings by winning a lot of open tournaments and doing well there. And there you need to win a lot of games and mm -hmm. you will sharpen off stuff and Benoni seemed to suit his style excellently. Yeah. Well, I think also, well, when you mentioned Topalov, and I would say especially Vichy, well, the Nidov has been a huge uh, favorite of them. And I think, well, you have both seen them play one E4, E5 at this tournament. But I think that's simply because Bishop B5 check has become almost <laughs> a more normal move than 3 D4 yeah, these days. That's right. But I mean, they generally try very well uh, <laughs> in night offs. But, um, mm -hmm. well, it's getting harder to get this, these things these days. But, uh, well, I think they all have favorite openings. But the problem is also that... Um, they don't get to play them. No, and also that their opponents knows that. Okay. Uh, actually, we had uh, uh, action. Yeah, yeah, some so interesting developments. Well, King E7 happened, mm -hmm. and then Aronian took a very principled decision and played F4. And if I remember correctly, didn't I actually say that that was yeah. probably what he's going to try? But I think also that it is, uh, well, you say it's a principled decision, but it's a forced principled decision. <laughs> he probably doesn't even see, well, there is no other way to yeah, try sure, to win. Sure, That's, that sure. is it. So, so now rook A3, of rook course. Rook A3 mm -hmm. must be very obvious. And, well, you're going to go King C2? Mm -hmm. Rook takes g3, king b2, right? Yeah. I mean, or actually, rook a3 is not really a threat. So you could, because you have king b2, so you could spend a move playing something else. But I think... But what? Just, well, maybe, rook let's d4? say, rook d4 cutting mm -hmm. the, the king. But... That's interesting. I would guess king f6 is possible. I wouldn't even be surprised if this is a, a, a decent continuation and you will be in, be in time. Maybe... Mm -hmm. Maybe this was not my best moment, but <laughs> I, I think it could actually work. But yeah. I, I think we're going to see this position. And, well, Aronian is at least forcing Andraiken to make a couple of exact moves. But let's see. Uh, if after rook g3, yeah. if he goes king b2, which uh, should be a normal move, mm -hmm. um, how is this position? Actually, what happens here is that the king can suddenly switch from the uh, king side to the queen side, and well, he could just a switch the move would be king f6, but then probably a5 is actually going to be yeah. very, very strong. No, king I, f6 still feels like it's going the wrong direction. Yeah, but let's just follow the thought a bit, though, uh -huh. because rook d3, let's say something like a6, and I'm going to put the rook on a8. Ah, oh, no, then there is the very strong move, maybe rook to e5. I even think that, I'm not you're sure. doing a good job <laughs> losing this. Yeah, but even something like this, I wouldn't be surprised if e5 is close to a draw. But mm -hmm. I think, well, let's... Maybe you should actually hurry and play this move when you get the chance. And it could just be that, well, let's say something like this, rook d8, and now rook a4, mm -hmm. and rook a8, and I'm just going to go... King g4, and uh, I would assume that I would be in time to draw this. But of course, it's a bit concrete. There is so no need for that, most likely. No, but I mean, the way to lose these things is also that you're going to be so afraid of doing something uh, 
concrete that you actually are going to postpone the sort of the difficult decision until the point where it, it's too late? But my point would be that uh, at this position which we have on the analysis board, right? Well, rook a3 is natural, so let's put mm -hmm. it. King c2, King he's going to follow up with. And rook takes g3. Mm -hmm. And after king b2, I just play king d6. Uh, your, your king is cut off from the, well, from the pawn. And how are you going to, well, what are you going yeah, to do here? Yeah, this might simply not, not work. Uh, you're right. I think, well, let's say a5, you're going to go what? King c7. King c5, maybe. King c5, a6 is a problem. Rook a4 could be a problem, right? Because you're not getting in time. You mm -hmm. actually need okay. the king to block well, the pawn. King c6. So mm -hmm. you would say king, king c6? c7. Mm -hmm. yeah, c6. Okay. I assume it doesn't matter. Now I would try rook b4. This is not, mm. I mean, things are getting a bit complicated for you, I would mm. say. I mean, so, okay. <laughs> well. Yeah, uh, we have a new tweet from Raj. How many moves can a grandmaster calculate during the end game? It really depends on a grandmaster. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, I, was, I was about to say it depends on the position. But, uh, yes, um, yeah. well. that too, of course. But, well, sometimes you have a position where uh, it's well if you use this kind of famous idea of an sort of variation tree that uh, there are not so many branches on this tree and that uh, mm -hmm. uh, there are not so many options on each move so uh, then of course uh, you can calculate 10 or 15 moves uh, quite well if the position is quite straightforward and there are not so many alternatives um, or well alternatively it could be a position where on each move there are two free decent alternatives and then unless you are a ridiculously good calculator you'll just well you'll just limit okay. yourself to two free moves in each direction and yeah. some sort of evaluation sure i agree i mean in a sort of position where it's extremely linear with uh, very fast moves especially if it's checks mm -hmm. well you can actually look very far ahead exactly and in other situations well it's going to be a sort of a complicated uh, situation straight ahead with a lot of um, non-forced moves. And then, well, it's going to be considerably more, more but complicated. But I think w what, what maybe should be mentioned, uh, that uh, I think grandmasters, especially the really strong ones, they are exceptionally good, not only at calculating, but at stopping and evaluating. Because, mm. well, what good is it to calculate very well if you cannot understand what is this position? So what they are very good at is, is, is uh, evaluating the resulting positions uh, yeah. without having but them but on board. I think board. this is also the case, actually, if you look at the, our game here. Well, you can either argue that there's very little to calculate. Well, you can see rook a3 will take a pawn. And then you will have to evaluate some kind of scenario. And mm -hmm. of course, that would have to be rather concrete. But it's also, well, you have to figure out a way how can you sort of uh, get some active counterplay in a, in a way. Well, maybe that was not the most exact explanation. But, uh, well, let's see here. Is he going to go rook a3? Is there actually any alternative in this position? I, I think he's <coughs> just making sure that it works. But Okay, something like maybe king d6 could also be possible. I don't know if it makes any kind of difference. difference. Mm -hmm. Well, let's say king c1. No, I think then you will actually have to go for uh, this pawn anyway, because I think this would just make things considerably much, wo uh, much worse. So no, this is... No, but after king d6, there is another interesting move. There is a move rook e5, suddenly switching from attacking uh, the... Yeah. well. From mm -hmm. from uh, sort of pinning the hopes on a4 to, oh. well, if white manages to take the g6 pawn. Yeah, well, then maybe there will be e5 and such. It's a bit hard to say. It's but a bit but hard to say, but at yeah. least sure. that could be a try. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, let's see here. f4. We really expect the move rook a3 to happen. And I think it... I'm a bit surprised <laughs> that he's... Would he play king f6 first, maybe? No, but king but f6 is not going in the right direction. I, I wouldn't think so. Well, the idea should be that you have your king closer. But let's say something like this, rook a3, a5. Well, I wanted to have the king ready for some kind of um, break on, on f5. 
Mm -hmm. I'm king f5? Well, maybe I'm in time here. Because rook a4, I can still go rook d3. Maybe you can do rook d4 and somehow it's difficult to get the the black rook uh, in time. So maybe here after a5 you'll have to play the move rook, rook d3. d3. Mm -hmm. And um, well, we could end up in some scenario. Maybe actually it's going to be exactly the same position as before, something like this. And well, followed by king g4. Yeah. Why are you putting your king on a3? And not, let's say, on... Uh, I thought it makes no difference. Okay, I but thought that uh, maybe king c3 and... Um well, <laughs> you can get it there if you want. But uh, I assume that... Well, you're going to go king g4. And, well, your king has to cross over to some extent. Mm -hmm. But then the f4 pawn would be hanging. That's right, yes. Well, let's see king d4. But now actually... No, let's say take on f4. A check here. Probably king f5, king b6, and something like g5. And I think now the counterplay comes in time. But still, it is illustrating that, well, it is not just basic principles. There's actually going to be some exact calculation here. And, well, and Draken is taking his time. He's actually spent, well, 35 minutes on the last uh, four moves here. So he's, uh, he is maybe setting himself up for, for quite some, some difficulties, I would say. And also, well... King e7 we spoke of. I will say I like the move e5 more. At least it avoided these kind of sort of things that that, that, that happened. <coughs> I somehow like to have this e pawn for for yeah. counterplay. I'm really curious what will be well. Uh, what is it that Andreiken has decided was wrong with e5? He must have had some very concrete reason. Well, why he was uh, well not happy about it. No, I understand. Well, maybe he thought it's just well weakening. Uh, the, yeah, the pawn. I think basically <coughs> he thought he could just stand there and there's absolutely nothing Aronian can do. But no, Aronian has given it a, a, a sort of a serious uh, try, mm -hmm. and it still seems to be a rather straightforward draw. But um, it's the kind of thing that can very often go wrong. Did we see some hand moving from no, I think. It seemed to me as well, but no, yeah. no move was made. No. It really seems like a rook a3 is enough. There is some, well, there are some things to, to calculate, of course, and <laughs> uh, it's not so easy, but... Um, mm -hmm. but well, yeah, king f6 also could, but... What would be the argument for not going rook a3? I mean, you are running out of passive defense. The king yes. is going to go to b1. Yeah. And... I don't see how you're going to win a tempo in, in some sense. That could be king f6 to f5. You want to speed it up that way. But as far as I can the point see, is that it's going to be the same position yes, maximum. Maximum, at best, yes. So, Rook a3 is just well, grabbing a uh, pawn. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, and, I would and really expect that to happen. Uh huh. Me too. I, th I think it should happen any moment because also, mm -hmm. well, and Draken... He shouldn't go down to, to a completely sort of... Sh he shouldn't put himself in a position where he has absolutely no time. As he still have plenty of time, I would say. He but will <laughs> of course, it's... Um, <coughs> well, the clock is definitely running in that sense. What's Andriken's tournament situation right now? He's on minus... Minus two right minus now. Minus two, mm -hmm. okay. And, uh, well... Oh. Is it true that we don't have anyone on minus one? No, Saga okay. Kayakin yeah. is on minus one. <gasps> Sorry, yes, yeah. Kayakin is on minus so one. So right <laughs> now it's Anon on plus two, and that's equaled by Andraikin on minus two, and it's Aronian on plus one, equaled by Kayakin on minus one. That's right, and then, yeah, uh, yeah. and the other four players are on 50%. Uh, on 50%, mm -hmm. yeah. so that's the situation. Maybe we're going to have a break here very soon, but we will be be back and follow yes, the, the and we the follow this closely but i think they will be mm -hmm. here for quite a while and well so will we yes definitely so, so see you soon see you soon
only one game was decided in round 5 of FIDE candidates tournament in Hantimansisk. Peter Svidler won against Veselin Topalov. At the same time, Vishwanathan Anand preserved the lead after splitting the point with Dmitry Andreykin. Kramnik Aronian and Karyakin Mamidyarov also ended in draws. In the game that finished first, Shahriar Mamidyarov attempted to play the Knight of Sicilian, which is not very common in his practice. But Sergei Karyakin decided not to go for the main lines. The calm position that happened on the board was assessed by Karyakin as a small edge for white, but Mamidyarov found the precise way for equalization. Despite the unpleasant experience with Berlin defense in the World Championship match in Chennai, Vishwanathan Anand himself adopted the opening with black in the game against Dmitry Andreykin. The main battle was on the queen side, where white was attempting to break to the seventh rank. Anand, however, played quickly and confidently, while Andreykin was burning his clock. Black constantly had a small pool, but White held the position together and the draw was signed on move 43. Veselin Topalov revived a rare line in the Royal Opus, and surprised Peter Swidler spent lots of time to accurately navigate the resulting sharp position. After move 14 he actually thought that he was losing, but he treated it well and even emerged with slight advantage. A couple of imprecise moves by Black were enough to get him in trouble. The combined force of rook and two bishops harassed the stranded black king until white was able to trade down to the winning endgame with the past age pawn. A full point went to Swidla. The last game to finish after six hours of play was a thriller between Vladimir Kramnik and Levon Aronian. The start of it was quiet as it can get, but it didn't take long before white started pulling his pieces towards the black king. The position soon looked as winning for white, but very complicated and difficult to play in a time travel. After exchanging mistakes, black succeeded in simplifying the position down to an equal rook and game. Kramnik pressed on but to no avail as Aronian played precisely to hold a draw. After five rounds, Anand remains on top with three and a half points. Kramnik, Aronian and Swidler share the second place with three points each. We are back and, um, well, Andrekin has just uh, made the most that we suggested. <laughs> he, I think, he took, didn't he take on? Okay, yeah, the he pawn, did that. pawn has been taken, yes. Yeah. And so... I mean, I understand he's giving up a pawn from Aronian, and the computer will say that from Aronian having a considerable advantage, it's now down to, well, 0, 0.0 according to the computer. But I actually think Aronian has done exactly what he has to do. He's complicating these things. And it's definitely easier to play white than black in this position. And it's Andraikin who will have to make a couple of defensive moves. I simply don't think he had any other choice. Mm -hmm. So um, I think Aronian did the right practical decision. And that, well, Andraikin will actually have to show some defensive skills here. One has to agree that he doesn't look the slightest scared. He seems no. to be walking happily around. No, I think I think he, he realizes that the worst is over for him. But let's say, well, right now... It's no surprise Aronian is thinking, as he could be choosing between king b2, rook d4, or even rook b4. Yeah, he I think that rook d4 or king b2 is what he's thinking about. That would uh -huh. be my hunch is that this must be the two principal move. But you could have a point about rook b4 as well, but I'm not completely sure that rook b4 has to be followed up by. King b2 anyway. Anyway, right? yeah, yeah. Maybe it doesn't make but that much sense. But rook b4 uh, has some logic to it, I would say, right? Um, well, they are in principle uh, sort of uh, different approaches because with rook d4, what you want to do is you want to cut out the 
and cut mm. cut off the king, right? And only then to bring the king to B2 and push the A pawn. But, but actually, as we saw uh, in some line, that well, black can probably draw by putting his king up to G4. So you can say that uh, it you're, cu- you're cut- well, also you're cutting him from one side. You're forcing <laughs> him to go somewhere that's good enough. Where, where it works, yes. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah. That uh, well, that could just be the objective evaluation of this yeah. position. Well, no. If if somebody put on some, puts on an engine, which I'm sure that at least some spectators have done, it's clear it's it's screaming out zero point zero zero, which mm-hmm. means, well, this is a drawn position. Still, I think it is easier to play for white, and a draken is moderately short of time. Mm-hmm. Aronin is going to give it a shot. I would be. Extremely surprised if they, for instance, agree to draw at this position. Oh no, but I mean, he's playing for a win, well, and well, uh, that he yeah. should. Yeah, yeah. And uh, well, it's not like this can go wrong for White in the sense that it's going to be a draw. Okay, he pl- uh, sorry, that is he's losing. Rook d4, he played. Yeah. It's rook d4. Well, now Andrekin has really, actually, he has some moves, but King a6 is a very, oh, it's a very straightforward. It's a very sort of human move and. Um, yeah, I, I like King F6. Let's I, say he, I, I really if he wants to get it over with and sort of pushes his pawns, what happens after E5? Well, Rook E4 probably. <laughs> but Rook E4, I could have this slight tactical trick here. Yeah, I see your point. And, okay, and of course it gets picks. complicated with A5, but I think my king is still in the square, mm-hmm. right? And if Rook E5, the idea should be that King D7, and I'm going to take your pawns. Mm-hmm. You're saying uh, even yeah. that could be possible. Well, what I want is that after Fe5, uh-huh. G5, somehow I'm getting, I'm, I'm well, cleaning yeah. up or whatever. Yeah, you're, you're right. Well, you're, you're getting suit, but uh, yes, still, you're, you're getting. I'm rid getting, of I'm points. getting the work done in a way. Mm-hmm. Of course, E5 is a bit of a complicated moment. On the other hand, it's going to be over then. So, mm-hmm. I think he will be a bit tempted to that. But, well, the clock ticking and such, maybe not. But um, well, uh, you could very well be right. E5 could just be good enough as well. Yeah. Uh, as well, well if thanks to this, uh, th- thanks to this thing that you just mentioned. E5, rook e4, and uh, rook g4. You could maybe even important. play rook e3 with the same argument. Let's say rook e3, and if a5, I have rook a3. Mm-hmm. So I would expect you have to go king b2. But I would assume I'm in time with this move, right? But, well, uh, by that logic, you can also start with rook h3, for instance. And um, Th- That logic I didn't understand. <laughs> <So> let's see. <laughs> King b2? King b2. Yeah. And uh, you are saying that I will not be on time. Well, now at least it gets complicated for me. So let's say... Well, I take on h4. I play a5. And uh, now, let's say rook h2 check. King b3. And maybe, well, rook h1. Uh-huh. And well, you are definitely hurt by the fact that uh, your pawn is still yeah. so far away. Sure. No, I thought that I mean my rook will actually have a sort of a chance to to sort of go to a4 at some point. But uh well, I think you're right. This is also going to be good enough. So actually Well, at uh, this point it seems that there is uh It's hard more to come, than up, come up with uh, a way. Yeah, I think it's more difficult to find a way where white is actually going to win this game. Um, well, King f6 should be fine, e5 should be fine, and, and even, even rook, rook h3, h3 should be fine. Well, I think if rook h3 is good, then ah, rook g4, then you get a5 straight away. So that mm-hmm. probably would not no, be No, that wouldn't do. Uh, uh, nice. But no. I think, well, it is true that rook h3 requires uh, more calculation. Then yeah. you took on h to take on h4, and you have to, well, manage to swing your rook back uh, to, to... What I like about the move e5 that I suggested <laughs> was that it can very easily come down to a situation where it's rook and pawn against rook and pawn, where you will quite easily draw by sacrificing your rook and queening your own pawn, mm-hmm. leading to a draw. So somehow that strikes me as the, the most human uh, decision. But uh, mm-hmm. let's see if that's what he's going to go for. Um, well, he has his time and he's, he's, he's taking it. Uh, well, he's, he's taking his time. Mm-hmm. Well, this we have seen both, I think, yesterday and today, right? It's so fascinating action going up to the f- f- sort of fourth hour and then it slows down considerably but this is simply the consequence of this t- time control i think yeah definitely and also well yeah. normally you have yeah you have some time added and you are you find yourself in, s- in some end game 
Yeah, yeah. Where you also need here, to give it some This thought. is one of the few tournaments where from move uh, 41 to 60 there is no increment but sort of that uh, they actually get a full hour for the for the game. So that means that well suddenly there's a moment where you can think for really a long time. So yeah. Well, that's true, yes. Let, let's see what he's going to choose here. But I mean he is running his t time down quite considerably I would say. And this is that's a bit of a surprise. So apparently he's not extremely mm. confident how to handle this situation. I think that, well, how, I basically how, think that this is the last moment when he has to have how, a really how, serious thought. How complicated is the line? Let's say e5. Rook e4. No. Well, I want to take okay. it and g5. Mm -hmm. I mean, a5. But the point is, I guess, the one you take g here. G takes h4. And after a6. Ah, you even have rook a3 of here. Course, this is. Yes. Yeah, this is, it doesn't get more <laughs> no, drawish than that. It's not, not, not very complicated. No, no. no. So e5 is a way to, to do it, for instance. Yeah, e5 is tempting, but I would say that he must be afraid of e5, rook e4. But the line e5, rook e4, you're saying there you actually have to calculate, for instance, you rook You have to come up to with G4. something... Um, yeah. Something uh, mm -hmm. well accurate. You no, can't just I, I just see uh, your point. just make some moves. Yeah. Maybe you can just maybe you have to play rook g four. But here, well, have a look at this. I mean, this this is. You're saying e five rook e four rook g four. Okay, he is about to make a move. And or <laughs> rook, rook e three. Okay, this okay, is this, this was is your suggestion actually. Well, yeah. I think I I, sh I sh sort of shouted out a number of suggestions. <laughs> so. I, <laughs> But rook e3, it's with the same point. You want to play e5. e5 and, and not even give away Let's a say pawn. king b2. Sorry, rook e3. Uh -huh. King b2, e5. Mm -hmm. Well, after, yeah, after take, take. I mean, the king is in the way, but I mean, you're not even, cannot even play a5 well, in this position. Well, after king b3, you'll play g5. No, I think rook e3, actually, this is going to be... is a nice move. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... Um, no, actually, e5 is, well, impossible to avoid. And after you swap these pawns, the next yeah. will be, well, then g5 will yeah, come. I think this is just going to be a, a, mm. a, a, a sort of qu quiet end to, to uh, an, an interesting game. But Aronian must be, he's going to be disappointed here. Of course, in the last two games against Swidler and against Kramnik, maybe he will argue that, well, I got some gifts and I'm giving back a half a point. But that's not exactly how things work, right? I mean, when you've gotten something, you want to accumulate it, not to sort of uh, give it back, at least mm -hmm. uh, not in a, in a chess tournament. Um, so, well, I think we are heading towards a draw, but of course, Aronian will think a bit and try and come up with something. Well, he should very much. Mm -hmm. Rook e3 is, uh, well, is the least risky, uh, you could say, of the yeah. options. It doesn't sacrifice anything. It just, well, yeah. uh, goes very directly for swapping uh, mm. pawns. No, I, I like it in the sense yeah. that it's trying to be very, very uncomplicated. It's, well, as I think you said, the cleanest in some sense, mm -hmm. or that's what you meant, uh, at least as I mm -hmm. understood it. So I think that sounds sounds like a good uh, good choice. And no, I think Aron is actually looking at the chessboard. I thought he started maybe his thought for one. Uh, did he shake his head a bit? Mm. Well, of course, it's uh, actually um, yeah, it's a pity for him. <laughs> I mean, he had such a such a well, just just uh, an hour ago. Uh, well, we were both praising him for putting uh, excellent pressure and for outplaying yeah. Andrejkin completely, and then well, suddenly things started happening. Well, little yeah. by little, he let it go. But l let's let's go back a bit. We 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 seem to have a bit of time here. Well, okay, this position. Well, he could uh, apparently have taken on on e4. Well, I actually praised him for taking on d7 mm -hmm. because I thought this was was quite a strong decision to go for this ending. Knight f8. Well, we were talking about taking with the bishop here, but maybe I don't it think that makes it. Maybe it makes no difference. big difference. Maybe simply this position is not so simple. Although, of course, you could argue that after bishop takes e4 and rook takes d2, let's say, well, and rook takes, uh, rook a8, sorry. Um, well. But it's not trivial either. I would say g6. a4. a4. Let's say king g7. 
A5. Well, there's... I think it could easily be but, with... But, but, and maybe you keep the rook on, on, on A7 and you will attack here. But it seems to be quicker, at least, uh, in a way. Yeah. Maybe... Well, rook d2 is forced, and then... Well, it could even... I would say I would actually quite like to move rook a7, rook a7. Mm -hmm. and I just want to transfer the bishop to the long diagonal, and I will keep, I will, I will sort of pound on the f7. Uh, That's the point. Uh, this position, yeah, it could just be winning. Th that, I think it's diff different from the game. In the game, yeah. Well, we saw here, he actually, well, he had the rook on e4, and the other line it would be on a7. And I understand that maybe he was actually trying to think very advanced, that it's going to be this position, I'm going to take on e6. Mm -hmm. And I would like to have my rook on the fourth, not sort of behind the pawn. Yeah. And generally he's right, but I think, well, when we look at something like this, when you keep the bishop and the knight still there, the bishop is going to attack the, the f7 square, and that's actually quite well, a I different... I think you can see Levon yeah, he is not. Uh, no, he's not happy. He's not happy, and I think also... He he understands that he has ruined things to quite an extent. Yeah. Even so, well, if we look at sort of in the bigger picture, he has actually, well, before today, I would say he had three principal rivals. Anand, half a point ahead of him, Kramnik and Switler on equal terms with mm -hmm. him. He has taken half a point on two rivals and hasn't spoiled anything towards Anand. No. It's but of course, how much better it would have been. Yeah, sure. That, that I think that, is the problem. That, that I don't think he can stop he, he thinking about. He almost seems ready to sign the score sheet now, if I, yeah. if I get it correctly. Yeah, after okay, E5. This is, yes. He seems, yeah. E5. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah draw that's a draw. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. okay. Ah, now he's smiling and laughing. So I think, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, no, that's the back to, to, to normal for Aronian. Yeah. So well, it was a, a very exciting game to follow. For sure, I think <laughs> an exciting <laughs> round. And, uh, well, again, the white pieces dominated. Two white wins. Very it, much it, maybe so. Maybe it's 9-1 by now or something like this. Yeah. And, uh, and such. And, uh, well, it's gl I mean, we have seen some titanic struggles, and they're normally followed by the players uh, more or less bursting off laughing afterwards. It seems, <laughs> seems like almost a friendly tournament to me. But, uh, well, not quite. But, but no, uh, maybe one game comes to mind. But yes. Uh, <laughs> still, yeah. But they but really... Yeah, they are giving their best mm -hmm. while they are opponents, but not afterwards. No, no, <laughs> and that that is nice. That's in how it a should way. be. And now, actually, there's going to be a free day tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I, I, if I'm, if I'm. Yeah, that's that's yeah. right. The, there will be a free day tomorrow, and the next round will already mark uh, the yeah the finish of the first round of the tournament. Mm -hmm. So we are we are yeah. We will be we we'll be back with that, and I think well. I mean, the tournament has only gotten more interesting by today's result. So I think very much so. And well, still a lot of players in contention for first place and such. So, mm -hmm. well, it's been a pleasure, and see you hopefully for round seven. Yes, see you in in one day. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Bye.
Ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to start our press conference. Uh, another game finished in a draw today. And uh, can you please uh, show us some key moments? I can understand the game was very long and tiring. Дорогие друзья, мы готовы начать нашу пресс-конференцию. Партия между Дмитрием Андрейкиным и Леоном Мароняном завершилась в ничью. Пожалуйста, расскажите какие-то, покажите основные моменты партии, потому что, конечно, она была очень длинная и вы устали. Maybe. <laughs> okay, I've analyzed this line, I think, maybe a year ago with Arshak Petrosyan. I was trying to defend with the black, but he kept on beating me over the board. 
Этот вариант я анализировал примерно год назад с Аршаком Петросяном. Я пытался защититься черными, но он у меня каждый раз выигрывал. In fact, uh, Bishop D7 uh, with the idea to play E5 was my main resource, and I think he, he was playing A4 in 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 our analysis, and then uh, I think it's just a slightly better position for White. Как раз слон D7 был моим основным ресурсом с идеей E5, и Аршак играл A4. И вот эта позиция возникала, которая немного лучше у белых. Yeah, white will slowly capture the b3, then put on pawn on a6. I don't know. But uh, during the game, I felt that uh, you know, I felt it's too early to go to the end game. Just uh, it's more fun to play b3. Uh, в том uh, в той позиции, которая возникала в варианте только что показанном, белые постепенно заберут пешку на b3, uh, но Партия мне показала, что слишком рано идти в Эншпиль. Е5, на мой взгляд, это основной ресурс, потому что после Е6 слон Б2, белые вводят в игру Лади, и позиция будет не очень приятной у черных из-за сильного слона на Б2. And I thought that rook b1 is maybe a, a viable option, you know, just to uh, keep some pressure in the game. I mean, if if black goes bishop d6, then. Ладья b1 мне казался интересным ресурсом, чтобы в игре в партии продолжалось какое-то напряжение, потому что если слон d6, то подобный вариант получится. Yeah, and then white will take on a7 and. And yeah, I actually considered queen e2 uh, when I was playing rook b1, but I thought bishop a3 looks strong. Я рассматривал ход версии 2, когда играл ладья b1, но думал, что слон a3 довольно сильно выглядит. So I think this is practically forced, and now I I had a choice between queen b2 and queen b1 and queen takes c4. All interesting moves. Uh, до этого были форсированы ходы. Здесь у меня есть выбор между ферзь b2, взятием на c4 или ферзь d1. Uh, я думаю, что все эти ходы интересные. Uh, Но чтобы не слишком задерживать эту пресс-конференцию, я не буду вдаваться в подробности. Ферзь d4 был возможным ходом, возможно, интересным. Was a possible continuation for him. Да, Дмитрий сказал, что такая возможность была у него. Here I was kind of tempted to play d4, but maybe it doesn't give anything. Black just takes. Здесь мне хотелось сыграть d4, но, наверное, это ничего не дает, то что черные просто забирают на d4. And uh, my initial plan to play rook c1, I noticed that there is a move like bishop f5. И мой изначальный план был сыграть ладья c1, но после ладья d3 я увидел, что есть ход слона f5. So there was a change of plans on move number 20. So rook a7. I think this is practically forced. Так что я поменял свой план ладья a7. Я думаю, что эти ходы практически форсированы. Yeah, and here I felt that knight a4 is is a bit uh, dangerous for black. Да, и здесь мне казалось, что конь 4 uh, несколько опасно для черных. I'm not so sure about it now, but... Я не так уверен насчет этого сейчас. так кажется. After all, uh, Tarish cannot be wrong. Uh, Tarish не может ошибаться. Uh, so, uh... Anyway, h3, and this this was of course the main line, and Dmitry admitted that he was planning to play this as well. Конечно, после h3 основным вариантом был конь c5, и Дмитрий отметил, что он так планировал играть. And well, I think I kind of believe that white is still slightly better, but I mean black has consolidated, and maybe maybe he'll be fine. Я верю, что у белых все еще немного лучше, но черные консолидировали свою позицию и думаю, что у них должно быть все в порядке. 
probably there are better moves than h3, but uh, it's not easy to to see those moves. There are just too many geometrical ideas, and I was already catching up with uh, with the time, you know, to Dimitri. Наверное, есть лучшие ходы по сравнению с H3, но не так просто их найти, потому что очень много геометрических идей, и я уже начал догонять Дмитрия по времени. Ивана, почему не сыграете с ладья B4 и ферзь D6 и yes, D4? I, I liked... Rook B4, but then I didn't like this. Мне нравился ход ладья B4, но затем мне не понравился просто ферзь D2. It's strange, but I felt that you know you somehow have stabilized, and maybe black is not losing immediately. Странно, но я чувствовал, что здесь черные стабилизировали свою позицию, и, наверное, сразу же не проигрывают. After Rook B7, I decided it's better. But then Rook B8, you know, you're in time. Queen H7. <laughs> rookie one, rookie two. Can you demonstrate this line, maybe? Uh, no, rook to b two. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll show it. But anyway, I just felt that it's 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 not the maximum that I can get in this game. <laughs> so, uh, rook c one, rook d eight, h three. Yes, King F8 was a blunder, and I think after Queen B3, Black is probably losing already. There is a cute line here, actually, that I will allow myself to show. That. Да, здесь, видимо, черные уже проигрывают. Есть такой забавный вариант, который милый вариант, который я позволю себе показать. Yeah, without Queen G8, you know, Black is still in the game. Без ферзь G8, конечно, черные все еще в игре. So yeah, and here, I don't know. I saw that my position is winning with different ways, but I chose to, uh, you know, I felt that this is so simple. I actually blundered knight of eight, which is inexcusable, of course. Здесь мне казалось, что моя позиция выиграна различными способами. Я на самом деле зевнул просто конь f8. I mean, this should win in principle. Слон e4 должен выиграть. But I felt that okay, queen c1 check and some things are happening. Но мне казалось, что ферзь c1 шаг и что-то такое будет. Probably they're not happening, but just to be safe, I felt that. Скорее всего, ничего не будет происходить на самом деле, но просто чтобы не рисковать. And I, th I thought that, uh, you know, knight f6, king f1, and it's the end of the story. Yeah, I should prefer it's good too. Uh, yeah, I thought you're, you're tricky, you know. I felt that you, you want to go for this. Uh, uh, yes, I, I thought something like this. Anyway, uh, here of course I went completely mad. Здесь, конечно, я просто сумасшествие какое-то. I mean, it's easy to see that white should play like this, bring the king to the center, and. Легко увидеть, что белые должны играть так, привести своего короля в центр. And I'll probably get uh, something similar, like in the game, but will it? Two, three, ten p extra. Вероятно, я получу что-то похожее на то, что было в партии, но с двумя тремя лишними темпами. And okay, of course I shouldn't exchange my bishop for the knight, but here I was so frustrated with my rookie four that I just, I don't know, I just went. Yeah, I didn't play my best then. Конечно, мне не нужно было разменивать своего слона на коня, но после ладья 4 я был так расстроен своим этим ходом, что делал не лучшие ходы. Дмитрий, can you please say with whom did you analyze also this opening if you did? Дмитрий, а вы с кем анализировали этот вариант дебютный, если анализировали? Я видел партию Шуманов Поткин. I saw a game Shimano Potkin. The deal of Tom is that in this position Shimano beat Slon B8. But the point is that in this position Shimano took on A8. 
Ну и черные получили лучшую игру и Поткин выиграл. And Black got a better play and Potkin won. Какой-нибудь бы пять стало для меня неожиданностью. Тут я очень много времени потратил на расчет варианта коня восемь. Not be five was a surprise for me, and I mm, took a lot of time to uh, calculate the variation after knight e, a8. Такой ход очень интересный, но вот после a4, h6, d4, ферзь f5, ферзь c3. A very interesting move, but after this uh, variation. Тут идет какой-то форсаж, можно дать шаг, можно пробить шаг, не знаю. Ну, в общем, если бы за соучастие очки давали, я бы, может, так и сыграл, но тут. If I could get some, some points for for a being part of, of, uh, of the game, I would uh, maybe play it like this. And I think that here uh, Queen and the Rook can decide the game. And maybe you would like to add something also about this game uh, and let's say was the moment you felt that it's let's say worse or worst for you or something like this how did you estimate the position может быть вы хотите еще что-то добавить об этой партии в какой момент вам казалось что у вас хуже или может быть даже проиграно как вы оценивали позицию ну я в общем-то до какого-то момента был весьма оптимистичен until some moment i was very optimistical но к сожалению было мало времени и все варианты я видел в принципе которые сейчас были приведены но к сожалению, на этом турнире существует такая проблема выбора, потому что все вижу, но делаю все равно лучшие ходы. But unfortunately, I didn't have much time, and well, I saw all the variations that were shown now in this analysis, but I have this problem, uh, this tournament, that I see everything, but I still choose not the best moves. А в этой позиции я уже был уверен, что где-то через пару ходов все развалится. And then in this position, I was sure that uh, in a few moves uh, everything will collapse. Ну как-то даже уже там просто решил куда-то ферзя поставить, поставил на c6. So I decided just to bring my queen somewhere and uh, put it on c6. Ну вот как-то случайно даже до эндшпи где удалось спастись. So well by accident I survived until the end game where I managed to uh, to hold it. Do we have questions? No. So thank you very much, or we have still. No? Женя, always. Я хотел спросить, мне сегодня в какой-то момент казалось, что условный матч Россия остальной мир может закончиться счетом 3,5 на пол очка. Вас не удивляет вот, ну, вот такое течение борьбы? Well, at some moment today, uh, during the playing day, It seemed that uh, the so-called match uh, Russia against the rest of the world could end uh, three and a half on just half a point uh, in uh, favor of the world. Uh, so uh, this uh, turn of events, uh, doesn't it surprise you in some way? Uh, for Russia, half a point for Russia. Yes. Yes. Question was, yes. Uh, oh, I mean, there are many strong players. And I think you can expect everybody to give their best, and uh, although Russian players are traditionally the best in the world, there there has to been a trend of players of other countries also learning to play. Вы знаете, несмотря на то, что россияне действительно сильнейшие считаются сильнейшими игроками в мире, недавно был так. В последнее время есть такой тренд, что игроки из других стран тоже научились играть. А я подметил этот счет, когда разыгрывал владельник, поэтому уже решил держаться до конца. Ну и плюс, все-таки на этом турнире пока заметная доминация белых фигур, поэтому сегодня две партии выиграли белые, ничего удивительного в этом нет. I noticed this score when I was playing the Rook Endgame, so I decided that I should hold uh, until the last, uh, the last moment. And uh, in this tournament, uh, white actually dominates, so uh, I don't think it's uh, so much surprising that uh, two games were won with white. Сегодня еще была очень популярная тема, как бы вот у э, многих игроков желание как бы дожить до выходного. Насколько, э, ну скажем, томленными чувствуете вы себя, как бы накануне очередного выходного и, в общем, что предпримите для того, чтобы ну, продолжить с новыми силами? Well, a lot of players said that uh, 
they wanted to survive until the free day. So how do you feel uh, yourself uh, in front of a free day and what uh, would you do uh, to restore your energy? Ну, можно только приветствовать то, что на этом турнире есть столько выходных. Все-таки турнир достаточно сложный, и э, наличие выходных дает шанс шахматистам показать все-таки себя с лучшей стороны. Э, предприму, как обычно, может, займусь э, каким-то спортом с ребятами, что-нибудь поиграем. Well, I'm glad that there are so many uh, free days uh, on this tournament, because uh, they help uh, the players to show their best. And uh, what would I do? Well, uh, as usual, I would probably play some sport games with uh, my friends. Ну да, на выходной приятно уйти, конечно, тем более после хорошей партии, как мне кажется, которую я сегодня провел. Ну, неплохую, во всяком случае. Сегодня посмотрим футбол, наверное, «Зенит». Ну а завтра, соответственно, спать будем. Well, it's pleasant to go into a free day, especially after a good game, which I played today. At least I think my game today was not so bad. Uh, and today, uh, tonight, we will watch uh, football. So Zenit is playing. And tomorrow, have some rest. Okay, have a good rest for tomorrow. Thank you. Yes. Vladimir Kramnik was born in Tuapse, into a family of painters. His father taught him to play chess. Vladimir quickly made the grade and then became a candidate master, his city's champion among adults. When Kramnik was 11, he came under the influence of Botvinnik, who praised the young talent and invited him to his chess school. Kramnik progressed rapidly, won under 16 and under 18 world junior crowns, and in 1991, became an international grandmaster. His first major success came at the Olympiad in Manila in 1992, when the young grandmaster scored eight and a half points out of nine. Since then, Kramnik has been a permanent member of Russia's national team. He played his part in the team's victories at the 1992, 1994 and 1996 Olympiads. And by 1993, Vladimir was already a candidate for the chess crown. In 1995, Garry Kasparov invited Kramnik to help him in his World Championship match against Vichy Anand. This was a great experience for Kramnik, and he profited from it when he beat Kasparov in 2000 in London and became the 14th World Chess Champion. Vladimir Kramnik held the title from 2000 until 2007. He played World Championship matches with Peter Lecko in Brisago in 2004, the score 7-7. In 2006, in Elista, he beat Veselin Topolov with a scoreline of 8.5 to 7.5. In 2007, Kramnik shared second place at the Mexico tournament, where Anand became champion. In 2008, they played a match, which Vladimir lost 4.5 to 6.5. In 2013, Kramnik shared honours at the candidates tournament with Carlsen, but the tiebreak left him in the second place. During his outstanding career, Vladimir Kramnik has won more than 50 tournaments and he holds a special and distinguished record. He has won the Dortmund Super Tournament 11 times. In 2013 in Tromso, Kramnik climbed his last unexplored peak. He won the World Cup and proved his strength in a knockout competition. Like most of the outstanding grandmasters, Kramnik has a universal game style. Experts point to his stunning opening game, unique gift for positional play, and exceptional professionalism. The leading Bulgarian grandmaster was born on the 15th of March 1975 in Rus. Veselin learned to play chess at the age of eight and very quickly proved to be one of the most promising players of his generation. In 1989, he became under 14 world champion and runner-up in the 1990 Under-16 World Cup.
приглашение газа, ну, а, ну конец да. турнира был, я как бы решил, что надо прийти. Ну, да. Okay, so, dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome for the last press conference of today. We have Vladimir Kramnik here with us. Дорогие друзья, добро пожаловать на последнюю пресс-конференцию сегодняшнего дня. С нами Владимир Крамник. So, just some comments about this game. We are very curious what happened. Пожалуйста, несколько комментариев вашей партии. Конечно, всем очень интересно, что же произошло. По-русски, на английски. Ну, я как-то неудачно разыграл дебют, попал на, на какую-то подготовку серьезную соперника. Да, и мой оппонент подготовил Ну, я кое-чего недооценил в подготовке. Я не хотел бы сейчас говорить, что именно, но немножко недооценил. I underestimated some things in the preparation. I would not like uh, to say now what exactly, but still some things I underestimated. Но дальше я как-то хотел уже свернуть с каких-то очень острых форсивных линий, очевидно, хорошо проанализированных соперником с компьютером. И сыграл не самым амбициозным образом, но, по крайней мере, хотел какую-то игру получить. Не проиграть, так сказать, компьютер форсированный. Well, then I wanted to deviate from some uh, sharp lines, so, which were obviously uh, analyzed by my um, opponent. Uh, so I wanted to just uh, get some play and not to lose to computer analysis. Но с другой стороны, позиция все-таки была мне опасна, неприятная, и в общем вот я уже успел посмотреть. То есть, в общем-то, ну, шансов у меня реально не было. Соперник мой играл просто по первой линии всю партию. И позиция, плюс позиция неприятная. То есть, в общем-то, я не вижу, что я мог сделать. Я, мне кажется, не так плохо играл, боролся, но у меня все время где-то полтемпа не хватало всю партию. И, в общем, ну, проиграл. То есть, так, можно сказать, шансов сегодня не было. On the other hand, my position was very unpleasant, and uh, my opponent uh, played by the first line of computer the whole game. Uh, so I think I didn't really have chances. Of course, I uh, tried to keep in the game and uh, played uh, my best, but uh, still the position was very, very unpleasant. No, такое бывает, в общем, поэтому ничего страшного. Ну, просто не повезло, можно сказать, сегодня. Well, it happens. Uh, so uh, I can say that maybe I was unlucky today. From what you said, can I make a conclusion that let's say this, open, this choice of this line was not really good because you didn't mention specific moment where you went wrong? Можно ли сделать вывод, что этот вариант был не очень хороший, поскольку вы не отметили какой-то конкретный конкретный момент, когда ошиблись? Нет, я бы сказал, что с какого-то момента позиция стала не очень хорошая, но я я в общем единственное могу сказать, что я свернул со своей подготовки сам в какой-то момент, потому что я понял, на что меня ловят, и понял, что немножко не доработал в этом направлении. Well, uh, I can say that from some moment my position became uh, not very good. Uh, I can say that I deviated from my initial preparation because I realized uh, uh, where I'm being caught in this position. Uh, so, uh, and I probably didn't work enough in that line. Ну, я не уверен, что что в общем-то объективно Как это обычно бывает в современных шахматах, придешь там с компьютером, по поанализируешь, и в итоге он там найдет, как играть, но за доской против человека, который с компьютером, то есть довольно сложно, конечно. Well, objectively, as it is in the modern chess, when you come home and you analyze it with computer, probably it will show uh, where black could hold. But when you play the board uh, against uh, the human who knows this position, uh, prepared with computer, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. So, do we have questions? Есть ли вопросы? Владимир, вот вы э, несколько дней назад говорили о том, что вы стали другим шахматистом по сравнению там, с э, теми временами, которые, когда вы были чемпионом. А нет ли такого ощущения, что сегодня несколько изменили самому себе нынешнему? Потому что вот после конь c3, э, конь в 3, d5, конь c3, да, вы в последние годы играете и Рогозина, и там, венские варианты, Тараш, но вот на ферзе и гамбит вы не идете, а, а сегодня, видимо, решили просто как-то покрепче, но вот как тот э, Крамник сыграть, и в итоге получилось не очень. Well, uh, a few days ago you said that uh, you changed as a chess player, uh, you're a different player now, uh, but can we say that actually today uh, 
you played uh, not as this new uh, Kramnik and uh, you played rather like old Kramnik uh, because you tried to play maybe it's more solid. Uh, normally in this position you can go for a Gozin for Vienna variation and other lines, uh, but you don't uh, go into Queen's uh, Gambit. So normally uh, with black you go for a, for a richer play. Нет, ну, во-первых, она сегодня богатая у нас получилась, но, с другой стороны, Феодор Федор Гамбит, в принципе, это один из моих сейчас основных дебютов в том числе. И, ну, и я думал, что ну, Каспар, Топалов, он известен своей такой компьютерной подготовкой сильной, и мне кажется, что в более солидном дебюте больше шансов, в общем-то, не попасться на какие-то компьютерные штучки, то есть я, в принципе, готов был э, играть честно за доской, так сказать, но э, я надеялся, что Ферзем Габити ему не удастся что-то такое суперкомпьютерное заготовить, но не, э, не угадал. Well, first of all, I would say that uh, the game was quite rich today, and uh, uh, Queen's Gambit is one of uh, my uh, openings. Uh, I know that Tapalov uh, is known for his computer preparation, so I thought that in this opening I would have more chances uh, not to be caught for computer preparation and go into play. So I was ready to, to play at the board, uh, but uh, as it is, I, I actually... Uh, still run into, into, yeah, still run into so. preparation. А не повлияло ли на ваше сегодняшнее настроение вот та вот, ну, остановка легкой напряженности, которая обычно как бы сопутствует вашим встречам э, с Топалу, может быть, э, как раз она вам в какой-то степени помешала? Well, this uh, um, slight pressure that uh, usually uh, goes along with your games against Topalov, uh, does it somehow influence, uh, in, did it influence your game today? Мне так не показалось, я как-то привык к этому, но опять же, такая сегодня была партия, что такой один из редких случаев, где я, в общем-то, не могу себя ни в чем упрекнуть, я нормально играл, то есть, ну, вот так получилось, да, по сути, что, что у меня совсем все не сложилось и даже шанса не было, но мне, если бы я играл бы сегодня совсем плохо, там, скажем, да, все время что-то заевал, то, может быть, тогда можно было об этом говорить, но у меня нет такого ощущения, то есть я не хуже играл, чем вчера или другой день, но просто вот так не сложилось сегодня. Well, I don't have such a feeling and also I'm used to play uh, against Apollo. Uh, today I cannot say that I uh, played a bad game because I tried and I did uh, my best. So I cannot say that this game was worse than the game it was yesterday, for example. Just it didn't went, it didn't go my way. Yes, so the last question, please. То есть у вас нет ощущения, что вот до этого казалось, что турнир складывается ну, идеально, не идеально, но очень хорошо вы давите белыми, как бы уверенно делаете ничьи черными, а вот эта партия как бы немножко выбилась вот из этого ряда вот предыдущих пяти встреч. Нет у вас такого ощущения и сделаете ли вы что-то, чтобы вернуться вот в это, ну, скажем так, выгодное для вас русло? So don't you have a feeling that uh, until this game the tournament went, went, went quite well for you and this game uh, somehow uh, is uh, out of this row of games uh, and what would you do to change uh, this situation? Нет, ну такой турнир, в общем-то, э, очень сильные все игроки, подготовлены все здорово, черными всегда можно проиграть партию здесь, поэтому э, я тут не вижу какой-то трагедии, то есть я бы Скажем, я бы больше бы волновался, ведь я плохо бы сегодня играл бы и как-то вот совсем бездарно, что называется, проиграл, но этого не случилось. Я, ну, просто, вот, я, я лично считаю, что бывает, ну вот не повезло, не мой день, вот все сложилось против меня сегодня. Но а, с другой стороны, в принципе, ничего страшного, потому что отрыв не очень большой. В Лондоне я имел те же 50% к этому моменту, и плюс здесь я все-таки еще... В отличие от большинства, я сыграл четыре черными из шести, поэтому ничего страшного не произошло. Конечно, неприятно проигрывать, но с другой стороны, турнир, ну даже еще середина, даже еще половина не сыграна, отрыва большого нет. По игре пока у меня ощущение, что я вполне прилично играю, то есть у меня нет ощущения, что, что, что все-таки важно, но потом посмотрим. То есть поэтому никаких, так сказать, таких выводов, что надо что-то менять, я, пока у меня нет таких мыслей. 
there is uh, such tournament, it's a very strong tournament and everybody is well prepared, so to lose one game uh, with black, it's uh, actually normal. And I would be more disappointed if I played badly today, but uh, I think that I played okay. Uh, just everything uh, went not my way, uh, it was simply not my day. And if you remember in London, I also had 50%. Uh, and also I would like to point that uh, from all the other participants, I was the one who played four games with black uh, at the start of this tournament. So uh, so I think that the half of the tournament is in front of me and everything uh, is in front. Thank you very much. Ну, знаете, не, ну, вроде был, но я, я лично не смотрел с компьютером, как-то времени не было, но, не, ну, было пару, пару путей перспективных, но надо еще посмотреть, я, мне кто-то просто сказал вот так на ухо, я сам не смотрел. Uh, that was a short question about yesterday's game, if Vladimir already analyzed it and came to conclusion if there was a win there. And Vladimir said that uh, he didn't have time to deeply analyze it uh, himself, but uh, somebody told him that... Uh, there were a few perspective uh, ways to play, but of course it needs uh, deeper ana analysis. Okay, so thank you. <laughs>